section twenty four of heroines of fiction by william dean howells this librivox recording is in the public domain george eliot's rosamond vincy and dorothea brooke the cultivated world was long ago brought to profess its open pleasure in character because it is true rather than in character because it is pleasing or edifying but whether this pleasure is real or not or whether it is not underlain by a secret preference for a character because he is good or she is pretty i am not quite sure in the theatres frequented by the simple-hearted sort of people the actor playing the part of a virtuous person is applauded and the actor playing the part of a villain is hissed irrespective of their artistic merits but this rarely happens in any two-dollar house still i am not satisfied that it would not happen if the two-dollar audience were as sincere as the fifty-cent audience and i have my misgivings in offering to the admiration of the reader a detestable character merely because it is a masterpiece one i am certain that it would be difficult to find a more detestable character or a truer than rosamond vincy who equally with dorothea brooke is the heroine of middlemarch she is a very beautiful girl and lydgate who marries her loves her with a tenderness worthy the soul that is not in her the soul that is in her is small and meanly selfish but neither she nor he knows how small or meanly selfish at first rosamond indeed has a very high ideal of herself which eventuates in an inexorable conceit after marriage when the early tumult of the emotions subsides and she has time to take full thought of her merits in contrast to her husband's demerits she is of that intensely personal nature which receives whatever happens as of direct intention toward itself and feels injured or favoured by the course of human events as if they were primarily concerned with it as the course of events is not agreeable to rosamond after her marriage with lydgate she naturally holds him responsible for them and he falls in her esteem and her affection when he finds that they have been living extravagantly and wishes her to help him retrench she never could have duly appreciated either his brilliant mind or his tender heart and she sets herself to thwart and baffle him with a success which the greatness of both his mind and heart render easy for a dull narrow pretty egotist there can be nothing more tragical than the story of their unhappy married life in which she harasses him with her paltry ambitions and resentments and wears him out at last such women literally kill men and the more generous the men the more easily they fall the prey of such women it is nothing to rosamond and can be nothing that her husband is recognized as a man of great scientific importance and has the making of the highest professional fame in him there is no sort of opinion public or private which could convince her that he had not wronged her by falling into money difficulties after he married her or in failing to make her life as luxurious for her as she had expected she breaks his heart and then she breaks his spirit and when he dies she inherits the money that at last 
comes to her from his life insurance with a sense of desert which has never once forsaken her we all know women like rosamond vincy the type is eternal and ineffaceable but a woman of her sort will complacently sit before rosamond's portrait and never dream that there is anything like herself in it the successive scenes in which her unconscious abominable selfishness is developed can scarcely be said to culminate but they each deepen and widen a little the sense of her deadly and deadening egotism and of the hopelessness with which a generous spirit like lydgate's must struggle in the clinging and stifling hold of a polyp nature like hers in a novel of later date where the dramatic method is more used the whole situation would be imparted at once but it must be seen that the partial suggestions of george eliot follow one upon another with a deepening impression till the reader's pity for lydgate's doom in the wretched creature he loves would have excused his surrender to almost any temptation lydgate suffers a certain moral decay in his endeavour to please his wife and even falls under suspicion of complicity with another's crime but at the worst he has done no wrong beyond lowering his aspirations and has only sinned against himself any one of the passages in which the author securely if slowly feels her way to the eventuality would serve to exhibit rosamond as she always is and i cannot say that i choose the first scene in which lydgate tries to make her understand the situation as stronger than the others dear rosie lay down your work and come to sit by me he said gently pushing away the table and stretching out his arm to draw a chair near his own rosamond obeyed as she came toward him in her drapery of transparent faintly tinted muslin her slim yet round figure never looked more graceful as she sat down by him and laid one hand on the elbow of his chair at last looking at him and meeting his eyes her delicate neck and cheek and purely cut lips never had more of that untarnished beauty which touches us in springtime and infancy and all sweet freshness it touched lydgate now and mingled the early memories of his love for her with all the other memories which were stirred in this crisis of deep trouble he laid his ample hand softly on her saying dear with the lingering utterance which affection gives to the word rosamond too was still under the power of that same past and her husband was still in part the lydgate whose approval had stirred delight she put his hair lightly away from his forehead then laid her other hand on his and was conscious of forgiving him i am obliged to tell you what will hurt you rosie but there are things which husband and wife must think of together i dare say it has occurred to you already that i am short of money lydgate paused but rosamond turned her neck and looked at a vase on the mantelpiece i was not able to pay for all the things we had to get before we were married and there have been expenses since which i have been obliged to meet i took pains to keep it from you while you were not well now we must think about it together and you must help me what can i do tertius said rosamond turning her eyes on him again that little speech of four words like so many others in all languages is capable 
by varied vocal inflections of expressing all states of mind from helpless dimness to exhaustive argumentative perception from the completest self-devoting fellowship to the most neutral aloofness rosamond's thin utterance threw into the words what can i do as much neutrality as they could hold they fell like a mortal chill on lydgate's roused tenderness he did not storm in indignation he felt too sad a sinking of the heart and when he spoke again it was more in the tone of a man who forces himself to fulfil a task it is necessary for you to know because i have to give security for a time and a man must come to make an inventory of the furniture rosamond coloured deeply have you not asked papa for money she said as soon as she could speak no rosie said lydgate decisively it is too late to do that i insist upon it that your father shall not know unless i choose to tell him added lydgate with a more peremptory emphasis this certainly was unkind but rosamond had thrown him back on evil expectation as to what she would do in the way of quiet steady disobedience the unkindness seemed unpardonable to her she was not given to weeping and disliked it but now her chin and lips began to tremble and the tears welled up he could not speak again immediately but rosamond did not go on sobbing she tried to conquer her agitation and wiped away her tears continuing to look before her at the mantelpiece your friends would not wish you to be without money and surely these odious tradesmen might be made to understand that and to wait if you would make proper representations to them this is idle rosamond said lydgate angrily you must learn to take my judgment on questions you don't understand i have made necessary arrangements and they must be carried out rosamond quietly went out of the room leaving lydgate helpless and wondering was she not coming back it seemed that she had no more identified herself with him than if they had been creatures of different species and opposing interests this is all the jewellery you ever gave me you can return what you like of it and of the plate also you will not of course expect me to stay at home to-morrow i shall go to papa's to many women the look lydgate cast at her would have been more terrible than one of anger it had in it a despairing acceptance of the distance she was placing between them i shall not touch these jewels rosie take them away again but i will write out a list of plate that we may return and that can be packed up and sent at once rosamond went to reach the inkstand and after setting it on the table was going to turn away when lydgate who was standing close by put his arm around her and drew her toward him saying come darling let us make the best of things it will only be for a time i hope that we shall have to be stingy and particular kiss me his native warm-heartedness took a great deal of quenching and it is a part of manliness for a husband to feel keenly the fact that an inexperienced girl has got into trouble by marrying him she received his kiss and returned it faintly and in this way an appearance of accord was recovered for the time Two it may be said that we know rosamond vincy from the beginning and that her character does not reveal itself more fully in the different scenes that follow this but so do we know the character of hamlet 
from the beginning and it is new light rather than more light that events throw upon it as the drama proceeds there is no surprise but a very great interest and instruction in rosamond's meddling conceit when she interferes with lydgate's brave endeavours to get out of debt and brings shame upon him by her secret appeals to his family and in the absolute immorality of her willingness to have him so bound by a money favour to bulstrode that he is helpless to declare his suspicions of bulstrode's guilt in an affair very like murder when the shadow of this affair falls upon lydgate too rosamond feels herself chiefly aggrieved and blames her husband for her suffering through him it is by no means out of keeping with what else we know of her that she should have meantime supposed herself to be loved by lydgate's friend ladislaw and that she should have suffered his passion without returning it as a just tribute to her meritorious beauty there is of course the question which i hope will occur to the reader of these papers whether in portraying a nature so altogether odious as rosamond's the author has not been guilty of lee's complexity is not such a character too simply too singly detestable to be a true copy i confess that it comes perilously near incurring some such censure but perhaps the defence may be that we have not taken due account of mitigating circumstances in rosamond's case if lydgate had smoothly and splendidly succeeded as she expected from the beginning and there had been no hint of debts or troubles her conceit would have concerned itself with little insignificant things she would have been content chiefly to talk incessantly about herself and safely flirt well within a devoted admiration of her husband she would have been a pretty bore without the power of considerable mischief as she was certainly always without the wish for it or the cognizance of it there is fairly enough the implication of all this in the representation of her character as we must own when we most suspect the author of having come to hate rosamond so much that she is just to her with difficulty novelists ought not to have their favourites among their creations as parents ought not to have their favourites among their children but no doubt they have them if the novelists are women they wish their readers to share their preferences and it might be true to say the same thing of the novelists even if they are men at any rate george eliot has her preferences most distinctly and she pursues some of her women with a rancour as perceptible as her fondness for others i will not deny that i think this a defect of her art it is so and i am not going to defend it any more in the case of dorothea brooke whom she loves than in the case of rosamond vincey whom she hates with a hatred passing her hatred of hetty sorrel and gwendolen harleth and all the other anti-heroines of her books she succeeds in commending these to our dislike rather than she succeeds in commending to our liking her romolas and mary garth and miras perhaps because in fiction as in life a woman does not know how to praise her friends sparingly enough but in dorothea brooke she has known how to hold her hand or rather has she known how so to temper dorothea's strength with weakness her wisdom with folly her good with evil as to render her entirely credible and entirely lovable three since i wrote the foregoing paragraph i have been reviewing the whole career or rather the whole character of dorothea in middlemarch 
and i think i can now go still farther in praise of her and keep well within the limits of reason she is of a most noble make not merely because she is of a high mind and an eager conscience but because she has a will to be generously of use to those who need her and because she is above all pettiness in the cruel disappointment which life brings when it teaches her that sometimes those who need her help most cannot receive it ungrudgingly or even at all she once says it herself in talk with will ladislaw i have a belief of my own and it comforts me what is that said will rather jealous of the belief that by desiring what is perfectly good even when we don't quite know what it is and cannot do what we would we are part of the divine power against evil widening the skirt of light and making the struggle with darkness narrower please not to call it by any name said dorothea putting out her hands entreatingly you will say it is persian or something else geographical it is my life i have found it out and cannot part with it dorothea is here spiritually outlined almost as strongly as she is physically intimated in this fine bit of portraiture miss brook had that kind of beauty which seems to be thrown into relief by poor dress her hand and wrist were so finely formed that she could wear sleeves not less bare of style than those in which the blessed virgin appeared to italian painters and her profile as well as her stature and bearing seemed to gain the more dignity from her plain garments which by the side of provincial fashion gave her the impressiveness of a fine quotation from the bible or from one of our elder poets in a paragraph of to-day's newspaper but it would be doing wrong to the human part which is so great a part of dorothea as it is with all george eliot's real heroines not to let her be seen in yet another phase where her beauty is contrasted with the different beauty of rosalind vincy and the very difference of their souls is suggested in the difference of their styles let those who know tell us exactly what stuff it was that dorothea wore in those days of mild autumn that thin white woollen stuff soft to the touch and soft to the eye it always seemed to have been lately washed and to smell of the sweet hedges was always in the shape of a pelisse with sleeves hanging all out of the fashion the grace and dignity were in her limbs and neck and about her simply parted hair and candid eyes the large round poke which was then in the fate of women seemed no more odd as a headdress than the gold trencher we call a halo dorothea put out her hand with her usual simple kindness and looked admiringly at lydgate's lovely bride they were both tall and their eyes were on a level but imagine rosamond's infantile blondness and wondrous crown of hair plaits with her pale blue dress of a fit and fashion so perfect that no dressmaker could look at it without emotion her small hands duly set off with the rings and that control self-consciousness of manner which is the expensive substitute for simplicity outlines i have called these sketches of dorothea and perhaps she is never more than outlined the inferior nature can be fully shown because it is of a material which can be palpably handled without loss or hurt but in the superior nature there is something elusive something sensitive that escapes or perishes under the touch and leaves the exhaustive study of a dumb image and not a speaking likeness rosamond vincy can be decanted to the dregs and be only more and more rosamond but if you pour out all dorothea her essence flies from you in a vital aroma she seems hardly to be contained in the story of her life but to exist mainly somewhere outside of it 
that story is indeed very slight and without the incidents that lend themselves to remembrance has powerful dramatic moments though it is of such a fatal pathos it is reportably that of a magnanimous young girl who falls in love with the notion of being the helpmeet of an eminent scholar because she believes in the importance of his work to the world and in her own fitness to be of use to him in it and so marries a dull passionless pedant of mean soul and mistaken mind who forces her out of his life from first to last because there is no room in it for any but his paltry self the tragedy of edward casaubon is that he has undertaken work inconceivably beyond his powers and that to a real scholarship his devoted labours are worse than useless but his wife's tragedy is that he himself is a greater error a sadder solecism than even these he cannot see her divine goodwill any more than he can feel value in the facts with which his learning deals it is the law of his narrow being that he must forbid almost her sympathy restrict her help to the merest mechanical effect and scarcely suffer her the efficiency of a trained nurse when his health fails it is to be said in his defence that he cannot admit her to his inner life because he has none and if on that mere outside which is his whole being he is cold and jealous and repellent that he was made so and cannot help it but dorothea's fate is not the less cruel because it is his fate too and she is all the greater because she rises above it not constantly but finally in her case as in the case of lydgate we see a meaner nature making a noble nature its prey but dorothea is more enduringly built than lydgate or else she is more favoured by chance perhaps it is scientifically accurate to say this rather than the other thing for rosamond outlives lydgate instead of dying and releasing him to new chances while casaubon suddenly in the most critical moment dies of heart failure and leaves dorothea free he has been on the point of enslaving her for ever of holding her by mortmain from that happiness to which his death must liberate her for her morbid conscience has sided with him in his jealousy of the man whom she is unconsciously tending to love and when he has put the cruelest pressure upon her to make her promise to be ruled by his wish after his death she comes out after a sleepless night to consent when dorothea was out on the gravel walks she lingered among the nearer clumps of trees hesitating as she had done once before though from a different cause then she had feared lest her effort at fellowship should be unwelcome now she dreaded going to the spot where she foresaw that she must bind herself to a fellowship from which she shrank neither law nor the world's opinion compelled her to this only her husband's nature and her own compassion only the ideal and not the real yoke of marriage when she entered the yew tree walk she could not see her husband but the walk had bends and she went expecting to catch sight of his figure wrapped in a blue cloak which with a warm velvet cap was his outer garment on chill days for the garden it occurred to her that he might be resting in the summer-house toward which the path diverged a little turning the angle she could see him seated on the bench and his brow was bowed down on them the blue cloak being dragged forward and screening the face on each side he exhausted himself last night dorothea said to herself thinking at first that he was asleep and that the summer-house was too damp a place to rest in she went into the summer-house and said i am come edward i am ready he took no notice and she thought that he must be fast asleep she laid her hand on his shoulder and repeated i am ready still he was motionless and with a sudden confused fear she leaned down to him close to his head crying in a distressed tone wake dear wake listen to me i am come to answer but dorothea never gave her answer 
this end with whatever skill it is managed must be confessed a mechanical means of extricating dorothea from her difficulty it is to be condemned for that and it is to be regretted that george eliot had not had the higher courage of her art and the clearer vision of her morality and shown dorothea capable of breaking a promise extorted from her against her reason and against her heart it was from ladislaw and her chance of happiness with him that her husband would have withheld her and she could not have been more recreant to his will in being recreant to her word her marriage to ladislaw at last is one of the finest things and one of the truest things in a book so great that it almost persuades one to call it the greatest in english fiction it was not because middlemarch is an immense canvas thronged with such a multitude of marvellously distinguished and different figures that it so richly represents life other huge novels have been of as great scope and greater dramatic effect but middlemarch alone seems to me akin in spiritual power to war and peace it is in its truth to motives as well as results that it is so tremendously convincing after a lapse of years one comes to it not with a sense of having overmeasured it before but with the perception that one had not at first realized its grandeur it is as large as life in those moral dimensions which deepen inwardly and give the real compass of any artistic achievement through the impression received there are none of its incidents that i find were overestimated in my earlier knowledge of them and there are some that are far greater than i had remembered i have had especially to correct my former judgment i am not sure that it was mine at first hand of the character of ladislaw in his fitness to be dorothea's lover i had thought him a slight if not a light man a poorish sort of bohemian existing by her preference in the reader's tolerance and perhaps as her husband half a mistake but in this renewed acquaintance with him i must own him a person of weight by those measures which test the value of precious stones or precious metals an artist through and through a man of high courage and high honour and of a certain social detachment which leaves him free to see the more easily and honestly himself dorothea made great and sorrowful mistakes through her generous and loyal nature but ladislaw was one of her inspirations a centre of truth in which her love and her duty otherwise so sadly at odds could meet and be at peace End of section twenty four section twenty five of heroines of fiction by william dean howells this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter six george eliot's gwendolen harlot and janet dempster there was such strength and such promise of strenuous continuance in the work which made marion evans's pseudonym known that her public could await each of her successive novels in reliance upon some fresh evidence of her power this could scarcely be shown in greater measure than at first and there are people of sound judgment who consider her scenes of clerical life still her best fiction though it was followed by silas marner and adam bede and the mill on the floss and romola and middlemarch and daniel deronda the last stands at the other end of the great line and until we reach theophrastus such there is scarcely after the first a sign of failing skill in the cunning hand it has seemed to me therefore the more interesting in this concluding study of george eliot's heroines to deal with types drawn from the extremes parted by so many and such splendid performances one few students of daniel deronda if they were readers of the novel when it began to appear will have forgotten the characteristic terms which form gwendolen harleth's introduction was she beautiful or not beautiful and what was the secret of form or expression which gave 
the dynamic quality to her glance was the good or the evil genius dominant in those beams probably the evil else why was the effect that of unrest rather than of undisturbed charm why was the wish to look again felt as coercion and not as a longing in which the whole being consents she who raised these questions in daniel deronda's mind was occupied in gambling in one of those splendid continental resorts now mostly closed to their rich and noble patrons and the talk about her goes on rather too much for the reader's ear among the spectators the nereid in sea-green robes and silver ornaments with a pale sea-green feather fastened in silver falling backward over her green hat and light brown hair was gwendolen harleth she was under the wing or rather soared by the shoulder of the lady who had sat by her at the roulette table a striking girl that miss harleth unlike others yes she has got herself up a sort of serpent now all green and silver and winds her neck about a little more than usual oh she must always be doing something extraordinary she is that kind of girl i fancy you like a ne then and long narrow eyes when they go with such an ensemble the ensemble du serpent she is certainly very graceful but she wants a tinge of colour in her cheeks it is a sort of lamia beauty she has on the contrary i think her complexion one of her charms it is a warm paleness it looks thoroughly healthy and that delicate nose with its gradual little upward curve is distracting and then her mouth there never was a prettier mouth the lips curl backwards so finely eh think so i cannot endure that sort of mouth it looks so self-complacent as if it knew its own beauty the curves are too immovable i like a mouth that trembles more it appears of course that the girl is gambling this once for the distraction of the experience that she is of good family in good society and that she is chaperoned at the roulette table by her elderly cousin who is a baroness the impression that she is wilful conscious selfish and spoiled is not corrected by anything in her very ugly history as it ensues though there is throughout the suggestion of potentialities for good in her nature eventuating at last in a magnanimous penitence of which we have at once some hint in the interest which deronda's quality inspires in her a young girl in the first pages of a novel does not betray for nothing the curiosity gwendolen confesses it is obvious to the meanest intelligence that she is going to be in love with him and her passion though unrequited and not very well justified to the reader by anything shown in the elaborated personality of that fine young jew proves the saving factor in her life it does not keep her from the great error and wickedness of marrying so brutally bad a man as grandcourt out of sordid ambition and lust of the things that money can buy but those who like to condone the faults of pretty women will find some excuse for gwendolen harleth in her failure to win the love of deronda it may be also urged in her behalf that she is poor as well as proud and pretty and that she is tempted and flattered out of her better self by the sense of inherent power i hope there are none who go so far as to find merit in her letting her abominable husband come so near drowning before her eyes that when she has made up her mind to save him it is too late even the reader who is not acquainted with gwendolen harleth at first hands will perceive from these intimations that she is a person 
of very mixed qualities very daringly composed the ordinary observer who discovers that a woman is a poseuse is apt rashly to decide that she is also a fool but this by no means follows she is often a person of a great deal of sense and perhaps principle and she may behave wisely up to that point where the brain requires the help of the heart in achieving final wisdom she may even have a heart and experience its compunctions at all times except in the deliriums of triumphant will or of gratified vanity flirts are by no means wholly wicked or the world which is pretty full of them would be a much worse world than it is flirts even of the deadly quality of gwendolen harleth are tempered to mercy by their womanly weaknesses and are very rarely quite demoniacal the histrionic strain in her nature which makes her opposers would if it had gone a little deeper have made her an artist and depersonalized its effects it is in fact very pitiful when while hesitating to accept grandcourt she turns her thoughts to art with the modest ambition of excelling in opera for in society she has been admired both for her acting and singing she determines not to take this step without due authorization and she asks the advice of klesmer the musician that conscientious artist is kindly merciless concerning her gifts and he leaves her to a mortification and despair after which there is nothing for her worldliness but a loveless marriage with a man of whom she knows nothing but evil one very black chapter of his past is revealed to her by a woman whom he has wronged and who comes to plead with her not to marry him bringing grandcourt's children with her in proof that he should be her husband and not gwendolen's she promises and she breaks her promise she marries grandcourt and he takes her home to the splendour and luxury for which she marries him she fell silent in spite of herself as they approached the gates and when her husband said here we are at home and for the first time kissed her on the lips she hardly knew of it it was no more than the passive acceptance of a greeting in the midst of an absorbing show but there was a brilliant light in the hall warmth matting carpets full-length portraits olympian statues assiduous servants gwendolen felt herself being led by grandcourt along a subtly scented corridor into an anteroom where she saw an open doorway sending out a rich glow of light and colour these are our dens said grandcourt you will like to be quiet here till dinner we shall dine early he pressed her hand to his lips and moved away more in love than he had ever expected to be gwendolen yielded up her hat and mantle threw herself into a chair by the glowing hearth and saw herself repeated in glass panels with all her faint green satin surroundings the housekeeper had passed into this boudoir from the adjoining dressing-room and seemed disposed to linger here is a packet madame which i was ordered to give into nobody's hands but yours when you were alone the person who brought it said it was a present particularly ordered by mr grandcourt but he was not to know of its arrival till he saw you wear it excuse me madame i felt it right to obey orders gwendolen took the packet and let it lie on her lap till she heard the doors close it came into her mind that the packet might contain the diamonds which grandcourt had spoken of as being deposited somewhere and to be given to her on her marriage in this moment of confused feeling and creeping luxurious languor she was glad of this diversion and glad of such an event as having her own diamonds to try on within all the sealed paper coverings was a box but within the box there was a jewel-case 
and now she felt no doubt that she had the diamonds but on opening the case in the same instant that she saw them gleam she saw a letter lying above them it was as if an adder had lain on them her heart gave a leap which seemed to have spent all her strength and as she opened the bit of thin paper it shook with the trembling of her hands but it was legible as print and thrust its words upon her these diamonds which were once given with ardent love to lydia glasher she passes on to you you have broken your word to her that you might possess what was hers perhaps you think of being happy as she once was and of having beautiful children such as hers who will thrust hers aside god is too just for that the man you have married has a withered heart his best young love was mine you could not take that from me when you took the rest he would have married me at last if you had not broken your word you will have your punishment i desire it with all my soul you took him with your eyes open the willing wrong you have done me will be your curse it seemed at first as if gwendolen's eyes were spellbound in reading the horrible words of the letter over and over again as a doom of penance but suddenly a new spasm of terror made her lean forward and stretch out the paper toward the fire lest accusation and proof at once should meet all eyes it flew like a feather from her trembling fingers and was caught up in a great draught of flame in her movement the casket fell to the floor and the diamonds rolled out she took no notice but fell back in her chair again helpless she could not see the reflections of herself then they were like so many women petrified white but coming near herself you might have seen the tremor in her lips and hands after that long while there was a tap at the door and grandcourt entered dressed for dinner the sight of him brought a new nervous shock and gwendolen screamed again and again with hysterical violence he had expected to see her dressed and smiling ready to be led down he saw her pallid shrieking as it seemed with terror the jewels scattered around her on the floor in grand court the imperious girl who had dreamed of ruling him finds a master whose will can break her own or bend it to his when he chooses and their marriage is a long atrocity which begins almost from this awful moment one evening shortly before they came to the abbey they were going to dine at brackenshaw castle gwendolen had said to herself that she would never wear those diamonds they had horrible words clinging and crawling about them as from some bad dream whose images lingered on the perturbed sense she came down dressed in her white with only a streak of gold and a pendant of emeralds which grandcourt had given her round her neck and the little emerald stars in her ears grandcourt stood with his back to the fire and looked at her as she entered am i altogether as you like she said speaking rather gaily she was not without enjoyment in this occasion of going to brackenshaw castle with her new dignities upon her as men whose affairs are sadly involved will enjoy dining out among persons likely to be under a pleasant mistake about them no said grandcourt gwendolen felt suddenly uncomfortable wondering what was to come oh mercy she exclaimed the pause lasting till she could bear it no longer how am i to alter myself put on the diamonds said grandcourt looking straight at her with his narrow glance gwendolen paused in her turn afraid of showing any emotion and feeling that nevertheless there was some change in her eyes as they met his but she was obliged to answer and said as indifferently as she could oh please not i don't think diamonds suit me what you think has nothing to do with it said grandcourt 
his sotto voce imperiousness seeming to have an evening quietude and finish like his toilet i wish you to wear the diamonds pray excuse me i like the emeralds said gwendolen frightened in spite of her preparation that white hand of his which was touching his whisker was capable she fancied of clinging round her neck and threatening to throttle her for her fear of him mingled with the vague foreboding of some retributive calamity which hung about her life had reached a superstitious point oblige me by telling me your reason for not wearing the diamonds when i desire it said grandcourt his eyes were still fixed upon her and she felt her own eyes narrowing under them as if to shut out an entering pain of what use was the rebellion within her she could say nothing that would not hurt her worse than submission turning slowly and covering herself again she went to her dressing-room as she reached out the diamonds it occurred to her that her unwillingness to wear them might have already raised a suspicion in grandcourt that she had some knowledge about them which he had not given her she fancied that his eyes showed a delight in torturing her how could she be defiant she had nothing to say that would touch him nothing but what would give him a more painful grasp of her consciousness he delights in making the dogs and horses quail that is half his pleasure in calling them his she said to herself as she opened the jewel-case with a shivering sensation it will be so with me and i shall quail what else is there for me i will not say to the world pity me she was about to ring for her maid when she heard the door open behind her it was grandcourt who came in you want some one to fasten them he said coming toward her she did not answer but simply stood still leaving him to take out the ornaments and fasten them as he would what makes you so cold said grandcourt when he had fastened the last earring pray put plenty of furs on i hate to see a woman come into a room looking frozen if you are to appear as a bride at all appear decently Two the tragedy can scarcely be said to culminate in the scene of grandcourt's death which gwendolen herself describes to deronda not knowing whether she has really been willing he should drown and not seeking to defend herself in telling how she leaped to him with a rope at last too late but it ends there and there is perhaps a supreme effect in this uncertainty of hers which agonizes as much as it consoles it sets the seal to a record as true to human nature as it is terrible and testifies to a power in the writer which is nowhere surpassed in the art which her great conscience exalted heaven high above its wonted office of amusing to revert from her character and its development to that of janet dempster in scenes of clerical life is a curious and valuable experience for the student of george eliot's work we go from an ethicism in gwendolen harleth's case as rootless and flowerless as that of the stoics back to an ideal of conduct sprung from a sense of the power not ourselves that makes for righteousness and to a faith in the fatherly love of the judge of all the earth which promises itself compensation hereafter for whatever is wrong here in daniel deronda george eliot had reached that moment of her agnosticism when it seemed enough to join the choir invisible of those whose personality has indeed perished for ever but whose character remains to help and comfort us who are still wandering through this twilight toward the eternal night it involved a sublime self-abnegation which we cannot contemplate without a glow of pride in the humanity so self-sufficing and a thrill of reverent admiration it was magnificent and i will not withhold my sense that if it was sincere 
it transcended the rapture of martyrdom all the more i feel bound to recognize the meek beauty of the faith which was the spring and inspiration of the author's art in janet's repentance their right conduct was not self-derived but was an effect of the universal law of love which remembers and considers every minutest atom of life and guards the finite human consciousness through its affinity to the infinite and the divine it is not pertinent to pronounce upon the moral quality of the two creative moods of the author but only to note their difference there is socially almost as wide a difference between gwendolen harlot and janet dempster who are alike in their unhappiness and its common source in a cruel marriage but gwendolen has sought her misery through her ambition and janice has come to her through her love and it has had power to drag her down through the refuge she takes from it but never to spoil her noble nature her husband a shrewd and able lawyer in a provincial town is himself a drunkard and when he is in drink he is of a brutal cruelty to his wife which has at last driven her to try his vice as a means of deadening her misery from it we have seen how grandcourt could torture his bride now let us see how on another level of life dempster could devote a yet more helpless victim to a less guilty rage when he comes home imbruted by his cups there was a large heavy knocker on the green door and though mr dempster carried a latch-key he sometimes chose to use the knocker he chose to do so now the thunder resounded through orchard street and after a single minute there was a second clap louder than the first another minute and still the door was not opened whereupon mr dempster muttering took out his latch-key and with less difficulty than might have been expected thrust it into the door when he opened the door the passage was dark janet in the loudest rasping tone was the next sound that rang through the house janet again before a slow step was heard on the stairs and a distant light began to flicker on the wall of the passage curse you you creeping idiot come faster can't you yet a few seconds and the figure of a tall woman holding a slant a heavy plated drawing-room candlestick appeared at the turning of the passage that led to the broader entrance she had on a light dress which sat loosely about her figure but did not disguise its liberal graceful outline a heavy mass of straight jet-black hair had escaped from its fastening and hung over her shoulders her grandly cut features pale with the natural paleness of a brunette had premature lines about them telling that the years had been lengthened by sorrow and the delicately curved nostril which seemed made to quiver with the proud consciousness of power and beauty must have quivered to the heart-piercing griefs which had given that worn look to the corners of her mouth her wide-open black eyes had a strangely fixed sightless gaze as she paused at the turning and stood silent before her husband i'll teach you to keep me waiting in the dark you pale staring fool he said advancing with his slow drunken step what you've been drinking again have you i'll beat you into your senses he laid his hand with a firm grip on her shoulder turned her round and pushed her slowly before him along the passage and through the dining-room door which stood wide open on their left hand there was a portrait of janet's mother a grey-haired dark-eyed old woman in a neatly fluted cap hanging over the mantelpiece surely the aged eyes took on a look of anguish as they see janet not trembling no it would be better if she trembled standing stupidly unmoved in her great beauty while the heavy arm is lifted to strike her the blow falls another and another surely the mother hears that cry oh robert pity pity poor grey-haired woman was it for this you suffered a mother's pangs in your lone widowhood five and thirty years ago was it for this you kept the little worn morocco shoes janet had first run in and kissed them day by day 
when she was away from you a tall girl at school was it for this you looked so proudly at her when she came back to you in her rich pale beauty like a tall white arum that had just unfolded its grand pure curves to the sun the author's recurrence in her latest heroine to the pale dark beauty of her earliest is an interesting evidence of the persistence of an ideal and the mind's unconscious obedience to it but janet is of far simpler stuff than gwendolen in every way and one is made to feel her weaker and tenderer through her very largeness of physique she is indeed of a loving and forgiving sort and there is something most womanly and most pitiful in her eagerness to forget her husband's brutality as soon as the moment of it is past there could be nothing more pathetic than her willingness to lend herself to his wish of burlesquing the young curate who is devotedly preaching and living christianity in the town but who has fallen under the drunken lawyer's condemnation as a hypocrite she gives all her cleverness to this miserable work with no thought but of pleasing the husband who beats her and for the time he is pleased but another time comes when she meets his fury with rebellion and then the end comes about eleven the party dispersed with the exception of mr budd who had joined them after dinner and appeared disposed to stay drinking a little longer janet began to hope that he would stay long enough for dempster to become heavy and stupid and so fall asleep downstairs which was a rare but occasional ending of his nights she told the servants to sit up no longer and she herself undressed and went to bed trying to cheat her imagination into the belief that the day was ended for her but when she lay down she became more intensely awake than ever everything she had taken this evening seemed only to stimulate her senses and her apprehensions to new vividness her heart beat violently and she heard every sound in the house at last when it was twelve she heard mr budd go out she heard the door slam dempster had not moved was he asleep would he forget the minute seemed long while with a quickening pulse she was on the stretch to catch every sound janet the loud jarring voice seemed to strike her like a hurled weapon janet he called again moving out of the dining-room to the foot of the stairs there was a pause of a moment if you don't come i'll kill you another pause and she heard him turn back into the dining-room perhaps he would kill her let him life was as hideous as death for years she had been rushing on to some unknown but certain horror and now she was close upon it she was almost glad she was in a state of flushed feverish defiance that neutralized her woman's terrors she heard his heavy step on the stairs she saw the slowly advancing light then she saw the tall massive figure and the heavy face now fierce with drunken rage he had nothing but the candle in his hand he set it down on the table and advanced close to the bed so you think you'll defy me do you we'll see how long that will last get up madame out of bed this instant in the close presence of the dreadful man of this huge crushing force armed with savage will poor janet's desperate defiance all forsook her and her terrors came back trembling she got up and stood helpless in her night-dress before her husband he seized her with his heavy grasp by the shoulder and pushed her before him i'll cool your hot spirit for you i'll teach you to brave me slowly he pushed her along before him downstairs and through the passage where a small oil lamp was still flickering what was he going to do to her she thought every moment he was going to dash her before him on the ground but she gave no scream she only trembled he pushed her on to the entrance and held her firmly in his grasp while he lifted the latch of the door then he opened the door a little way thrust her out through it and slammed it behind her for a short space it seemed like a deliverance to janet the harsh northeast wind that blew through her thin night-dress and sent her long heavy black hair streaming seemed like the breath of pity after the grasp of that threatening monster but soon the sense of release from an overpowering terror gave away before the sense of the fate that had really come upon her this then was what she had been travelling toward through her long years of misery not yet death oh if she had been brave enough for it death would have been better 
three these are dreadful things and so squalid that they must shock the refined reader but who that knows life can deny that they happen they happen far oftener than is ever known and if the veil could be lifted from many marriages that show a fair outside what hideous things should not we see it is not ill but it is very well to be confronted with the ugly realities the surviving savageries that the smug hypocrisy of civilization denies for till we recognize them we shall not abate them or even try to do so in such a scene as this we have no outlaw beating down the suppliant figure of his paramour as in the burglar's butchery of nancy sykes but a man of education and of a certain position wreaking his frenzy of drink and hate upon a woman not guiltless of his own vice but utterly devoted to him at her worst who can doubt as to the relative value of the pictures as to the art in them respectively we almost lose sight of the superiority of george eliot's incense of her superior morality this had not yet become the pure ethicism of her final evolution it was not yet divorced from her strong religious tradition but was still more vitally related to it and when she imagined janet dempster redeemed and purified it was through confession and submission to the poor man whom she has helped her wicked husband to deride and who comes to her help first owning his own frailty and imperfection there might be something there might be much to criticise in the conduct of the story after janet's repentance begins it is difficult to keep the true pathos of the situation free from sentimentality but it is wrought out mainly with a sincerity both ethical and aesthetical and where it fails in either effect it is not through the author's want of faith in her ideal or her method no one can be held to stricter account than this it is for others to surpass george eliot in motive or handling if they can in dealing with such a situation and to bring greater right and clearer reason to it section twenty six of heroines of fiction by william dean howells this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter seven anthony trollope's lily dale there are no two english novelists of the period we call victorian who are more unlike and yet more characteristically english than george eliot and anthony trollope it is strange that in their far greater truth to english life they should not be named together like dickens and thackeray as the representative english novelists of their time but they are not and it is doubtful if time will repair the injustice which long ago became inveterate they are both far greater artists far greater intellectual and moral forces than the masters whose names stand for victorian fiction they paint english manners with a fidelity simply inconceivable of dickens and thackeray and the problems they deal with are of an importance and interest surpassingly greater on the psychological side george eliot's transcendent power has been fully recognized but the greatness of her world and its wide inclusiveness has not been as duly certified by criticism just as in anthony trollope's case his immense acquaintance with society in all its ranks and orders has taken the mind of his critics from his profound and even subtle proficiency in the region of motive no one fails to note the attention given to questions of conscience in george eliot's novels they are seen always present or imminent but few readers seem to have been aware how very largely these questions enter into the texture 
and colour of anthony trollope's fiction the difference appears to be that she concerns herself with what we may call the puritanic conscience and he with what we may call the episcopal conscience their characters are equally far from the unmoral region in which say mr hardy's quasi pagans dwell one in all fiction i doubt if there is a lovelier or sweeter conscience story than that of the warden unhappily for the purpose of these papers we are barred from that study of the warden which we might make in proof of trollope's psychological power by the fact that it is so wholly the story of a gentle and conscientious old man as scarcely to have a heroine eleanor harding the daughter of the warden must stand for the heroine and though she is his worthy daughter and is most dramatically circumstanced in her relation to her lover whose conscience obliges him to make the wardenship untenable to a man of her father's conscience she is not of such structural value in the story that one strongly feels or remembers her part in it the situation is in itself so affecting so charming that it might constitute eleanor harding a heroine of the first order but something that may be called want of charm in the girl herself perhaps a reflex effect from her history as it is prolonged into her second marriage with dean arabin after poor john bold has sacrificed his conscience to his love of her may be at fault but at any rate the mind after grappling with her idea relaxes its hold and turns away to cling to that of lily dale in the divers and sundry books where she appears and reappears the small house at allington where we first meet her is no such symmetrically proportioned and excellently fashioned work of art as the warden which stands almost sole among the author's books for form it is a very well balanced and compactly built story however and strongly held together by uncommon singleness of motive the love of lily dale for adolphus crosby who jilts her after their engagement and marries lady alexandrina de courcy is the interest which the whole life of the book centres about so unremittingly that in the retrospect it seems the only interest but there is a subsidiary interest in the love of john eames for lily dale vital enough to prolong itself through the wandering ways of the last chronicle of barset and really essential to the full evolution of lily's fate without this we could not know that her hapless love had become so largely herself that when it was crushed there was not enough of her left together for a second and happier passion she lived to realize that her false lover had been too basely cruel not for her forgiveness but for her endurance she lived to refuse him when he offered himself again after his wife's death she lived to see him and even in a social exigency to have him speak to her but though she lived to know that he was nothing to her forever she lived also to make sure that no man could be anything to her as a lover evermore this put an end to the long brave hopes of johnny eames who was not always as high as his hopes but always delightfully a human being such as lily might well be glad to have for a friend it cannot be said that the concluding passages of her story are as effectively managed as those of what is more distinctly her tragedy 
and yet her final and decisive refusal of eames is truly the climax of the whole her character triumphs her nature remains good and kind but her life that poor little existence which is all there is of her on earth is spoiled of that which should have made its supreme happiness it is a great story whose absolute fidelity to manners and whose reliance upon the essential strength of the motive must exalt it in the esteem of those accustomed to think of what they read two if any such reader happens himself to be of that period of the early eighteen sixties to which lily dale's romantic young girlhood belonged and in which young girlhood was sweeter than it has ever been since he will see her as she first appeared to adolphus crosby he will know that she wore a large hoop which tilted enough when she played croquet to give a glimpse of her white stockings that her loose sleeves were confined at the wrists with narrow little linen cuffs matching a little linen collar at her neck and that everything was very plain and smooth about her she would have on a pork pie hat which was thought very chic in the days before it was known what chic was the word itself being not yet and but for the author i should say that she wore her hair in a net of rather a heavy velvet mesh the author however contends that she wore it in simple braids and that it was not flaxen hair and yet it was very light nor did it approach auburn and yet there ran through it a golden tint that gave it a distinct brightness of its own her eyes were brightly blue and seldom kept by any want of courage from fixing themselves where they pleased her face was not perfectly oval her nose was somewhat broader than it should be she had a dimple in her decided chin she was something below the middle height the time of the tall heroine not having come yet and she was very fair so that the soft tint of colour which relieved her complexion was rather acknowledged than distinctly seen this was the sort of girl who gave her heart in perfect abandon of passion and hero worship to as selfish a scoundrel as ever was recreant to his plighted troth the worst of adolphus crosby is that he is no worse in nature than he is worse in conduct he could not be and yet in his way he always loved lily dale and he suffered in betraying her but he did betray her he first won her heart in her quiet home at allington under her mother's approving eyes and then when he found that her uncle squire dale would not meet his hopes as to settlements went from her with renewed vows of constancy and offered himself to lady alexandrina his engagement to lily was already known and she had to bear the public shame as well as the secret anguish of being jilted the thing was as bad as it could be but how bad it was for lily dale can be known only to those familiar with her history and these do not need telling i wish i might send to it those unfamiliar with it for i do not believe that a story of simple heartbreak as it may happen in good society without the squalid adjuncts of social perdition or infamy for the victim has ever been so truly told lily dale was jilted by the man whom she had absolutely trusted and she had to gather up her broken life and make what she could of it the mild but strong resistance she opposes to her fate begins with her first knowledge of it she has never been represented as very beautiful 
or brilliant but merely as sweet and good and kind with an unselfish common sense which has served her well with every one but the wretch who stole her heart from her these great qualities for oh dear young ladies these are the great qualities avail her in the hour of her disaster when she must spare herself in order to spare others and first of all the poor mother whom her wretched lover has made the messenger of his treason to her crosby had written to mrs dale from courcy castle where he had just been accepted by lady alexandrina and had asked her to tell lily enclosing a brief note for her which her mother was to give her if she thought best now they the letters had been read by her to whom they had been addressed and the daughter was standing before the mother to hear her doom tell me all at once lily had said but in what words was her mother to tell her is it from him mamma may i read it he cannot be it is from mr crosby is he ill mamma tell me at once if he is ill i will go to him no my darling he is not ill not yet do not read it yet oh lily it brings bad news very bad news mamma said lily whatever it is i must of course be made to know it i begin to guess the truth it will pain you to say it shall i read the letter mrs dale was astonished at her calmness it could not be that she had guessed the truth or she would not stand like that with tearless eyes and unquelled courage before her you shall read it but i ought to tell you first oh my child my own one lily was now leaning against the bed and her mother was standing over her caressing her then tell me said she but i know what it is he has thought it all over while away from me and he finds that it must not be as we have supposed before he went i offered to release him and now he knows that he had better accept my offer is it so mamma in answer to this mrs dale did not speak but lily understood from her signs that it was so he might have written it to me myself said lily very proudly mamma we will go down to breakfast he has sent nothing to me then there is a note he bids me read it but i have not opened it it is here give it me said lily almost sternly let me have his last words to me and she took the note from her mother's hands lily said the note your mother will have told you all before you read these few words you will know that you have trusted one who was quite untrustworthy i know that you will hate me i cannot even ask you to forgive me you will let me pray that you may yet be happy a c she read these few words still leaning against the bed then she got up and walking to a chair seated herself with her back to her mother mrs dale moving silently after her stood over the back of the chair not daring to speak to her so she sat for some five minutes with her eyes fixed upon the open window and with crosby's note in her hand i will not hate him and i do forgive him she said at last struggling to command her voice and hardly showing that she could not altogether succeed in her attempt i may not write to him again but you shall write and tell him so now we will go down to breakfast and so saying she got up from her chair mrs dale almost feared to speak to her her composure was so complete and her manner so stern and fixed you frighten me lily she said your very calmness frightens me dear mamma and the poor girl absolutely smiled as she embraced her mother you need not be frightened by my calmness i know the truth well i have been very unfortunate very the brightest hopes of my life are all gone and i shall never again see him 
whom i love beyond all the world then at last she broke down and wept in her mother's arms there was not a word of anger spoken then against him who had done all this mrs dale felt that she did not dare to speak in anger against him and words of anger were not likely to come from poor lily she indeed hitherto did not know the whole of his offence for she had not read his letter give it me mamma she said at last it has to be done sooner or later not now lily i have told you all all that you need know at present yes now mamma and again that sweet silvery voice became stern i will read it now and there shall be an end whereupon mrs dale gave her the letter and she read it in silence her mother though standing somewhat behind her watched her narrowly as she did so she was now lying over upon the bed and the letter was on the pillow as she propped herself upon her arm her tears were running and ever and again she would stop to dry her eyes her sobs too were very audible but she went on steadily with her reading till she came to the line on which crosby told that he had already engaged himself to another woman then her mother could see that she paused suddenly and that a shudder slightly convulsed all her limbs he has been very quick she said almost in a whisper and then she finished the letter tell him mamma she said that i do forgive him and i will not hate him you will tell him that from me will you not and then she raised herself from the bed you must mamma or if you do not i shall do so remember that i love him you know what it is to have loved one single man he has made me very unhappy i hardly know yet how unhappy but i have loved him and do love him i believe in my heart that he still loves me where this has been there must not be hatred and unforgiveness i will pray that i may become able to forgive him said mrs dale but you must write to him those words indeed you must mamma she bids me tell you that she has forgiven you and will not hate you promise me that i can make no promise now lily i will think about it and endeavour to do my duty lily was now seated and was holding the skirt of her mother's dress mamma she said looking up into her mother's face you must be very good to me now and i must be very good to you we shall be always together now i must be your friend and counsellor and be everything to you more than ever i must fall in love with you now and she smiled again and the tears were almost dry upon her cheeks three i think the quiet truth of this scene full of the gentle self-control of a nature superior to the impulses of passion is worth worlds of passion it is really so that such a girl as lily dale would have spoken and acted and the readers of latter-day romance are the losers that such types of girlhood are no longer presented to them in the present default i could not send the girls of this period back to better company than hers who was the contemporary of their mothers and often their companion it will not be contended by any true friend of hers that she was perfectly wise but what she tried to do she did she did forgive the man who had so atrociously wronged her in a manner she did fall in love with her mother and live to console and support her under the blow that had fallen upon her through her own heart in the lapse of time she achieved a calm that if never gay was often cheerful after much honest endeavour in behalf of johnny eames she found it was no longer in her to love any man again when with incredible meanness crosby offered himself after his wife's death she refused him not ungently 
when later they chanced to meet she found that she no longer cared even for the man he had once seemed he was no longer her hero her idol and the wonder was that he could ever have been she had survived her illusion but there could never be any other for love is always an illusion in its place she had ceased to suffer from the hurt he had done her but not from the memory of her suffering this had full power upon her when chance a freak or a duty of fate brought them together again there were in fact two last meetings of this sort both treated with a dignity a repose worthy of the material and with a true strong emotion very uncommon in the author who had caught from thackeray the bad habit of twaddling about his women and could not often leave them so entirely alone to work themselves out in their own way as he does lily dale in this case in the first of the meetings lily was riding with her cousin bernard and his betrothed in rotten row when on a sudden coming slowly towards her along the diverging path and leaning on the arm of another man she saw adolphus crosby she had never seen him since a day on which she had parted from him with many kisses with warm pressing eager kisses of which she had been no what ashamed he had then been to her almost as her husband she had trusted him entirely and had thrown herself into his arms with a full reliance there is often much of reticence on the part of a woman towards a man to whom she is engaged something also of shamefacedness occasionally there exists a shadow of doubt at least of that hesitation which shows that in spite of vows the woman knows that a change may come and that provision for such possible steps backward should always be within her reach but lily had cast all such caution to the winds she had given herself to the man entirely and had determined that she would sink or swim stand or fall live or die by him and by his truth he had been as false as hell she had been in his arms clinging to him kissing him swearing that her only pleasure in the world was to be with him with him her treasure her promised husband and within a month a week he had been false to her there had come upon her crushing tidings and she had for days wondered at herself that they had not killed her but she had lived and had forgiven him she had still loved him and had received new offers from him which had been answered as the reader knows but she had never seen him since the day on which she had parted from him at allington without a doubt as to his fate now he was before her walking on the footpath almost within reach of her whip then he raised his eyes and saw lily's side face and recognized her had he seen her before he had been stopped on his way i think he would have passed on endeavouring to escape observation but as it was his feet had been arrested before he knew of her close vicinity and now it would seem that he was afraid of her and was flying from her were he at once to walk off leaving his friend behind him and he knew that she had seen him and had recognized him and was now suffering from his presence he could not but perceive that it was so from the fixedness of her face and from the constrained manner in which she gazed before her he could not take his eyes from off her he could see that she was as pretty as ever that she was but very little altered she was in truth somewhat stouter than in the old days but of that he took no special notice should he speak to her should he try to catch her eye and then raise his hat should he go up to her horse's head boldly and ask her to let bygones be bygones or should he simply ask her after her health 
he made one step towards her and he saw that the face became more rigid and more fixed than before and then he desisted he told himself that he was simply hateful to her he thought that he could perceive that there was no tenderness mixed with her unabated anger at this moment bernard dale and emily came close upon him and bernard saw him at once done he said i think we will ride on and he put his horse into a trot is there anything the matter said emily to her lover nothing specially the matter he replied but you were standing in company with the greatest blackguard that ever lived and i thought we had better change our ground bernard said lily flashing on him with all the fire which her eyes could command then she remembered that she could not reprimand him for the offence of such abuse in such a company so she reined in her horse and fell a-weeping the second and the last of the two encounters between lily and crosby took place in a great london house where lily was looking at the pictures with her cousin and his friends mrs harold smith had declared that she would not look at another painting till the exhibition was open three of the ladies were seated in the drawing-room and sif dunn was standing before them lecturing about art as though he had been brought up on the ancient masters emily and bernard were lingering behind and the others were simply delaying their departure till the truant lovers should have caught them at this moment two gentlemen entered the room from the gallery and the two gentlemen were fowler pratt and adolphus crosby all the party except mrs thorne knew crosby personally and all of them except mrs harold smith knew something of the story of what had occurred between crosby and lily sif dunn had learned it all since the meeting in the park having nearly learned it all from what he had seen there with his eyes but mrs thorne who knew lily's story did not know crosby's appearance crosby would have gone on but that in this attempt to do so he passed close by the chair on which mrs harold smith was sitting and that he was accosted by her mr crosby she said i haven't seen you for an age has it come to pass that you have buried yourself entirely he did not know how to extricate himself so as to move on at once he paused and hesitated and then stopped and made an attempt to talk to mrs smith as though he were at his ease the attempt was anything but successful but having once stopped he did not know how to put himself in motion again so that he might escape at this moment bernard dale and emily dunstable came up and joined the group but neither of them had discovered who crosby was till they were close upon him crosby in his attempt to talk to mrs smith had smiled and simpered and had then felt that to smile and simper before lily dale with a pretended indifference to her presence was false on his part and would seem to be mean he would have avoided lily for both their sakes had it been possible but it was no longer possible and he could not keep his eyes from her face hardly knowing what he did he bowed to her lifted his hat and uttered some word of greeting lily from the moment that she had perceived his presence had looked straight before her with something almost of fierceness in her eyes now when he saluted her she turned her face full upon him and bowed to him then she rose from her seat and made her way between sif dunn and pratt out of the circle the blood had mounted to her face and suffused it all and her whole manner was such that it could escape the observation of none who stood there even mrs harold smith had seen it and had read the story as soon as she was on her feet bernard had dropped emily's hand and offered his arm to his cousin lily he said out loud you had better let me take you away it is a misfortune that you have been subjected to the insult of such a greeting the misfortune of the encounter had become too plain to admit of its being hidden under any of the ordinary veils of society crosby's salutation had been made before the eyes of them all and in the midst of absolute silence and lily had risen with so queen-like a demeanour and had moved with so stately a step that it was impossible that any one concerned 
should pretend to ignore the facts of the scene that had occurred crosby was still standing close to mrs harold smith mrs thorne had risen from her seat and the words which bernard dale had uttered were still sounding in the ears of them all shall i see after the carriage said sif dun for i call this all extremely good work i do not call it fine work as to the mere artistry it is a little too plain and matter-of-fact for that a greater artist than trollope would have had a more sparing touch in his realism it is not so that turgenieff or bjornsen or flaubert or mr hardy would have presented these scenes a greater artist than trollope psychologically would have had a greater subtlety in his divinations and revelations it is not so that hawthorne or tolstoy or mr james would have shown us the soul of a girl in such a moment of martyry they would all both realists and psychologists have shown us her naked soul in such wise that we should have been less abashed than by her soul as we see it here with its clothes on but it was strictly trollope's business to show us her soul with its clothes on for in the world he deals with the soul as well as the body is clothed and wears its decorums and conventions as constantly it is when trollope shows the soul moving in these that he is most a master it is when he sometimes strips them away and bluntly exposes the soul instead of letting it betray itself that he is least a master he is mostly at his worst in the last chronicle of barset where in his cleaning up of all the odds and ends of life left over from the other stories relating to the barchester neighbourhood he leaves few shreds and patches for the reader's imagination to penetrate yet it is from the last chronicle that the two last scenes of lily dale's suffering are taken and it is in the last chronicle that the tremendous psychical tragedy of the perpetual curate of hogglestock finally slips through the author's thumb-fingered hold lily's two encounters with crosby are of the quality of what is sublimest in the dark agony of josiah crawley and even the somewhat perfunctory drama of the subsequent scenes with john eames is above the ordinary level of the book but it is hard to believe in this part of lily's experience her entirely credible experience ends with the last encounter with crosby what follows with eames who has loved her from childhood and has left loving her in her resolute old maidhood is something that the reader feels it his duty to help the author out with in deference to the original implications of her story yet once in a way why is it not well to see a thing of this sort through to a natural conclusion it is certainly of true interest if not the most poignant interest and though the love-making of eames is somewhat tediously prolonged and his offer somewhat incredibly repeated still it is all-important in rounding out and setting in full relief the story of lily dale that story i say it again is one of the most interesting i know one of the most sincerely and courageously treated one feels at every moment its essential and specific veracity it is a tragedy of the most harrowing sort and yet it is altogether wholesome and consoling to be superior to fate one must be the trusting worshipper of omnipotence and there was in the shelter of this stronghold that such a girl as lily dale with no touch of pietism or word of cant found shelter section twenty seven of heroines of fiction by william dean howells this librivox recording is in the public domain
anthony trollope's lucy robarts and griselda grantly anthony trollope was the author of thirty-nine or forty novels relating nearly all of them to the contemporary english society life which he seems to have known better than any other english novelist out of the whole number the novels which will come first to the reader's mind are those relating to clerical society as it existed during the eighteen fifties and sixties in the imaginary cathedral town of barchester and but for the explicit denial in his autobiography one might next have said that he had made an exhaustive study of the bishops deans archdeacons canons vicars and curates tutti quanti with their wives sisters aunts and cousins in the whole variety of their duties and pleasures joys and sorrows hopes and fears he was at the trouble to assure his believers however that he did not specifically or scientifically know the types he makes so interesting and was only their casual and involuntary observer yet such is the inherent evidence against him that we must regard his pretence as the foible of a writer who would rather be thought inspired than informed and whose caprice it was to prefer the reputation of having made a lot of lucky guesses to that of having made a series of careful studies he had several foibles that poor anthony trollope who wrote so much better of english life than any one except jane austen and george eliot but who wished to write like thackeray he copied thackeray's most offensive and inartistic confidential attitude though he knew him and had the courage to pronounce him false to certain aspects of english society he says frankly that he never met any such people among the nobility and gentry as the marquis of steyne and sir pitt crawley he apparently met many others quite as vulgar and wicked but not these self-evident caricatures and exaggerations and he is the more to be trusted because he is so honest about their vulgarity and wickedness he does not mock or scourge his bad aristocrats as thackeray does there is nothing of the satirist in him and he is all the more impressive as a moralist because he contents himself with simply letting us see them as they are he has no apparent purpose of reforming them at times you have from him the notion that reform of any sort among the hierarchy or nobility might constitute a danger to society and would be worth less than it would cost he even imparts a sense of such entire approval of society conditions such unquestioning fealty to the existing order that you hardly know whether to admire more the skill with which he portrays it or the seriousness with which he accepts it and honours it one framley parsonage is almost a typical novel of the sort which displays trollope's distinguishing strength and weakness and i think myself it is a most delightful story running its course through a variety of characteristic incident and prospering finally in the happy marriage of the first heroine lucy robarts and the brilliant marriage of the second heroine griselda grantly as no reader of the story can have forgotten lucy is the daughter of a successful country doctor and the pretty young sister of rev mark robarts whom lady lufton has given the living of framley because her son and he have always been friends and because in her rather high and mighty but perfectly kind and conscientious way she has loved him from his boyhood she is willing to love his pretty young sister too in a way when she comes to the parsonage after the doctor's death but it is no part of her plan that young lord lufton her son shall love lucy robarts rather more than he has ever loved her brother this is what happens however and the facts which lucy has to face if she accepts lord lufton are the deep displeasure and disappointment of lady lufton who means her son for griselda grantly or if she rejects him the still deeper displeasure and disappointment 
of lord lufton she will share the displeasure in lady lufton's case for she does not feel it quite right to come and get her son away and in lord lufton's case she will share the disappointment for she is as much in love with him as he is with her the natural thing for a romantic girl to do is to deny her love since lord lufton will not take any other sort of no for an answer and the natural thing for a sensible girl to do is to confess it when her lover has sufficiently insisted lucy being both romantic and sensible does both these natural things in the succession indicated and all ends well she never ceases to be little and dark if pretty and so far inadequate to her rank and griselda grantly never ceases to be tall and fair and cold and most suitable for the wife and mother of aristocracy but since lord lufton will not have griselda in spite of her willingness and will most passionately and perversely have lucy in spite of her unwillingness his mother reconciles herself so thoroughly to the inevitable that with the lapse of time she comes almost to feel as if she had promoted the marriage Two the pretty story is told in the plainest and openest way with quite miraculous impartiality concerning the rights and duties of all concerned and with due consideration for their feelings and opinions there is a current of tragedy but not the darkest tragedy running through it from the financial follies of mark robarts to his just but not desperate moral sufferings and all the rest is love comedy just enough shadowed by passing doubt to keep the reader from relaxing in perpetual sunshine lord lufton is such a lover as any girl romantic or sensible or both might be glad to have being satisfied that he is in love with lucy he has no other idea than to win her and he goes as promptly and directly about it as possible without any of the fine scruples concerning other people which distract the girl his mother is all very well as the means of bringing a lord lufton into the world and he loves and honours her as a good son should but a lord lufton has duties to himself in the choice of a wife that he cannot let even a mother contravene he therefore puts her and her purposes of griselda grantly kindly but firmly aside and having noticed that lucy no longer comes to his mother's house and otherwise avoids meeting him he goes to the parsonage to find out why he asks her and it presently comes to her saying the world will say that i the parson's sister set my cap at the young lord and that the young lord had made a fool of me the world shall say no such thing said lord lufton very imperiously ah but it will you can no more stop it than king canute could the waters your mother has interfered wisely to spare me from this and the only favour that i can ask you is that you will spare me also and then she got up stop lucy he said putting himself between her and the door it must not be lucy any longer lord lufton i was madly foolish when i first allowed it by heavens but it shall be lucy lucy before all the world my lucy my own lucy my heart's best friend and chosen love lucy there is my hand how long you may have had my heart it matters not to say now the game was at her feet now and no doubt she felt her triumph her ready wit and speaking lip not her beauty had brought him to her side and now he was forced to acknowledge that her power over him had been supreme sooner than leave her he would risk all she did feel her triumph but there was nothing in her face to tell him that she did so as to what she would now do she did not for a moment doubt he had been precipitated into the declaration he had made not by his love but by his embarrassment she had thrown in his teeth the injury which he had done her and he had then been moved by his generosity to repair that injury by the noblest sacrifice which he could make but lucy robarts was not the girl to accept a sacrifice he had stepped forward as though he were going to clasp her round the waist but she receded and got beyond the reach of his hand lord lufton she said when you are more cool you will know that this is wrong the best thing for both of us now is to part lucy do you mean that you cannot learn to love me 
i mean that i shall not try do not persevere in this or you will have to hate yourself for your own folly but i will persevere till you accept my love or say with your hand on your heart that you cannot and will not love me then i must beg you to let me go and having so said she paused while he walked once or twice hurriedly up and down the room and lord lufton she continued if you will leave me now the words that you have spoken shall be as though they had never been uttered i care not who knows that they have been uttered the sooner that they are known to all the world the better i shall be pleased unless indeed think of your mother lord lufton what can i do better than give her as a daughter the best and sweetest girl i have ever met when my mother really knows you she will love you as i do lucy say one word to me of comfort you have no right to press me any further she said and sat down upon the sofa with an angry frown upon her forehead by heavens he said i will take no such answer from you till you put your hand upon your heart and say that you cannot love me oh why should you press me so lord lufton why because my happiness depends upon it because it behooves me to know the very truth it has come to this that i love you with my whole heart and i must know how your heart stands towards me she had now again risen from the sofa and was looking steadily in his face lord lufton she said i cannot love you and as she spoke she did put her hand as he had desired upon her heart then god help me for i am very wretched good-bye lucy and he stretched out his hand to her good-bye my lord do not be angry with me no 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 and without further speech he left the room and the house and hurried home and when he was well gone absolutely out of sight from the window lucy walked steadily up to her room locked the door and then threw herself on the bed why oh why had she told such a falsehood could anything justify her in a lie was it not a lie knowing as she did that she loved him with all her loving heart but then his mother and the sneers of the world which would have declared that she had set her trap and caught the foolish young lord her pride would not have submitted to that strong as her love was yet her pride was perhaps stronger stronger at any rate during that interview three following the scene with lord lufton there is a mighty pretty passage between lucy robarts and her sister-in-law to whom she owns the love that she denied to lord lufton i should like to give it all but perhaps i had better send my readers to the novel for it they will thank me for sending them to the novel upon any excuse when they have read it well no it has been all my own fault though for the life of me fanny going back and back i cannot see where i took the first false step i do not know where i went wrong one wrong thing i did and it is the only thing that i do not regret what was that lucy i told him a lie and what has he said to you lucy what only this that he asked me to be his wife lord lufton proposed to you here standing here on this very spot on that flower of the carpet he begged me a dozen times to be his wife i wonder whether you and mark would let me cut it out and keep it and what answer did you make to him i lied to him and told him that i did not love him you refused him yes i refused a live lord there is some satisfaction in having that to think of is there not fanny was i wicked to tell that falsehood had i thought that it was good for him that he would not have repented i would have braved anything for his sake even your frown for you would have frowned you would have thought it sacrilege for me to marry lord lufton you know you would mrs robarts hardly knew how to say what she thought or indeed what she ought to think what would lady lufton say or think or feel what would she say and think and feel as to that parsonage from which so deadly a blow would fall upon her would she not accuse the vicar and the vicar's wife of the blackest ingratitude would life be endurable at framley under such circumstances as those what you tell me so surprises me that i hardly as yet know how to speak about it said mrs robarts and you would not accept his love no i would have nothing to say to it look you i stood here and putting my hand upon my heart for he bade me do that i said that i could not love him 
and what then he went away with a look as though he were heartbroken he crept away slowly saying that he was the most wretched soul alive for a minute i believed him and could almost have called him back but no fanny do not think that i am over proud or conceited about my conquest he had not reached the gate before he was thanking god for his escape that i do not believe this passage develops the character of lucy robarts as it remains with the reader and reveals in her the strain of humour which still does not render her finally rebellious against the social situation as the author's humour does not render him rebellious both author and heroine accede to it though they both fully recognise its absurdity and are aware of its injustice in fact the attitude of the characters in all of trollope's books and the attitude of trollope himself is one of asiatic submission to the established order of things mixed with a strictly anglo-saxon freedom of speech concerning it so that the more democratised american is scarcely more amazed at the one than at the other no people with less than the english good sense could prevent their social conditions from working more harm than they do no people with so much good sense ever abandon themselves to a status in which the outsider sees no sense at all but the law and the gospel of trollope a prophet of as clear vision as need be is that the thing which is must be and that every one concerned must conform to it in mind and conscience as wisely and decently as possible it is an immensely frank race and what trollope does is to show it with a frankness equalled by that of no other novelist with a cold-bloodedness and absence of disagreeable consciousness which almost command respect four nothing could be more respectable than the open understanding so impossible to two american mothers between lady lufton and mrs archdeacon grantly that lord lufton and griselda grantly should be brought together in such circumstances that the young man shall offer himself and the young girl shall accept him the intended lovers are themselves in the plot which miscarries because lord lufton not caring for griselda to begin with sees lucy robarts at his mother's house where he is meant to see no one but griselda and falls in love with lucy griselda is so purely and entirely of her world that she finds no offence to her personal dignity and maidenly modesty in being put in a young man's way for him to fall in love with that is a perfectly right and proper arrangement when he will not fall in love with her she merely resents it in a brief cold anger and makes haste to accept another nobleman of higher rank and greater wealth than lord lufton trollope has shown no greater mastery than in the handling of this girl's passive egotism and dull glacial self-sufficiency it is only such as most abjectly submit themselves to the world that most dominate it at last and in the different books that record griselda grantly's progress we see her grow naturally and logically almost inevitably from an unimpulsive unresponsive young girl into a great lady of fashion a ruler in society she is always rather stupid and she never does or says anything to win her way to social supremacy it may be said that this supremacy comes to her because she is fit for it and knows how to keep it without the least pains or inconvenience she is really in her cold but perfectly adequate nullity a wonderful achievement and she is from first to last the same but she is so null so negative that it is difficult to choose any passage which shall dramatically impart the notion of her but the conversation which her mother has with her when mrs grantly comes to see her at lady lufton's london house and to find out how the land lies with regard to lord lufton may serve at least as well as another toward the middle of this conversation the mother had to be frank since the daughter would not be what i particularly wanted to say to you was this i think you should know what are the ideas which lady lufton entertains her ideas said griselda who had never troubled herself much in thinking about other people's thoughts yes griselda while you were staying down at framley court and also i suppose since you have been up here in bruton street you must have seen a good deal of lord lufton he doesn't come very often to bruton street that is to say not very often 
of course he cannot be at home now as much as he was down in the country when he was living in the same house said mrs grantly whose business it was to take lord lufton's part at the present moment he must be at his club and at the house of lords and in twenty places he is very fond of going to parties and he dances beautifully i am sure he does i have seen as much as that myself and i think i know some one with whom he likes to dance and the mother gave her daughter a loving little squeeze do you mean me mamma yes i do mean you my dear and is it not true lady lufton says that he likes dancing with you better than with any one else in london i don't know said griselda looking down upon the ground but young ladies must think of such things must they not must they mamma i suppose they do don't they the truth is griselda that lady lufton thinks that if can you guess what it is she thinks no mamma but that was a fib on griselda's part she thinks that my griselda would make the best possible wife in the world for her son and i think so too i think that her son will be a very fortunate man if he can get such a wife and now what do you think griselda i don't think anything mamma you don't think anything but my darling you must think you must make up your mind what would be your answer if lord lufton were to propose to you that is what lady lufton wishes him to do but he never will mamma and if he did but i'm sure he never will he doesn't think of such a thing at all and 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 what my dear i don't know mamma lord lufton thinks a great deal more of lucy robarts than he does of of, of any one else i believe said griselda showing now some little animation by her manner dumpy little black thing that she is lucy robarts lord lufton of course is bound to be civil to any young lady in his mother's house and i am quite sure that he has no other idea whatever with regard to miss robarts i certainly cannot speak as to her intellect for i do not think she opened her mouth in my presence but oh, she has plenty to say for herself when she pleases she is a sly little thing as the reader will have seen griselda was quite right and indeed the one quality she had in positive measure was a subtle cunning such as in higher minds serves the purposes of divination she was equal through this and through an absence of all tenderness to most of the exigencies of life not through principle but the want of it she was able philosophically to endure things that wring the heart and break the spirit of other people after her engagement to lord dumbello while she was at her father's house actively superintending the preparation of her trousseau there came a rumour which seemed only too well founded that her betrothed had gone to paris to break off the engagement and her father decided on going up to london to see about it susan said the archdeacon to his wife just as he was starting at this moment neither of them was in the happiest spirits i think i would say a word of caution to griselda do you feel so much doubt about it as that said mrs grantly on the next morning mrs grantly with much cunning preparation went about the task which her husband had left her to perform it took her long to do for she was very cunning in the doing of it but at last it dropped from her in words that there was a possibility a bare possibility that some disappointment might even yet be in store for them do you mean mamma that the marriage will be put off i don't mean to say that i think it will god forbid but it is just possible i dare say that i am very wrong to tell you of this but i know that you have sense enough to bear it papa has gone to london and we shall hear from him soon then mamma i had better give them orders not to go on with the marking i should be puzzled to point out a line in which i thought the artist had gone wrong in this extraordinary portrait if he had done nothing else it would be sufficient to prove him a master and it is only one of many masterpieces it must have been one of the most difficult to do because the formula is so very simple not to have mixed other ingredients with the component parts of griselda's character or not to have mixed the original ingredients in disproportion is the highest proof of the artist's mastery she is never caricatured never suffered to transcend the limits of her temperament she is a disagreeable person because she is cold and selfish but she is not unjust and she deserves at the hands of her creator the justice he does her in a final touch and without which perhaps the picture would have wanted perfect relief after her marriage lucy robarts met lady dumbello in london lucy had felt that she had been despised by the rich beauty 
she also in her turn had disliked if she had not despised her rival but how would it be now lady dumbello could hardly despise her and yet it did not seem possible that they should meet as friends they did meet and lucy came forward with a pretty eagerness to give her hand to lady lufton's late favourite lady dumbello smiled slightly the same old smile which had come across her face when they two had been first introduced in the framley drawing-room the same smile without the variation of a line took the offered hand muttered a word or two and then receded it was exactly as she had done before she had never despised lucy robarts she had accorded to the parson's sister the amount of cordiality with which she usually received her acquaintance and now she could do no more for the peer's wife section twenty eight of heroines of fiction by william dean howells this librivox recording is in the public domain book two chapter nine anthony trollope's mrs prudy if i have not yet said that i think anthony trollope the most english of the english novelists i will do so now of course jane austen and george eliot might dispute this primacy with him but both would fail in the comparison the one because she was too witty and the other because she was too wise faithfully to mirror the british spirit the perpetual play of delicate sarcasm in jane austen's books is as alien to the heavy sincerity of that simple soul as the deep psychological implications of george eliot's but the make and the manner of trollope are exactly interpretative of it all is plain and open in his work if there is any cutting or thrusting it is not such as leaves the subject to shake itself before it realizes a wound if there is any philosophizing it is not of the accusing sort which makes the reader feel the fault or the fate of the character as bound with him and yet trollope was a true humorist and as i have already insisted a profound moralist he surpassed the only contemporaries worthy to be named with him in very essential things as far as he surpassed those two great women in keeping absolutely the level of the english nature he was a greater painter of manners than thackeray because he was neither a sentimentalist nor a caricaturist and he was of a more convincing imagination than dickens because he knew and employed the probable facts in the case and kept himself free of all fantastic contrivances one he was the author of more books than dickens and many more than thackeray but in the number of his creations he fell below either because of his habit acquired from thackeray of carrying the personages of one book into another thackeray did this with some half a dozen prominent people major dobbin of vanity fair reappears in pendennis pendennis reappears in philip and beatrix esmond of esmond reappears in the virginians and so on but trollope's principal books are all bound together by the continuity of the principal characters we have again and again the duke of omnium and his congeners dr thorne and his kindred and connections come and go through different novels and the barchester series is a warp in which the same pattern of figures and faces is carried through from the beginning to the end the grantleys the hardings the dales the eameses the omniums the robartses the luftons the crawleys and above all the prudies there is a fascination which every writer of fiction will own 
in recurring to a type once studied but the novelist indulges this fancy at some risk of tiring his readers the fact that he had tired his readers with mrs prudy was brought rudely home to trollope one day at his club where he overheard the sighs and groans of a man who was sick of her at finding her again in the novelist's current story trollope says that he then and there resolved to kill her and in that very story he made an end of her but it seems to me that his resolution censured both the art and the courage of the novelist who should have had a faith in himself and his work superior to his sense of any reader's impatience and should have been above suffering dictation from it it is certain however that he lost heart and put an end to the admirable she was artistically most admirable creature of his invention to the lasting loss of all lovers of the true if not the beautiful i will not be sure which book one first meets mrs prudy in one seems after meeting her to have known her always but she pervades the whole barchester series with her searching and persistent personality mrs prudy is not merely a shrew and a scold though she is a shrew and does scold the bishop dreadfully and put him to shame before those who should believe him master in his house and office it is less her ambition than her nature to govern and she cannot help extending her domain from the bishop to the diocese and meddling in things which it is mischievous as well as indecorous for her to concern herself with but in all this she is mainly of a conscientious zeal she has done so much to forward the fortunes of her husband and to promote his rise from among the inferior clergy to a spiritual lordship that she cannot help arrogating power and attributing merit to herself in the management of his affairs she has her strong likes and dislikes and with other women she has her spites and jealousies she wishes sometimes to put these women under her feet and to trample on them after she has got them there but though she makes her husband so unhappy and ashamed she does not mean to do so or rather she would not do so if she could have her way without doing so the great thing however is to have her way and whatever hinders her having it is for that sufficient reason wrong and wicked the bishop himself poor little weak yielding man is wrong and at least wickedly led when he opposes her and in her great struggle with his clergy in the case of josiah crawley the perpetual curate of hogglestock she brings the bishop to open shame and through his shame to open rebellion his rebellion takes the form of answering to all she says you have broken my heart and so sending her from him by mere refusal to be actively engaged in controversy or even to be actively scolded in this exile she suddenly dies but i for one cannot rejoice in mrs prudy's untimely taking off for when you have her at second hand a scold is purely amusing besides this there is a pathos in her death which throws all her character into a softened relief she dies partly because she does not know what else to do she has finally and utterly failed with the man she has always loved in the method she is always successfully used with him and she waits bewildered and anguished for some break of his intangibility in which she can take hold of him again in the old way while she waits her spiritual pang translates itself into a physical pang and she dies of heart disease she is no longer needed she cumbers the man whom 
she has so valiantly championed even against his own comfort and quiet she will be missed for a while but she will not be truly lamented she will be a mischief taken out of the world i call this all very touching and it reflects a light upon her whole story which keeps me from seeing her altogether hateful and harmful two the moral and ecclesiastical struggle in which mrs prudy closes with josiah crawley is the beginning of the end with her as the reader will find somewhat over duly recorded in the last chronicle of barset that is a book largely imagined and in places amply realized which as a whole fails as distinctly of being a masterpiece as any great novel i know of trollope's second-hand vice of twaddling thackeray wise over his characters and situations comes to the worst in it where the fag ends of the barchester series are gathered together in a loose and feeble intrigue the tremendous conception of crawley's tragedy is suffered to become part and parcel of the prevailing weakness through the author's willingness to eke out the interest by delaying the denouement so long but if that tragedy alone could have been openly treated and crawley studied solely in his relation to the other human particles it magnetically attracted the book would have been one of the great fictions of the world as it is second-rate and third-rate though it is still it has the fascination which that pure sad half-mad soul never fails to exercise whenever he appears on the scene with the dreadful accusation of theft which he falls under after passing a cheque which he seems to have come by unlawfully but which he cannot remember how he came by he alone gives the story cohesion and unity and it is his sorrow and his shame which bring mrs prudy in enmity upon him when the magistrates his old friends and fellow clergymen are constrained to commit him upon the charge to which he has laid himself open mrs prudy decides that it is high time the bishop should take some action concerning him and she requires the poor bishop to summon him to the palace and make him show cause why he should not be suspended from his perpetual curacy at hogglestock until a jury of his countrymen shall have acquitted him of the charge then crawley being too poor to pay for a carriage walks the long road from hogglestock to barchester in the cold and wet and presents himself to his spiritual superior but the superior of his spiritual superior is there also to receive the threadbare muddy majestic man and the scene that follows is the representation of her determination to force herself into an affair which is none of hers and his determination to keep her out of it you are very punctual mr crawley said the bishop mr crawley simply bowed his head still keeping his hands beneath his cloak will you not take a chair nearer to the fire mr crawley had not seated himself but had placed himself in front of a chair at the extreme end of the room resolved that he would not use it unless he were duly asked thank you my lord he said i am warm with walking and if you please will avoid the fire hitherto mrs prudy had not said a word she stood back in the room near the fire more backward a good deal than she was accustomed to do when clergymen made their ordinary visits on such occasions she would come forward and shake hands with them graciously graciously even if proudly but she had felt that she must do nothing of that kind now there must be no shaking hands with a man who had stolen a cheque for twenty pounds i hope your wife and children are well mr crawley i have felt for mrs crawley very deeply said mrs prudy mr crawley had made up his mind that as long as it was possible he would ignore 
the presence of mrs trudy altogether and therefore he made no sign that he had heard the latter remark it has been most unfortunate continued the bishop far be it from me to express an opinion upon the matter which will have to come before a jury of your countrymen it is enough for me to know that the magistrates assembled at silverbridge gentlemen to whom no doubt you must be known as most of them live in your neighbourhood have heard evidence upon the subject most convincing evidence said mrs trudy interrupting her husband mr crawley's black brow became a little blacker as he heard the word but still he ignored the woman he not only did not speak but did not turn his eye upon her you would have been put in prison mr crawley because the magistrates were of opinion that you had taken mr solmes's check said mrs prudy on this occasion he did look at her he turned one glance upon her from under his eyebrows but he did not speak with all that i have nothing to do said the bishop nothing whatever my lord said mr crawley but bishop i think that you have said mrs prudy the judgment formed by the magistrates as to the conduct of one of your clergymen makes it imperative upon you to act in the matter yes my dear yes i am coming to that what mrs prudy says is perfectly true it is undoubtedly the fact that you must at the next assizes surrender yourself at the court-house yonder to be tried for this offence against the laws that is true if i be alive my lord and have strength sufficient i shall be there you must be there said mrs prudy the police will look to that mr crawley she was becoming very angry in that the man would not answer her a word on this occasion again he did not even look at her under these circumstances continued the bishop looking to the welfare of your parish to the welfare of the diocese and allow me to say mr crawley to the welfare of yourself also and especially to the souls of the people said mrs prudy the bishop paused and mr crawley bowed his head i therefore sent over to you a gentleman with whom i am well acquainted mr fumble with a letter from myself in which i endeavoured to impress upon you without the use of any severe language what my convictions were mr fumble brought me back your written reply continued the bishop by which i was grieved to find that you were not willing to submit yourself to my counsel in the matter i was most unwilling my lord submission to authority is at times a duty and at times opposition to authority is a duty also opposition to usurped authority is an imperative duty said mr crawley and who is to be the judge demanded mrs prudy then there was silence for a while when as mr crawley made a reply the lady repeated her question will you be pleased to answer my question sir who in such a case is to be the judge but mr crawley did not please to answer her question the man is obstinate said mrs prudy i forget where i was said the bishop oh mr thumble came back and i received your letter of course i received it and i was surprised to learn from that that in spite of what had occurred at silverbridge you were still anxious to continue the usual sunday ministrations in your church had i been mr thumble said mrs prudy i would have read from that desk and i would have preached from that pulpit mr crawley waited a moment thinking that the bishop might perhaps speak again but as he did not but sat expectant as though he had finished his discourse and now expected a reply mr crawley got up from his seat and drew near to the table my lord he began it has all been just as you have said the circumstances are strong against me and though 
your lordship has altogether misunderstood the nature of the duty performed by the magistrates in sending my case for a trial although as it seems to me you have come to conclusions in this matter in ignorance of the very theory of our laws sir said mrs prudy yet i can foresee the probability that a jury may discover me to have been guilty of theft of course the jury will do so said mrs prudy but till that time shall come my lord i shall hold my own at hogglestock as you hold your own here at barchester you defy us then said mrs prudy my lord i grant your authority as bishop to be great but even a bishop can only act as the law allows him god forbid that i should do more said the bishop sir you will find that your wicked threats will fall back upon your own head said mrs prudy peace woman mr crawley said addressing her at last the bishop jumped out of his chair at hearing the wife of his bosom called a woman but he jumped rather in admiration than in anger he had already begun to perceive that mr crawley was a man who had better be left to take care of the souls at hogglestock at any rate till the trial should come on woman said mrs prudy rising to her feet as though she really intended some personal encounter madam said mr crawley you should not interfere in these matters you simply debase your husband's high office the distaff were more fitting for you my lord good morning and before either of them could speak again he was out of the room and through the hall and beyond the gate and standing beneath the towers of the cathedral three after all i find that it is rather the character of josiah crawley than of mrs prudy which is developed in the foregoing scene in another scene she suffers a like defeat at the hands of the topping dr tempest one of the chief clergy at barchester whom she attempts to instruct in his duty respecting mr crawley he too ignores her presence and if he does so with less majestic dignity than crawley he brings the bishop a yet keener sense of his degradation through his wife the bishop did not again speak a word of kindness to her and he tried not to speak to her at all you have broken my heart he said again and again her own efforts to bring him back to something like life to some activity of mind if not of body were made constantly and when she failed as she did fail day after day she would go slowly to her own room and lock her door and look back in her solitude at all the days of her life she had agonies in these minutes of which no one near her knew anything she would seize with her arm the part of the bed near which she would stand and hold by it grasping it as though she were afraid to fall and then when it was at the worst with her she would go to her closet a closet that no eyes ever saw unlocked but her own and fill for herself and swallow some draught and then she would sit down with the bible before her and read it sedulously she spent hours every day with her bible before her repeating to herself whole chapters which she almost knew by heart it cannot be said that she was a bad woman though she had in her time done an indescribable amount of evil she still longed to rule the diocese by means of her husband but was made to pause and hesitate by the unwonted mood that had fallen upon him when crawley at last wrote resigning his perpetual curacy she determined to rouse the bishop to action but when she went to speak with him he would not look at her why do you not turn round and speak to me properly she said i do not want to speak to you at all the bishop answered this was very bad 
almost anything would be better than this he was sitting now over the fire with his elbows on his knees and his face buried in his hands she had gone round the room so as to face him and was now standing almost over him but still she could not see his countenance this will not do at all she said my dear do you know that you are forgetting yourself altogether i wish i could forget myself and now he got up and looked at her for a moment he stood upon his legs and then again he sat down with his face turned towards her it is the truth you have brought on me such disgrace that i cannot hold up my head you have ruined me i wish i were dead and it is all through you that i am driven to wish it of all that she had suffered in her life this was the worst she clasped both her hands to her side as she listened to him and for a minute or two she made no reply bishop she said the words that you speak are sinful very sinful you have made them sinful he replied i will not hear that from you i will not indeed i have endeavoured to do my duty by you and i do not deserve it all i want of you is that you should arouse yourself and go to your work i could do my work very well he said if you were not here i suppose then you wish i were dead said mrs prudy to this he made no reply nor did he stir himself how could flesh and blood bear this female flesh and blood mrs prudy's flesh and blood now at last her temper once more got the better of her judgment probably much to her immediate satisfaction and she spoke out i tell you what it is my lord if you are imbecile i must be active it is very sad that i should have to assume your authority i will not allow you to assume my authority what do you mean to say to mr thumble when you see him that is nothing to you she came up to him and put her hand upon his shoulder and spoke to him very gently tom she said is that the way in which you speak to your wife yes it is you have driven me to it why have you taken upon yourself to send that man to hogglestock because it was right to do so i came to you for instructions and you would give none i should have given what instructions i pleased in proper time thumble shall not go to hogglestock next sunday who shall go then never mind nobody it does not matter to you if you will leave me now i shall be obliged to you there will be an end of all this very soon very soon mrs prudy after this stood for a while thinking what she would say but she left the room without uttering another word as she looked at him a hundred different thoughts came into her mind she had loved him dearly and she loved him still but she knew now at this moment felt absolutely sure that by him she was hated in spite of all her roughness and temper mrs prudy was in this like other women that she would fain have been loved had it been possible she had always meant to serve him she was conscious of that conscious also in a way that although she had been industrious although she had been faithful although she was clever yet she had failed at the bottom of her heart she knew that she had been a bad wife and yet she had meant to be a pattern wife she was preparing to go up to her chamber with her hand on the banisters and with her foot on the stairs when she saw the servant who had answered the bishop's bell john c said when mr thumble comes to the palace let me see him before he goes to my lord then mrs prudy went upstairs to her chamber and locked her door mr thumble returned to barchester that day leading the broken-down cob and a dreadful walk he had john was peremptory with him insisting that he must wait first upon mrs prudy and then upon the bishop mr thumble might perhaps have turned a deaf ear to the latter command but the former was one which he felt himself bound to obey so he entered the palace 
rather cross very much soiled as to his outer man and in this condition went up a certain small staircase which was familiar to him to a small parlour which adjoined mrs prudy's room and there awaited the arrival of the lady mrs prudy's own maid mrs draper by name came to him and said that she had knocked twice at mrs prudy's door and would knock again two minutes after that she returned running into the room with her arms extended and exclaiming oh heavens sir mistress is dead mr thumble hardly knowing what he was about followed the woman into the bedroom and there he found himself standing awestruck before the corpse of her who had so lately been the presiding spirit of the palace the body was still resting on its legs leaning against the end of the side of the bed while one of the arms was clasped around the bedpost the mouth was rigidly closed but the eyes were open as though staring at him nevertheless there could be no doubt from the first glance that the woman was dead he went up close to it but did not dare to touch it there was no one as yet there but he and mrs draper no one else knew what had happened four the type of mere termagant is not hard to catch but the woman who is conscientious as well as arrogant who means well to those she most wrongs and outrages is one of those mixed characters far more difficult to achieve and it is such a woman who constitutes the author's triumph in mrs prudy one cannot say she is his greatest triumph a cloud of witnesses would rise in protest if one said that there would be lady glencora palliser lady laura kennedy mrs phineas finn madalina damelines miss dunstable and the various heroines of orley farm the bertrams can you forgive her is he popinjoy he knew he was right and many others to gainsay so bold a claim yet in spite of them is not mrs prudy after lily dale the woman character who remains most distinct in the memories of trollope's readers i have been wondering all through my writing of him whether the readers of trollope are of that commanding class which they once were and sadly doubting once there is no question but he had the largest number of authoritative readers but for how long a time or just when it would not be easy to say i suspect his supremacy was brief and that it could be ascertained only for that bright moment when thackeray was editing the cornhill magazine and trollope was writing its serial but his popularity extended all through the eighteen sixties and well into the seventies from the time fixed by his cornhill story i forget which of his stories it was thackeray had then done all his great novels and though dickens had still several of his prodigious fantasies before him it is doubtful if he was to deepen or even widen the impression he had already made charles reed was synchronously coruscating in his most brilliant pin wheeling and skyrocketing but like dickens he was confirming rather than forming his public george eliot's greatest work came a little later and in middlemarch she pushed trollope from the throne which she then held until her declining powers made the accession of mr thomas hardy easy for his unquestionable mastery but during the period covered by our civil war say from eighteen sixty one till eighteen sixty five trollope reigned and no one i think can say that he was unworthy to reign each of the great contemporary english novelists represented an english world and thackeray's english world did not differ more from dickens's than from reed's or george eliot's but trollope without seeking subjects for ironical satire or surprising transformation or dazzling discovery or morbid analysis represented the english world as it appeared to him in its normal moods of high and low-mindedness vicious virtuous dull amusing respectable and disreputable wise and foolish but in all its varieties entirely and for the most part unconsciously english 
one need not recur to carlyle's saying that trollope could never lack for character so long as there were thirty millions of people in great britain mostly bores for that is as false and wrong-headed as nearly all carlyle's odd captandum criticism and hawthorne saying that a novel of trollope's is like a piece of earth under the microscope with all the life acted upon it imparts an erring sense of dimensions if a telescope of prodigious power could be trained from somewhere in space upon the british isles so that their people could be seen life-size that would offer some such effect as we get in trollope's fiction he had not enough or he had too much imagination to conceive of representing his fellow-subjects in the mid-years of the victorian reign other than as he knew them and he neither extenuated nor aught set down in malice concerning them if this is true of the men it is still truer of the women at a time when thackeray was caricaturing or sentimentalizing them when dickens was translating them into pretty or hideous monsters when reed was portraying them as impassioned or perfidious pusses and when george eliot was idealizing them in her romolas or persecuting them in her gwendolens and rosamonds trollope was doing his period the incalculable service of anticipating instantaneous photography in his likenesses of victorian maids wives and widows in endless variety his work is all so true and artistic that one cannot trace in it the presence of any favourite type of woman the women are such women as each scheme necessarily involves good bad and indifferent fair plain and middling wise and foolish high and low the camera treats them all alike fairly and the spectator is the richer by its impartiality upon the whole i should be inclined to place trollope among the very first of those supreme novelists to whom the ever womanly has revealed itself he has not shown the subtlest sense of womanhood his portraits do not impart the last the most exquisite joy it is not the very soul of the sex that shows itself in them but it is the mind the heart the conscience the manner and this is for one painter enough let jane austen catch their ultimate charm and george eliot their ultimate truth and hawthorne their farther most meanings and intimations trollope has shown them as we mostly see them when we meet them in society and as we know them at home and if it were any longer his to choose he might well rest content with his work for my part i wish i might send my readers to the long line of his wise just sane novels which i have been visiting anew for the purposes of these papers and finding as delightful as ever and thanks to extraordinary gifts for forgetting almost as section twenty nine of heroines of fiction by william dean howells this librivox recording is in the public domain the heroine of the initials some time about the middle of the century which has so lately become the last there appeared a novel which swept the younger novel-reading world almost with the thoroughness of jane eyre among maturer readers those who were once at that younger world still think the initials one of the most captivating love-stories ever written and they feel something of the old pride in it which they felt when it was a mark of taste and refinement to like it not to have read the initials was in their day to have left one's self out of the range of intellectual conversation and almost of human sympathy such a one was not authorized even to speculate about the authorship which then unknown added the excitement of mystery to the intrinsic charm of the book later it came out that the initials was written by the baroness tautius an englishwoman married and living in bavaria 
but quits at least by the author of the initials reached them before her identity penetrated to her worshippers neither quits however nor cyrilla nor at oz ever had half the acceptance of the initials and in fact they had none of the rounded completeness the entire and perfect fascination of the first story it remained her best as it remains one of the best novels written in the century when fiction won the primacy in polite literature which it seems destined to keep one the initials is first of all a love story and then it is an international love story and perhaps the earliest of the modern sort which americans rather than the english have cultivated it relates to the loves of a young englishman and a young german girl in whose family he becomes an inmate at munich her father is of civil condition but has married a second wife socially beneath him and in their rather less than moderate fortunes the rosenbergs are more than willing to take a lodger the mother is of good soul if not of good family and like most women of her nation a devoted housekeeper the family consists of her young sons and of her stepdaughters hildegarde and Crescens, who are hardly of the age to be heroines in england but at sixteen and fifteen are quite old enough to be thought of in marriage in germany i should be ashamed to give these details to people of my own generation for everybody who was anybody knew them forty or fifty years ago but i now address them to the later youth and i feel myself safe if i have not got them quite straight i believe herr rosenberg had married above him when he espoused the mother of his daughters who i remember had some noble cousins bothering about and complicating matters but i do not care the main fact is that the young englishman hamilton comes to live with the rosenbergs for the improvement of his german and that crescens falls in love with him and he falls in love with hildegarde hildegarde is one of the first proud and angry heroines who since rather than before have flourished a good deal in fiction and she is frankly beautiful the concession to human weakness being made in the matter of temper it will be noted that she is therefore of a type at once earlier than the plain impassioned heroines of charlotte bronte and later and is of that pretty but tempestuous sort of girls whom emily bronte brought in the fashion of and who antedated and outlived their cousins she contributed a spice of variety to the family of english heroines by her strangeness for though of english origin through the author who imagined her she was of such foreign make and manner as at once to catch the eye among them she was shown to in her native environment and for the first time we had in her affair with hamilton that piquancy of internationality which the american novelists oftener than the english have since invoked before her there had been such heavy affairs as that of sir charles grandison and the lovely italian lady clementina but in the initials the situation had almost the modernity of a case fancied by mr henry james the greatest of all the masters in that way neither hamilton at nineteen nor hildegarde at sixteen could be of such confirmed and hardened prejudices in favour of their own nation as to make their national difference an obstacle to their passion the barriers this had to surmount were social and personal for the well-born englishman could not help feeling and showing himself superior to the bourgeois family which had received him and such a girl as hildegarde could not help promptly hating him for it they met almost as enemies and their wooing throughout had often the alarming effect of warring at the very end her capture is something like a hostile triumph the affair is not the less intoxicating to the spectator the country fought over though difficult is picturesque and the manners and customs of the neutrals as well as the belligerents are realized as vital elements of the exciting spectacle two in her first presentation hildegarde is grouped with her sister and they are both described as perfect personifications 
of german beauty blue eyes blooming cheeks red lips and a profusion of brown hair most classically braided and plaited they were both tall and very slightly formed and their dark cotton dresses were made and put on with an exactness which proved that they were not indifferent to the advantages bestowed on them by nature at the table d'hote where he meets them the young ladies to hamilton's infinite astonishment took the chicken bones in their fingers and detached the meat from them with their teeth he felt at once convinced that they were immeasurably vulgar not aware that the mode of eating is in germany no such exact criterion of manners as in england it is the good sweet stupid crescens that hamilton first becomes acquainted with and who in her tenderness for him confesses her wretchedness at being obliged to marry the kindly but elderly and bald-headed major stultz why before i left sion he seemed much more inclined to marry your sister than you oh of course he would rather have married hildegard because she is so much handsomer and cleverer than i am but she would not listen to him and called him an old fool i admire her candour said hamilton and then she got into a passion when he persevered and slapped him on the mouth yes when he attempted to kiss her hand at least he says so and hildegard thinks it may be true as she was angry and struggled very hard to release her hand she seems of rather a passionate temperament passionate yes she sometimes gets into a passion but it is soon over and then she can be so kind to those she loves with me she is never in a passion in due time hamilton himself experiences her temper notably once just after he has been waltzing with crescens and holding her rather closely embraced your sister's personal dislike seems to influence her conduct on all occasions said hamilton glancing towards hildegard hildegard rose as she passed hamilton she said in a low voice for personal dislike you may say detestation when you refer to yourself in future most willingly most gladly said hamilton laughing i wish you to hate me with all your heart then your wish is gratified i feel the greatest contempt halt cried hamilton laughing for her anger amused him i did not give you leave to feel contempt i only said you might hate one day madame rosenberg bids the girl carry hamilton his coffee to him in his room but but hesitated hildegard mr hamilton is not alone count zedwitz is in his room but he won't bite you so go at once half an hour later hamilton was out in the corridor madame rosenberg hoped his coffee was not too cold coffee no yes when where did i drink it in your own room replied madame rosenberg laughing i sent it to you by hildegard he looked inquiringly at hildegard she raised her eyes slowly from her work and looking at him steadily and gravely said in french i threw it out of the window rather than take it to you next time i advise you to drink it said hamilton laughing hildegard's anger towards hamilton is kindled not only from her unconscious love of him but from her more generous indignation of what she believes his trifling with poor pretty crescens at last she can bear it no longer and she brings him to book for it and there is a fine scene between them which the lovers of the lovers will not have forgotten she reproaches him and then implores him to leave their house he temporizes and teases her till it comes to her saying ungenerous unfeeling englishman i i see you are trying to put me into a passion but i am not angry she said seating herself in the chair he had before placed for her you said you were able to convince me you have convinced me that you are a consummate actress cried hamilton contemptuously i am no actress she exclaimed starting from her chair with such a violence that it fell to the ground with a loud crash you are even more thoroughly selfish than i imagined this is the last time i shall ever speak to you don't make rash vows said hamilton coolly i dare say you will often speak to me in time perhaps condescend to like me never i do not think there exists in the world a more unamiable being than you are you are vindictive too cruelly vindictive it is because you dislike me it is in order to make me unhappy that you trifle with my sister's feelings no matter i see now that these conferences and quarrels are worse than useless 
and i quite agree with you said hamilton quickly suppose i promise never by word or deed to disparage major stultz in future and totally to abstain from all further attentions to your sister that is better than nothing said hildegard slowly if you promise she added hesitatingly i i think i may trust you three it cannot go so far as this without going farther both in warring and wooing with two young people brought together under the same roof and meeting daily almost hourly almost momently the love-making and the hate-making between hildegarde and hamilton advance equally and it is only a question of time when the hate-making shall be altogether lost in the love-making she has to bear a great deal poor proud girl but she proves strong enough for her burden even to accepting in hamilton's presence her stepmother's rebuke of her pride and her advice to forget that the countess raymond was her mother she suffers but she takes it all in good part and in fact she is a good girl for all her temper and hauteur doing her part in the family in the housekeeping and not forgetting that she is a daughter to her father as well as her mother and has duties to her stepbrothers as well as her sister from her mother's family she has only trouble and there is one worthless cousin whose unworthy and irreverent love pursues her and persecutes her and all but effects her separation from hamilton who is himself not too considerate of her helplessness in fact the englishman's best excuse in certain crises of conduct is the sincerity of his passion and not his unselfishness as will appear to the reader who first acquaints himself with that famous chapter of their lives called the struggle it is perhaps the climax of the story and it shows hildegarde in her limitations as well as her potentialities with respect to both hamilton and oscar raymond certainly the scene of her warring and wooing with hamilton is a resume of all in that kind which characterizes the book and is one of high novelty and originality as such scenes go the family have apparently all gone out when hamilton returns from a sunday morning ride after having the night before had an uncommonly amicable talk with hildegarde and prevailed with her as he thought not to read a certain unfit book but read only those he had given her a list of he entered the house by the back staircase visited all the rooms and even the kitchen but found all deserted madame rosenberg's room was also unoccupied but through the partly open door of it he saw hildegarde sitting on the sofa in the drawing-room reading so intently that she was perfectly unconscious of his presence the deep folds of her dark blue merino dress with its closely fitting body gave a more than usual elegance to her tall slight figure as she bent in profile over her book and hamilton stood in silent admiration unconsciously twisting his riding whip round his wrist until his eyes rested for the second time on the book which she held in her hand he started hesitated then hastily strode forward and stood before her doubt and uncertainty were still depicted on his countenance as hildegarde looked up but her dismay her deep blush and the childish action of placing the hand containing the volume behind her were a confirmation of his fears that she was reading the forbidden work excuse me for interrupting you he said with a forced smile but i really cannot believe the evidence of my own eyes and must request you to let me look at that book for a moment no you shall not she answered leaning back on the sofa and becoming very pale while she added it is very disagreeable being startled and interrupted in this manner i thought you told mamma you would meet her at neubergausen very true perhaps i may meet her there but before i go i must and will see that book on it depends my future opinion of you you shall not see it cried hildegarde the colour again returning to her face the book said hamilton seizing firmly her disengaged hand the book or the name of it neither let me go cried hildegarde struggling to disengage her hand like most usually quiet-tempered persons hamilton when once actually aroused lost all command of himself he held one of her hands as in a vice and when she brought forward the other to accelerate its release he bent down to read the title of the book which was immediately thrown on the ground and the then free hand descended with such violence on his cheek and ear that for a moment he was perfectly stunned 
and even after he stood upright he looked at her for a few seconds in unfeigned astonishment do you think at length he exclaimed vehemently do you think that i will allow you to treat me as you did major stoltz with impunity and then catching her in his arms he kissed her repeatedly and with a violence which seemed to terrify her beyond measure i gave you fair warning more than once he added when at length he had released her i gave you fair warning and you knew what you had to expect she covered her face with her hands and burst into a passion of tears i cannot imagine he continued impetuously walking up and down the room i cannot imagine why you did not with your usual courage tell me at once the name of the book and prevent this scene hildegard shook her head and wept still more bitterly after all he said seating himself with affected calmness opposite to her leaning his arms on the table and drumming upon the book which now lay undisputed between them after all you are not better than other people not more to be trusted than other girls and i fancied you such perfection i could have forgiven anything but the the untruth he exclaimed starting up anything but that pshaw yesterday when you told me that the books had been sent back to the library i believed you without a moment's hesitation i thank you for your deference to my opinion ha 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 what a fool you must have thought me hildegard looked up all expression of humility had left her features her tears ceased to flow and as she rose to leave the room she turned almost haughtily towards him while saying i really do not know what right you have to speak to me in this manner i consider it very great presumption on your part and desire it may never occur again you may be quite sure i shall never offend you in this way again he said holding the book towards her what a mere farce the writing of that list of books was no for i had intended to have read all you recommended and all i recommended you to avoid too this this which you tacitly promised not to finish he stopped for while she took the book in silence she blushed so deeply and seemed so embarrassed that he added sorrowfully oh how i regret having come home how i wish i had not discovered that you could deceive me i have not deceived you said hildegard appearances are against me and yet i repeat i have not deceived you the books were sent to the library yesterday evening but too late to be changed old hans brought them back again and i found them in my room when i went to bed i did not read them last night but you stayed at home for the purpose to-day observed hamilton reproachfully no my mother gave the servants leave to go out for the whole day and as she did not like to leave the house quite unoccupied she asked me to remain at home i of course agreed to do so without i assure you thinking of those hateful books i do not mean to i cannot justify what i have done i can only say in extenuation that the temptation was great i have been alone for more than two hours my father's books are locked up i never enter your room when you are absent and i wish to know the end of the story which still interests and haunts me in spite of all my endeavours to forget it the book lay before me i resisted long but at last i opened it and so and so and so i suppose i must acknowledge that i have judged you too harshly said hamilton i do not care about your judgment i have fallen in my own esteem since i find that i cannot resist temptation and is my good opinion of no value to you it was perhaps but it has lost all worth within the last half hour how do you mean i have seen you in the course of that time suspicious rough and what you would yourself call ungentlemanlike you were the last person from whom i should have expected such treatment continued hildegard while the tears started to her eyes and her voice faltered the very last and though i did get into a passion and give you a blow it was not until you had hurt my wrist and provoked me beyond endurance she left the room and walked quickly down the passage stay cried hamilton following her stay and hear my excuses excuses you have not even one to offer said hildegard laying her hand on the lock of her door hear me at least he said eagerly i could not endure the thought of your being one jot less perfect than i had imagined you that made me suspicious the wish for proof made me rough and though i cannot exactly justify my subsequent conduct i plead in extenuation your own words the temptation was great 
hildegard's dimples showed that a smile was with difficulty repressed and hamilton taking courage whispered hurriedly but one word more hear my last and best excuse it is that i love you deeply passionately but i need not tell you this for you must have known it long long ago hildegard say only that our perpetual quarrels have not made you absolutely hate me hildegard without uttering a word more impetuously drew back her hand sprang into her room and locked the door he waited for a minute or two and then knocked but received no answer hildegard he cried reproachfully is this right is this kind even if you dislike me i have a right to expect an answer go she said in a very low voice go away you ought not to be here when i am alone why did you not think of that before i don't know i had not time i nonsense open the door and let me speak to you for a moment no answer but he thought he heard her walking up and down the room only one moment he repeated i cannot indeed i cannot pray go away for the youthfulness of all this is lovely these people are really at the beginning of life and are immersed in the intoxicating employ of finding themselves out while remaining ignorant of their power upon each other neither is an actor the fascination of both is in their entire sincerity or worse than either would not have done what they each did they are still almost children i think it is plain that the author learned part of her trade from those weird sisters who wrote jane eyre and wuthering heights her art is a blend of charlotte brontes and emily brontes with a greater tendency to the greater freedom of emily's and an effect in the composite result of a fresh originality but in her stormiest scenes you have not the sense of outlawry such as you have in those of wuthering heights and the casing air is charged with comedy not tragedy oddly enough these aesthetics do not discord with the metaphysics which the author has learned to indulge from the fiction of goethe there are passages in this story of young love which in their psychological economical sociological excursiveness might have been studied from wilhelm meister the author was in fact operating in a region then so new to the novelist that she had a fair right to divide with the reader the weight of the exegetic duty laid upon her she had invited him into a world so strange to the english-speaking reader that she must sometimes suspend the lighter pleasures of hospitality in making sure that he understands what is going on the world is since so much more thoroughly travelled and thanks to such fiction as hers the peoples are so much more intimately versed in each other's peculiarities that the task of the international novelist is now indefinitely lightened but fortunately however well we knew germany or italy or spain or russia the pays de tendre always remains strange to us and the highways and byways of the land of love may be mapped out in the closest detail to the untiring interest of the student especially that region of a girl's heart explored by so many thousands of travellers who have recorded its surprises in so many hundred thousands of books continues a perennial mystery a continent proof against all revelations we get glimpses of it in the story of such a girl as hildegard but only glimpses and perhaps if she herself opened it to us we should be none the wiser in it we cannot be sure that hamilton will always be happy at times he will be tempestuously happy but at least he will never be calmly unhappy she will be always a surprise and a puzzle to him and when she is most his own his sense of possession will be qualified by this inalienable strangeness in her which will also be her strangeness to herself she will never be able to reveal her own nature wholly to him for she will never wholly know it for other girls the most obvious though not by any means the most valuable lesson of her experience will be that it is not safe for a girl to box a young man's ears unless she is willing to marry him this point seems to be section thirty of heroines of fiction by william dean howells this librivox recording is in the public domain the heroine of kate beaumont if we put aside the romances of hawthorne and the romantic novels of cooper 
we can hardly find much fiction of american scope and import before the civil war except uncle tom's cabin that was a great novel marred by defects of art and fettered to a cause but still a great novel and really the earliest american novel after the war we began to have other novels of material proportions and first among these were the stories of j w de forest a brevet major of volunteers and a veteran of the vast army then fading back with the weather-beaten blue of its overcoats into the common colour of the popular life his distinction was thereafter civil and literary and for the purposes of this paper it will be convenient to call him mr de forest though there is so much in his books to remind the reader of the big war which the author had passed through with all his artistic senses alert the book in which i first made his acquaintance with the surprise and joy in an american who seemed to write novels with authority was altogether concerned with the war and its results and miss ravenel's conversion was not less valuable to me for the light it cast upon the motives and morals of the recent struggle than for the knowledge of men and women as such which it showed i have not read it since those far-off days and i have not recurred to his subsequent novels playing the mischief the wetherill affair overland and irene the missionary which i have hardly named in the order of their succession but i have read honest john vane more than once with a feeling of its mastery in handling the flabby material of our ordinary political virtue such as no other american novel has given me a certain impatience a certain contempt of his material on the moral side is what as nearly allies mr de forest's art in spite of his huguenot race to the new england ethicism so fatal to fiction as anything i have noted in him it forbids him the artist's impartial joy in the good bad and indifferent motives which his sole affair is to let show themselves what they are and it leaves him if not a partisan of the better a censor of the worse a certain scornful bluntness in dealing with the disguises in which women natures reveal themselves is perhaps at the root of that dislike which most women have felt for his fiction and which in a nation of women readers has prevented it from ever winning a merited popularity One, i suppose his shapeliest novel is kate beaumont which might better have been called a family feud so largely is it the history of the hostilities between the beaumonts and mcallisters in a south carolina village before the war within the framework of this tragedy which has the comic reliefs visible to so true a humorist as mr de forest plays the love story of kate beaumont and frank mcallister they have met on the steamer bringing them home from a long sojourn in europe and he has fallen in love with her before she has fallen into the sea and been saved from death by her hereditary enemy he has the greatest loathing for the hereditary enmity which he considers a relic of barbarism and his rescue of kate beaumont forms a pretty basis for the reconciliation of their families when the young people get home the reconciliation is always just about to effect itself but is always turning into provisional hostilities and it does not actually take place till the close of the book when the lovers are duly married i confess that it was not with the expectation of finding kate beaumont a heroine to my hand that i turned again to the book and i there found her what i remembered her a sweet girl gentle and generous with a ready-made passion for her lover and otherwise a prevailing passivity it was in her sister nelly the wife of the drunken randolph armitage that i looked forward to meeting a second time a personality which greatly pleased me the first 
nelly armitage is a great little creature quite true to herself and her circumstance absolute woman and yet with rather more humour than is vouchsafed to most of her family she had married armitage for love of his beauty and as his vice grew upon him the proud girl had lived to suffer from him every ignominy of which blows were almost the least part when she ceases to love him she cannot leave him because of the public scandal which a woman of the beaumont race must not expose herself to and because she cannot do so without confessing to the other beaumonts things which will make it their duty and pleasure to kill her husband all the men in the book have an extraordinary vitality and nelly beaumont has her full share of it though the other women are rather scanted in behalf of the men she is pathetically heroically whimsically alive from the first moment and is never more so than when she falls in love with frank mcallister for her sister's sake and putting aside the historic beaumont hatred resolves that he shall be kate's husband she comes the more naturally to this pass when she at last abandons her own husband and takes refuge with her father for by this time life has taught her that the love of a good man is the best thing in the world and frank mcallister is good with the help of the heavenly powers she has fairly got the feud under her feet when her husband comes to claim her and in his drunken jealousy of frank not on hers but on kate's account tries to kill the young fellow whom he finds on a mission of peace in peyton beaumont's house his wild shooting brings down beaumont's saintly old father-in-law colonel kershaw frank's brothers lurking about imagine that the beaumonts have attacked him and open fire upon the beaumonts who come running pistol in hand and the old feud flames out again in more infernal fury than ever but kershaw's death proves a real peace offering armitage is promptly turned out and when his initial is found on the fatal bullet and not the mcallisters the way is open to the beaumonts for that forgiveness of their enemies which the old man has urged upon them from his deathbed the families are reconciled and kate and frank are married two now that the prejudices of the war time and the anti-war time have effectively died away we may rejoice in the virtues which mr de forest shows consistent with so many vices in the beaumonts each of the men of that family is studied with an accuracy which brings him tangibly before us the father peyton beaumont a quivering mass of affection for his own flesh and blood an impersonation of the noblest and stupidest caste and family pride his hot blood on fire with constant cocktails and his life always in his hand for the resentment of insult an impassioned parent and an impenitent homicide vincent the cynical scientific product of the paris medical schools returned to the full acceptance of the south carolina conditions his younger brother poinsett bred to the law but practically no more a lawyer than vincent is a doctor serenely philosophical and amiable from premature fat but as devoted to the feud as the youngest brother tom with whom it is a religion the beaumonts are of huguenot race and by so much are more picturesque than the scotch-blooded mcallisters but these are scarcely less delicately differentiated though they are not touched with the same artistic affection the old judge mcallister as canny suave and slippery as peyton beaumont is dense frank and truthful is an admirable portrait and so is the kind consumptive mechanically homicidal eldest son bruce frank emancipated from all local tradition by his seven years study in europe and holding the feud in utter abhorrence is worthily the lover of kate beaumont but the women of his family are shown in the abeyance of the southern women in the slave-holding times 
it is only some woman liberated by unhappiness to a sort of family leadership who can have the importance of nelly beaumont but even she as a character is less livingly presented than even such a subordinate man as bentley armitage among the group of powerful men figures that of the old colonel kershaw who has outlived the sins of his youth and the errors of his civilization must profoundly interest the student his patriarchal paramountcy not only with the passionate beaumont but all his impassioned descendants is however an effect of native goodness which is now become saintly without having degenerated into weakness three have i been tacitly owning that even my chosen heroine in kate beaumont is not of the dominant quality which the other heroines of this series may justly claim she is of scarcely more force indeed than the heroines of dickens though of indefinitely more vitality it is not dickens however who in any way characterizes mr de forest but there are hints and traces of another influence in his novel which is all the more curious because charles reed never minimized woman's part in fiction the hints and traces to be sure are in the manner but there is a deeper affinity between the two writers in their divination of women's nature reed turned his seership to flattering account and so won the favour of a sex which he was apt to symbolise in the innocence of serpents and the wisdom of doves but it is the defect of mr de forest's temperament that he could not flatter the foibles of womanhood or even its faults i remember in miss ravenel's conversion a very lurid mrs leroy of whom i cannot think without shuddering the wife of honest john vane is pitilessly ascertained and there is a widow in playing the mischief who is not a mirror for widows to say the least in kate beaumont the old flirt mrs chester and the young flirt jenny devine are treated with a contempt equally open and unsparing all the more to the honour of such a brave and essentially good woman as nelly armitage who is married to her hurt and kept it hidden is the praise of an author so chary of flattery for woman she has kept her hurt so well hidden that none of the beaumonts who would have bathed it in blood have ever suspected it and when she takes kate home with her for a visit the girl is simply fascinated with her handsome brother-in-law and thinks her sister the happiest of wives the day after her coming to his house armitage is brought home from a debauch and with her sister she comes upon him lying senseless oh she exclaimed is he dying he is dead dead drunk replied the wife to think how i have loved him nelly went on that man has had all the good all the best that was in my heart he has had it and trampled on it and wasted it till it is gone i can hate now and i hate him i have seen the time when i could kneel and kiss the figures of the carpet which his feet had rested upon and now see how i hate him and despise him i can take a mean and cowardly revenge on him she suddenly advanced upon the senseless man and slapped his face with her open hand oh you woman what are you doing exclaimed kate seizing her and drawing her away nelly i won't love you yes i am hateful replied nelly do you know why i can't tell you half the reasons i have for being hateful look at that scar pointing to a mark on her forehead he did it he struck me with his doubled fist and that gash was cut by the ring which i gave him kate sat down covered her face with her hands and sobbed violently he had struck me before and he has struck me since and there have been other insults oh if my father and brothers knew they would kill him nelly whispered kate looking up piteously as if pleading for the man's life i know it but that is not all i have become so savage that it seems to me i would not mind that 
what i care for is the exposure if they should shoot him people would learn why it would be known that nelly beaumont could not live with her husband that she had failed as a wife and a woman i shall stay and fight it out here till i can fight no longer but i wanted some one's sympathy i wanted at least to tell my sister how miserable i am she stopped fell on her knees laid her head in the girl's lap and broke out in violent crying after a minute she rose lifted kate to her feet embraced her passionately and said in a voice which had suddenly become calm this is my first cry in two years my heart feels a little less like breaking let us go do you suppose he has heard asked the young woman glancing at armitage heard answered nelly with a hard laugh he couldn't hear the last trump if it should be blown in this room isn't he horrible and handsome four after a first moment of prejudice mrs armitage had taken a sudden liking to frank mcallister when at last she realized that she must leave her husband she was not sorry to find frank on the train that took her and her sister back to their father's house he behaved with such discreetness and in regard to kate with such slavish submission to mrs armitage's will that i am his sworn ally she said to her sister as they drove home from the hartland station if he proposes do you accept him then i will go to papa with the whole story and if he is naughty i will appeal to your grandpapa she lost no time in making her approaches to their father's heart through the story of her sufferings i have had to leave my husband and i am excusable for telling why had to leave your husband echoed the father his bushy eyebrows bristling and his eyes turning bloodshot the infamous scoundrel he was so much of a beaumont that he asked for no more than the fact that his daughter had felt herself compelled to leave her husband on that he judged the case at once and for ever be perfectly easy he won't live the month out have a care what you do replied nelly i don't want the whole world to know what i've suffered who is going to know it interrupted the old fire-eater by heavens i will shoot the man that dares to know it you can't shoot the women said nelly the skill with which she plays upon the tenderness of her father in behalf of her sister have their effect in his consenting that if the feud can once be extinguished kate shall marry frank mcallister but i can't discuss it now he protests do let me alone do you want to break my heart no nor kate's either said nelly and presently there is a scene between kate and her father who sees her unhappy and must know why is it more than a beaumont can endure he repeated gently though with an appeal to the family pride no it is not more answered kate the father was not satisfied for he did not want his daughter to suffer at all i did not seek this new quarrel he said i can truly declare that judge mcallister forced it upon me i could live with the man decently if he would let me oh father i have nothing to say about these matters why do you explain them to me because i don't want you to blame me i can't bear it i say i could live with those people as for the young man i mean mr frank mcallister i respect him and like him kate in spite of her virginal modesty gave him a glance of gratitude that stung him he started and then resigned himself the girl did love that man i must speak out he declared it is my duty as a father i know that this young man likes you and wishes to marry you if your happiness is concerned i must know that then i will see what i can do kate could endure no longer she was fairly driven into a burst of tears and sobbing she clutched her father and buried her face in his neck all the while kissing him it was the same as to say i am very miserable but do not be unhappy about it and do not be vexed with me oh my poor child he repeated several times 
patting her shoulder in a helpless way the most discomforted of comforters at last she recovered her self-possession a little gradually lifting her head until her lips touched his ear papa i will tell you everything she whispered i did love him and oh i do if you had let him propose to me i should have taken him but now it is different since i have seen how it must always be between our families i have decided that i will never marry him not even if you consent i will not risk being put in hostility with my own family and now let me go quick let me run the instant he loosed his embrace she rustled out of the room and away to her own chamber shutting the door upon herself with a noise of hurry which he could plainly hear five all this it must be owned is very sweet and true and there is nothing anywhere forced in the note of kate beaumont's character she is always very naturally and delicately a girl who suffers into admirable womanhood but the want of something salient in her appearances unfits her for quotation perhaps that is the worst that can be said of her the worst that can be said of her author is that he was apt to leave his work in a certain unfinished and at last he left it altogether i think it one of the greatest pities of our literary history that about twenty years ago mr de forest ceased to print if he did not cease to write fiction i suspect that the only book he has recently published a lover's revolt is of a much earlier invention it has the virtues and the defects of all his work it is strongest in the portrayal of men's characters though its women cannot be said to be either weakly or falsely done their natures are truly but not kindly rendered and this is a sort of error in the handling again as always before the artist's contempt for their duplicity masters his sense of the goodness the sincerity indeed which consists with that duplicity he is distinctly a man's novelist and as men do not need novelists so much apparently as women his usefulness has been limited when he was writing the novels which like kate beaumont commanded for him the admiration of those among his countrymen best fitted to know good work it seemed reasonable that he should be lastingly recognized as one of the masters of american fiction and i for one shall never be willing to own him less though i cannot read many pages of his without wishing he had done this or that differently it is not only the master who chooses to leave things in the rough it is sometimes the prentice who has not yet learned how to shape them perfectly still in spite of all this i remember and i feel his strenuous imaginative gift working with a sort of disdainful honesty to the effects of art finer not stronger workmen succeeded him and a delicate realism more responsive to the claims and appeals of the feminine oversoul replaced his inexorable veracity in the fate of his fiction whether final or provisional it is as if this sensitive spirit had avenged the slight it felt and as the habit of women is over avenged itself it had revealed itself to him as it does only to the masters of fiction and he had seemed not to prize the confidence had mocked at it or what was worse had made it the text for dramatic censures far more cutting and insufferable than sermons in the lapse of time however the woman's soul may revise and even reverse its judgments it is capricious as well as implacable and it is possible that in some future moment it may fancy seeing itself as a most truthful man section thirty one of heroines of fiction by william dean howells this librivox recording is in the public domain mr james's daisy miller as i have noted before in these papers it is the fate of most novelists to be associated in the minds of readers with a certain type of heroine or with a single heroine 
if it is a type that represents the novelist he is not unfairly used for the type may be varied into distinctive characters if it is a single character it seems not so just for every novelist has invented many characters mr henry james for instance has given us more and more finely yet strongly differenced heroines than any novelist of his time but at the mention of his name a single creation of his will come so prominently to mind that daisy miller will for the moment make us forget all her sisters one mr james's time is still ours and while perfect artistry is prized in literature it is likely to be prolonged indefinitely beyond our time but he belongs pre-eminently to that period following the civil war when our authorship felt the rising tide of national life in an impulse to work of the highest refinement the most essential truth the tendency was then toward a subtle beauty which he more than any other american writer has expressed in his form and toward a keen humorous penetrating self-criticism which sees with joy upon the expanding national life and made it the material of fiction as truly national as any yet known mr j w de forest was the pioneer in the path which the american novelists were to take and hard upon him came mr henry james as unlike him as one talent could well be unlike another and yet of the same mission in preparing the way and planting the seeds of an imaginative literature native to our soil but taking the four winds of heaven in its bows they were as like in their equipment through study and sojourn abroad as they have been unlike in their destiny mr de forest's books are a part of our literary history mr james's books are a part of our literature mr de forest somehow offended the finer female sense in whose favour the prosperity of our fiction resides and he is no longer read mr james who flattered it as little lastingly piqued it and to read him if for nothing but to condemn him is the high intellectual experience of the daughters of mothers whose indignant girlhood resented while it adored his portraits of american women to enjoy his work to feel its rare excellence both in conception and expression is a brevet of intellectual good form which the women who have it prized at all its worth this is not a history of american fiction and i cannot arrange here for giving mr james even a provisional predominance in it but those who know our short and simple annals in that sort will no doubt place him where he belongs those who do not know them may at least be told that no american writer has been more the envy and ambition of generous youth trying for distinction as well as sincerity in their work two mr james is not quite the inventor of the international novel as i intimated in my notices of the initials but he is the inventor beyond question of the international american girl he recognized and portrayed the innocently adventuring unconsciously paraculent american maiden who hastened to efface herself almost as soon as she saw herself in that still flattering if a little mocking mirror so that between two sojourns in europe a decade apart 
she had time to fade from the vision of the friendly spectator in eighteen sixty to seventy you saw her and heard her everywhere on the european continent in eighteen seventy to eighty you sought her in vain amidst the monuments of art or on the misty mountain tops or at the table d'hote her passing might have been the effect of a more instructed civilization or it might have been a spontaneous and voluntary disappearance in any case she was gone and it seemed a pity for she was sweet and harmless with a charm derived from our earth and sky a flavour of new world conditions imparting its wilding fragrance to that strange environment as freely as to its native air i could well fancy her discoverer feeling a pang of desolation to find no longer in the living world this lovely creature who perished as it were of her own impossibility and whose faded ghost has no habitat but in his faithful page it was perhaps in some such divine despair that he left the field of international fiction which he had made his own and had kept for so many years and turned to english life with only a thin american presence flitting now and then across the scene he has done better work because maturer work in the treatment of this alien material than he did in the earlier fiction before he possessed himself of the international field his english people have the convincing effect of having been more truly seen than others except trollops but they are not those absolute contributions to polite learning which his internationals are no one else could do them certainly no living englishman and yet one resents the author's late preoccupation with them and demands his return to the types of that atlantis psychologically midway between europe and america where his art ripened and perfected itself in the study of character which confided its existence to him earliest if not onlyest one demands this of him with a strong disposition to implore him if the demand fails to comply in the interest of history which must without his help fail of some of the most curious and interesting not to say significant phases of modern civilization since he began to note americo european manners we have gone increasingly abroad and his field has indefinitely broadened and filled itself with an increasing variety of figures if these have lost the refreshing sharpness of outline which first tempted his eye they have gained in a fine differentiation which ought still more sympathetically to invite his subtle fancy a whole new generation has grown up in the international field and since he abandoned it no one else has held it in any such force as to be able to dispute his sovereignty if he should come back to it three it is a curious and interesting fact of mr james's literary fortunes that in his short stories one is obliged to call them stories for want of a more closely fitting word rather than his more extended fictions are the heroes and the heroines we know him best by he has the art of so environing the slightest presentment of female motive that it shows life-size in the narrow space of a sketch or study and you remember such a picture with a fullness of detail and of particularity wanting to many colossal figures you seem in the retrospect to have lived a long time with the pictures looks attitudes phrases remain with you and when you revert to the book you do not lose this sense of rich amplitude it would be futile to catalogue the personalities which are so real in the recollection 
of stories so numerous but not half numerous enough and it is only for the pleasure of naming them over that i mention at random mrs headway in the siege of london the terrible georgina in georgina's reasons madame mauve in the story called after her pandora in pandora lady barberina in lady barberina lemon that pathetic presence in the altar of the dead the two wives of the master in the lesson of the master both the girls in the spoils of poynton the heroine and mrs dallow the sub-heroine in the tragic muse the daughter in marriages the poor shabbily defrauded girl in paste the two old things the old maids in the third person lily and miss gunton of poughkeepsie the list is inexhaustible and it is not only futile but dangerous to deal with it for your forgetfulness of any figure accuses your taste in all the rest and if you leave out a general favour you are in peril of falling a prey to the furious resentment of those who adore just that neglected heroine no other novelist has approached mr james in his appreciation of women and in his abilities to suggest the charm which is never wholly absent from women whether they are good bad or indifferent in looks or behaviour take all the other men that have written novels in english and match their women with his and they seem not to have written of women at all a few women may vie with him in the portrayal of a few figures jane austen may and fanny burney and miss edgeworth and george eliot and the brontes and mrs humphrey ward but their heroines are as much outnumbered by his as the novelists are in every other way surpassed the fact is not affected by the want of general recognition it is not yet known to the ignorant masses of educated people that mr james is one of the greatest masters of fiction who has ever lived it is because he has worked in a fashion of his own in regions of inquiry not traversed by the herd of adventurers and dealt with material not exploited before that he is still to the critical jews a stumbling-block and to the critical greeks foolishness but time will inevitably care for this unrivalled artist or this unique psychologist who deals artist-wise with his knowledge of human nature and he will yet take that eminent place for which he has no rival i cannot in thinking of him and his somewhat baffling failure of immediate acceptance promise myself that his right will be acknowledged soon his own generation in its superior refinement was better fitted to appreciate him than the present period coarsened and vulgarized by the prevalence of puerile romance and yet if his earliest masterpiece had been offered to this thicker-witted time i doubt if it would have suffered the same injustice which it met from a more enlightened tribunal or at least the same kind of injustice it is pathetic to remember how daisy miller was received or rather rejected as an attack on american girlhood and yet it is perfectly intelligible that it should have been taken so by americans who had still a country to be so inclusively proud of that they could not bear the shadow of question to fall upon any phase of it our political descent to the european level has not only thickened our skins but it has in a manner so broadened though it has imbruted our minds that if she could have come again we should see daily miller's innocent freedom in the face of immemorial convention with the liberal and tolerant pleasure which the english at once felt in it we should not be blinded to her charm or to the subtle patriotism which divined and portrayed it 
by a patriotism which if fervent and generous was not so subtle as the author's but as i have said daisy miller cannot come again the very conditions that would render us patient of her now have rendered her impossibility impossible it is a melancholy paradox but we need not be inconsolable for though she has perished for ever from the world we have her spiritual reflex still vivid in the sensitive mirror which caught with such accuracy her girlish personality while it still walked the earth in the dusty ways of european travel for the story of daisy miller is as slight as mr james delights to make the frame of his picture which depends so very little for its quality upon the frame she is first seen at vevey in switzerland with her young but terribly mature little brother and their mother a little lonely american group in the rather impertinent custody of a courier whom they make their domestic if not social equal and she is seen last at rome where indeed she dies of the fever the wonder of the international and the opprobrium of the compatriotic society such drama as arises from the simple circumstances precipitates itself in a few spare incidents which in the retrospect dwindled to nothing before the superior interest of the psychology a girl of the later eighteen seventies sent with such a mother as hers to europe by a father who remains making money in schenectady after no more experience of the world than she had got in her native town and at a number of new york dinners among people of like tradition uncultivated but not rude reckless but not bold inexpugnably ignorant of the conventionally right and spiritedly resentful of control by criterions that offend her own sense of things she goes about europe doing exactly what she would do at home from an innocence as guileless as that which shaped her conduct in her native town she knows no harm and she means none she loves life and talking and singing and dancing and attentions but she is no flirt and she is essentially and infinitely far from worse her whole career as the reader is acquainted with it is seen through the privity of the young europeanized american who meets her at vevey and follows her to rome in a fascination which they have for each other but which is never explicitly a passion this side of the affair is of course managed with the fine adroitness of mr james's mastery from the first moment the sense of their potential love is a delicate pleasure for the reader till at the last it is a delicate pang when the girl has run her wild gauntlet and is dead not only of the roman fever but of the blows dealt her in her course there is a curious sort of fatality in it all she is destined by innate and acquired in discipline to do the things she does and she is not the less doomed to suffer the things she suffers in proportion to the offence she gives by her lawless innocence the things she does are slight things but their consequences break her heart and leave the readers aching as winterbournes must have ached lifelong five the young man is sitting in the garden of the trois couronnes at vevey talking with her terrible little brother when daisy miller comes down the walk toward them she was dressed in white muslin with a hundred frills and flounces and knots of pale coloured ribbon she was bareheaded but she balanced in her hand a large parasol with a deep border of embroidery and she was strikingly admirably pretty he was ceasing to be embarrassed for he had begun to perceive that she was not the least embarrassed herself 
she gradually gave him more of the benefit of her glance and then he saw that this glance was perfectly direct and unshrinking it was not however what would have been called an immodest glance for the young girl's eyes were singularly honest and fresh they were wonderfully pretty eyes and indeed winterbourne had not seen for a long time anything prettier than his fair countrywoman's various features her complexion her nose her ears her teeth as regards this young lady's face he made several observations it was not at all insipid but it was not exactly expressive and though it was eminently delicate winterbourne mentally accused it very forgivingly of a want of finish he thought it very possible that master randolph's sister was a coquette he was sure she had a spirit of her own but in her bright sweet superficial little visage there was no mockery no irony before long it became obvious that she was much disposed to conversation having first assured herself that he was a real american her lips and her eyes were constantly moving she had a soft slender agreeable voice with all her prettiness in her lively eyes and in her light slightly monotonous smile before the end of the day her mother has evasively appeared and been unwillingly made acquainted with her daughter's unknown friend whom the girl has already easily made invite her to go with him to see the castle of chillon the mother is not surprised that evening in the same garden when daisy tells him she wishes he would take her a row on the lake mrs miller sees no social objection but suggests i should think you had better find out what time it is the courier however who has arrived to announce that randolph has gone to bed ventures to interpose i suppose you don't think it's proper daisy exclaimed oh i hoped you would make a fuss i don't care to go now i myself shall make a fuss if you don't go said winterbourne that's all i want a fuss and the young girl began to laugh again daisy turned away from winterbourne looking at him smiling and fanning herself good night she said i hope you are disappointed or disgusted or something he looked at her taking the hand she offered i am puzzled he answered well i hope it won't keep you awake i should not know where else to find the witless purposelessness beyond the moment's excitement and the pleasure of bewildering a young man in much of a girl's behaviour more sufficiently yet more sparingly suggestive than in these admirable passages the girl is a little fool of course but while her youth lasts she is an angelic a divine fool with caprices that have the quality of inspirations she behaves at vevey with winterbourne a real american as she would have done with a gentleman friend at schenectady but when he sees her next at rome he finds her behaving with italians as if they too were gentlemen friends at schenectady he meets her at the house of a europeanized american lady who would fain europeanize daisy enough at least to save her from scandal daisy was exchanging greetings very prettily with her hostess but when she heard winterbourne's voice she quickly turned her head well i declare she said i told you i should come winterbourne rejoined smiling well i didn't believe it said miss daisy you might have come to see me i arrived only yesterday i don't believe that the young girl declared why you were awfully mean at vevey you wouldn't do anything you wouldn't stay there when i asked you my dearest young lady cried winterbourne with eloquence have i come all the way to rome to encounter your reproaches just hear him say that said daisy giving a twist to a bow on mrs walker's dress did you ever hear anything so quaint so quaint my dear murmured mrs walker in the tone of a partisan of winterbourne well i don't know said daisy fingering mrs walker's ribbons 
mrs walker i want to tell you something you know i'm coming to your party but i want your permission to bring a friend it's an intimate friend of mine mr giovanelli said daisy without a tremor in her clear little voice or a shadow on her brilliant little face he's an italian he is the handsomest man in the world except mr winterbourne he thinks ever so much of americans he's tremendously clever he's perfectly lovely the afternoon before the party mrs walker and winterbourne find daisy walking on the pincio at the supreme hour of the promenade with giovanelli quite as she would have been with a gentleman friend at home mrs walker wants her to leave him and get into her carriage but daisy thinks it would disappoint and wound him and she will not do that in the evening she comes to the party long after her mother has appeared and comes alone with giovanelli as she might with a gentleman friend in schenectady when she goes up to take leave of her hostess mrs walker turns her back on her it is the beginning of the end in which all society turns its back on daisy winterbourne sees her for the last time in the coliseum at midnight alone with giovanelli how long have you been here he asked almost brutally daisy lovely in the flattering moonlight looked at him a moment then all the evening she answered gently i never saw anything so pretty i'm afraid that you will not think roman fever very pretty this is the way people catch it i never was sick the girl declared i don't look like much but i'm healthy i was bound to see the coliseum by moonlight i shouldn't have wanted to go home without that and we've had the most beautiful time haven't we mr giovanelli i should advise you said winterbourne to drive home as fast as possible what you say is very wise giovanelli rejoined i will go and make sure that the carriage is at hand daisy followed with winterbourne he kept looking at her she seemed not the least embarrassed then noticing his silence she asked him why he did not speak he only began to laugh they passed under one of the dark archways giovanelli was in front with the carriage here daisy stopped a moment looking at the young american did you believe the other day i was engaged i believe it makes very little difference whether you are engaged or not he felt the young girl's pretty eyes fixed upon him through the thick loom of the archway i don't care said daisy in a little strange tone whether i have the roman fever or not in her delirium she entreats her mother to tell winterbourne that she never was engaged to giovanelli after her death he finds himself alone with the italian by her grave he seemed to wish to say something at last he said she was the most beautiful young lady i ever saw and the most amiable and then he added and she was the most innocent six the perfection of the workmanship in this little book could not be represented without an apparent exaggeration which would wrong its scrupulous but most sufficient expression if no word could be spared without in some degree spoiling it none could be added without cumbering its beauty with a vain decoration to quote from it at all is to wish to quote it all and one resigns oneself the more easily to the impossibility of giving a notion of the perfection of the performance in view of the impossibility of imparting a due sense at second hand of the loveliness and truth of the conception the reader must go to the book for both and when he has read it i think he will agree with me that never was any civilization offered a more precious tribute than that which a great artist paid ours in the character of daisy miller but our civilization could not imagine the sincerity in which the tribute was offered it could not realize that daisy miller was presented in her divine innocence her inextinguishable trust in herself and others as the supreme effect of the american attitude toward womanhood the american man might have suffered her perhaps more than suffered her pitied her adored her even but the american woman would none of her she fancied in the poor girl a libel of her nationality almost a libel of her sex and failed to seize her wilding charm her
flower-like purity the american woman would none of daisy miller not because the american woman was ungracious or ungrateful but because she was too jealous of her own perfection to allow that innocence might be reckless and angels in their ignorance of evil might not be Section thirty two of Heroines of Fiction by William Dean Howells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Thomas Hardy's Heroines. If I restrict myself somewhat in the space given to Mr. Hardy's Heroines and seem scantly to treat of them in a paper or two it is not because i value them less than the heroines of some novelists with whom i have allowed myself a wider range but i am sensible that with all their witchery they are of a sisterhood or at the most a cousinhood which may be more typically represented and that with their strong individual characters there is a strong family likeness among them all which may be suggested in the figures and actions of a few one i recall distinctly the order of my acquaintance with these lovely if somewhat elusive somewhat elusive ladies it began with elfrida swancourt in a pair of blue eyes who revealed to me a fresh conception of the ever womanly and in whose fate passion and caprice comedy and tragedy were so strangely mingled that one remembers her with a sigh that is half a smile and an adoration that rather slights its idol she remained somehow exterior both to what she suffered and to what she did it happened to her or from her but she did not seem responsible for it fancy there in under the greenwood tree was morally more trammelled both in the cause and consequence yet she too was warped along by the toils of fate rather than moved by her own will and in fact most of the women of mr hardy could urge that they had to do the things they did even when they wished to do them this was not quite so much the case with bathsheba everdeen in far from the madding crowd as with some others she for a hardy heroine had a degree of control over her destiny which might almost be called free will at least she was not so much the prey of determinism as most of the others it is true that she yields to a sort of fascination in sergeant troy but only as all women in love do she no more keeps her head than she keeps her heart in the mistaken marriage she makes she has a powerful will which does not avail her so much in the great as in the little things and she has a sturdy common sense of pretty much the same effect yet she is upon the whole the least wrought upon by her environment and the most absolute of her sisterhood the larger part of these are self-willed rather than strong-willed as is eminently the case with paula power in the laodicean that is not nearly so great a novel as far from the madding crowd but it is of a peculiar charm because it is the full expression of the sort of feminine personality which will bewitch men as long as the shifty graces of a weather vane more take their fancy in women than the steadfast virtues of the sky pointing steeple each worshipper hopes that somehow the vein when it turns in his favour will stand still there 
and in fact this is what commonly happens first or last paula power veered with most winds that blew but while her purposes shifted her fancy was fixed in the young architect who had caught it and who kept it in spite of all her turning she was more nearly a society person than mr hardy commonly paints and had less of primitive earthiness than almost any of his heroines in that terrible group of noble dames with whom he makes us acquainted in a series of wonderful histories the tellular quality of their natures is so much more appreciable than even the mundane that they seem beings emancipated by their potent caprices and propensities from all the social obligations and are not so much grand dame as predatory creatures set by their caste above the moral law mr hardy's heroines are good or they are bad or they are now good and now bad according to some inner impulse from some agency deeper or more primal than conscience when they feel the pull of the moral law they yield it a partial and provisional allegiance as fancy dare does in under the greenwood tree when she finds herself so differently in love with the vicar and with dick the tranter that she is unable to reconcile the conflicting passions and acquires what merit she can by frankly owning the fact to the vicar and renouncing him or as the pretty widow in the distracted young preacher who acknowledges the error of smuggling but sees some excuse for herself and her neighbours in the fact they only do it in the winter perhaps we may best define the sort of woman this novelist places before us so livingly that we cannot doubt their reality by a process of exclusion in which we need not go farther than to say that they are wholly unlike american women they are of the same stock racially but ours are of a graft upon the parent stem so different that the two varieties of fruit are as little related as plums and apricots in the hardy lower class heroines we see the primitive englishwoman before she was touched by puritanism and in his middle and upper class heroines the same woman as she has grown into modern civilization unaffected by the tremendous force which has permeated and moulded the nature of the american great great grand nieces of that original englishwoman i have often wondered what character untouched by puritanism was like and i fancy that in the hardy heroines i have seen and if i cannot altogether approve of it i can own its charm as i can willingly acknowledge the ugliness and error and soul sickness which puritanism produced in building up our intensely personalized american conscience if we take the case even of such a character as sue broadhead in jude with her hysterically exaggerated impulses toward what her conscience bids her do we have the nervous impressibility of the puritanized woman but we are made finally aware that it is the like effect of wholly different causes it is the ecclesiasticized conscience which works in this english girl not the personalized conscience which would drive a like american girl to the same frenetic extremes oddly enough as the reader will perhaps think i am inclined to regard ethelberta in the hand of ethelberta as one of the highest-minded of mr hardy's women at least she is one of those least swayed by passion and of a mind the least darkened by exhalations from those dregs of pagan earthiness which lie at the base of his 
woman's natures she is quite unselfish and her ambition is for her family and the advancement of its modest fortunes when the employment of her unique gift as a public story-teller makes it advisable for her to establish herself in london and she takes a house there with her brother for a page one sister for cook and the other for housemaid and her mother for a sort of upper servant they all understand that it is for their good and not for her glory and they acquiesce with the affection for her which she feels for them and which she never fails to show on proper occasion dinner in a nobleman's house where her father the butler waits behind her chair while she figures as the celebrity of the hour is not a proper occasion and she reserves the display of her filial love for the meetings with her father behind her own doors even in the case of her young lover whom she gives up for the bad-natured but good-humoured old lord whom she marries she has never been so much in love with him but she was willing to get him for her sister piketty and when she finds out how very wicked her amiable old lord is she does her best to escape from him being prevented she remains and reforms him the scheme is the most fantastic of mr hardy's plots but it must be owned it is delightful and ethelbertha is one of the most delightful as well as one of the most respectable of his heroines she is not quite candid but as i said she is very unselfish and i do not know that she has her moral superior in his fiction except anne garland in the trumpet major or a pensive figure like grace melbury in the woodlanders anne is the sweetest and freshest of his girls and is of that level of life on which his muse seems to find herself most at home she is above the lowest but not so high as to tempt the author aside from her character to the complications of her social environment which is indeed very simple she is quite though rather passively constant to a lover who is rather actively inconstant but finally true to the young fancy they have had for each other and she is i hazard the notion innately perhaps the most ladylike of mr hardy's creations one heart-breaking presence among these i could not ignore without accusing myself of insensibility and yet i cannot name tess and tess of the d'urbervilles without a feeling of imperfection in the handling of her character which i might not be able to make apparent i do not know that i wish to make it apparent and i will only say that profoundly pathetic as she is tess seems to me wanting in unity she seems the effect of two successive impulses of the author's imagination in the first part of the story she is one tess whom the other tess in the last part does not so much grow out of as seem joined to they are halves of two figurines found in the same soil and compact of the same clay not belonging originally together but joined by voluntary and conscious skill i have owned that it would be difficult to prove this and i shall not be hurt if the reader does not agree with me or throws things at me in defence of one of the most pathetic heroines of fiction yet i am inclined to hold to my opinion and i will ask any irate differer to compare her evolution with that of eustatia vi for instance in the return of the native poor eustatia with her sordid ambition and her selfish dreams of happiness her selfish ideals of love and her essential cold-heartedness in spite of her warm-bloodedness is one to command the least respect among a generation of ladies who all command one's amused liking rather than one's respect unless indeed it be that heroine of the mayor of casterbridge whom i shadowily remember as possibly shadier still but whom i cannot recall by name two 
eustatia vi is one of those natures whose social evolution interests you so little that you do not care how vaguely it is suggested we first find her in her grandfather's house on egdon heath of which she is very fit to be the tutelary spirit though she alone among the characters is not native to it and has an ideal of life wholly alien to the wild and simple and solemn place she longs for excitement and for worldly triumphs and artificial splendours and at egdon she has only a lover whom she cannot marry and another whom having married she wearies of though he is good and fine and above her in everything but ambition it is seldom that an author presents a heroine so palpably as eustatia is shown in these richly descriptive passages eustatia vi was the raw material of a divinity on olympus she would have done well with a little preparation she had the passions and instincts which make a model goddess that is those which make not quite a model woman she was in person full-limbed and somewhat heavy without ruddiness as without pallor and soft to the touch as a cloud to see her hair was to fancy that a whole winter did not contain darkness enough to form its shadow it closed over her forehead like nightfall extinguishing the western glow her nerves extended into those tresses and her temper could always be softened by stroking them down when her hair was brushed she would instantly sink into stillness and look like the sphinx she had pagan eyes full of nocturnal mysteries their light as it came and went and came again was partially hampered by their oppressive lids and lashes and of these the underlid was much fuller than it usually is with english women this enabled her to indulge in reverie without seeming to do so she might have been believed capable of sleeping without closing them up the mouth seemed formed less to speak than to quiver less to quiver than to kiss some might have added less to kiss than to curl one had fancied that such lip curves were mostly lurking underground in the south as fragments of forgotten marbles so fine were the lines of her lips that though full each corner of her mouth was as clearly cut as the point of a spear this keenness of corner was only blunted when she was given over to sudden fits of gloom one of the phases of the night side of sentiment which she knew too well for her years in this portrait the whole passionately selfish drama of the woman is suggested while deed a strange lawless earth spirit of light generation trifles with her love and her fancy wanders from him to clin yobright who returns from paris and settles down on the heath after his eyesight is threatened as a furze cutter she does not mean to let him stay there but to make him take her to paris or out into the world somewhere and from time to time she sees wild eve after her marriage to clem yeobright and at last elopes with him and they are drowned together in the weir mr hardy loves to keep close to nature in all his novels but in none do we feel the breath of the earth as in this the story keeps to the circuit of the lonely heath with its few farms and hamlets and much of it befalls by night as suits the dusky soul of the heroine a very significant bit as regards her and very characteristic as regards the courageous humour of the author is that passage in which she keeps her bargain with the simple-hearted country boy who lends her his costume for a masquerading adventure on condition that she will let him hold her hand for a quarter of an hour the next evening eustatia stood punctually at the fuel-house door waiting for the dusk which was to bring charlie with the trappings he appeared on the dark ridge of heathland here are the things he whispered placing them upon the threshold and now miss eustatia 
the payment it is quite ready i am as good as my word she leaned against the doorpost and gave him her hand charlie took it in both his own with a tenderness beyond description unless it was like that of a child holding a captured sparrow why there's a glove on it he said in a deprecating way i've been walking she observed but miss well it is hardly fair she pulled off the glove and gave him her bare hand they stood together without further speech each looking at the blackening scene and each thinking his and her own thoughts i think i won't use it all up to-night said charlie when six or eight minutes had been passed by them hand in hand may i have the other few minutes another time as you like said she without the least emotion but it must be over in a week now there is only one thing i want you to do to wait while i put on the dress and then to see if i do my part properly but let me look first indoors she vanished for a minute or two and went in her grandfather was safely asleep in his chair now then she said on returning walk down the garden a little way and when i am ready i'll call you charlie walked and waited and presently heard a soft whistle he returned to the fuel house door she struck the light revealing herself to be changed in sex brilliant in colours and armed from top to toe perhaps she quailed a little under charlie's vigorous gaze but whether any shyness appeared upon her countenance could not be seen by reason of the strips of ribbon which used to cover the face in mumming costumes representing the barred visor of the mediaeval helmet it fits pretty well she said looking down at the white overalls except that the tunic or whatever you call it is long in the sleeve the bottom of the overalls i can turn up inside now you may leave me yes miss but i think i'll have one minute more of what i am owed if you don't mind eustacia gave him her hand as before one minute she said and at about the proper interval counted on till she reached seven or eight hand and person she then withdrew to a distance of several feet and recovered some of her old dignity the contract completed she raised between them a barrier impenetrable as a wall there tis all gone and i didn't mean quite all he said with a sigh a whimsical comedy in the neighbouring heath dwellers plays round the central tragedy and gilds with its phosphorescent gaiety the gloom of the whelming doom when it has come to eustacia's feigning absence from home and letting her husband's mother toil back to her own house through the midday heat that kills her the end is already in view for she has not opened her door because while diva's within in the scene with her husband which follows eustacia's peculiar nature is allowed to make itself felt in terms curiously wanting in dramatic intensity but somehow adequate to the situation he comes home early in the morning and goes straight to her room the noise of his arrival must have aroused her for when he opened the door she was standing before the looking-glass in her night-dress the ends of her hair gathered into one hand with which she was coiling the whole mass round her head previous to beginning toilette operations 
she was not a woman given to speaking first at a meeting and she allowed Quim to walk across in silence without turning her head he came behind her and she saw his face in the glass it was ashy haggard and terrible instead of starting towards him in sorrowful surprise as even eustatia undemonstrative wife as she was would have done in days before she burdened herself with a secret she remained motionless looking at him in the glass and while she looked the carmine flush with which warmth and sound sleep had suffused her cheeks and neck dissolved from view and the death-like pallor in his face flew across into hers he was close enough to see this and the sight instigated his tongue you know what is the matter he said huskily i see it in your face her hand relinquished the rope of hair and dropped to her side and the pile of tresses no longer supported fell from the crown of her head about her shoulders and over the white nightgown in inky streams she made no reply speak to me said yobright peremptorily the blanching process did not cease in her and her lips now became as white as her face one familiar with the stoic philosophy would have fancied that he saw the delicate tissue of her soul extricating itself from her body and leaving it a simple heap of old clay she turned to him and said yes quim i'll speak to you why do you return so early can i do anything for you yes you can listen to me it seems that my wife is not very well why your face my dear your face or perhaps it is the pale morning light which takes your colour away now i am going to reveal a secret to you ha ha oh that is ghastly what your laugh there's reason for ghastliness eustatia you have held my happiness in the hollow of your hand and like a devil you have dashed it down she started back from her dressing-table retreated a few steps from him and looked him in the face ah you think to frighten me she said with a slight laugh is it worth while i am undefended and alone how extraordinary what do you mean as there is ample time i will tell you though you know well enough i mean that it is extraordinary that you should be alone in my absence tell me now where is he who was with you on the afternoon of the thirty-first of august under the bed up the chimney a shudder overcame her and shook the light fabric of her nightdress throughout i do not remember date so exactly she said i cannot recollect that anybody was with me besides yourself their quarrel ends in her leaving the house and at last the reader's heart almost turns to her in her self-pity cruel and false as she has been oh 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 she cried breaking down at last and shaking with sobs which choked her she sank upon her knees oh will you have done oh you are too relentless there's a limit to the cruelty of savages i've held out long but you crushed me down i beg for mercy i cannot bear this any longer it is inhuman to go farther with this if i had killed your mother with my own hand i should not deserve such a scourging to the bone as this oh oh god have mercy upon a miserable woman you have beaten me in this game i beg you to stay your hand in pity i am going from this house we cannot both stay here 
she hastily dressed herself your bright moodily walking up and down the room the whole of the time at last all her things were on her poor little hands quivered so violently as she held them to her chin to fasten her bonnet that she could not tie the strings and after a few moments she relinquished the attempt seeing this he moved forward and said let me tie them she assented in silence and lifted her chin for once at least in her life she was totally oblivious of the charm of her attitude but he was not and he turned his eyes aside that he might not be tempted to softness three elfrida swancourt as compared with such an earth spirit as eustatia vi is an air spirit but she is quite as strictly of this world one has a greater tenderness for her and realizes that in her love affairs so swiftly successive as to be almost simultaneous she is quite unselfish or at least she seeks her happiness only in that of the man she loves she suffers cruel rejection and punishment through henry knight on whom her heart is truly set because he thinks her a flirt and is retroactively jealous of the young architect stephen smith and cannot understand how she might have had a fancy for another before she was fixed in her passion for himself but she recovers from the blow sufficiently to marry lord luxellian and the final pathos of her story is not for her heartbreak but for her early death the pang of this is such that it is difficult to get back of the fact to that earlier consciousness of her in which one could laugh when an older woman said of her that elfrida would talk like a philosopher but would behave like a robin in a greenhouse this indeed was true of her mainly in minor matters of conduct she was equal to the more heroic demands of life there is a lovely honesty in her which mainly characterizes her in spite of much folly and heedless risk and downright defection that is she gives her fancy to stephen smith and then she gives her heart to henry knight without losing the reader's respect for people change and one preference pushes out another without sin though not without suffering it is the hard lot of women that though they cannot always inspire men with constancy they so embody men's highest ideal of it that they cannot change without violence to that ideal they are therefore obliged to use finesse when perhaps they would rather not and try to seem unchanging even while they change it was elfrida's difficult problem to make knight feel that she had never loved any one but him while confronted in her own consciousness by the fact that in a different if somewhat more ignorant way she had at least very much liked being loved by stephen smith if she had not loved him she was really engaged to smith when she met knight and she had somehow to get rid of the old love before reconciling herself to happiness in the new the affair was possible in its subjective implications but objectively it countered with the devoted and exacting passion of knight and ended badly nothing more prettily suggests this charming girl's complexity of emotion and simplicity of action than a scene which will have remained in every reader's memory one of mr hardy's peculiarly audacious and intimate scenes with night she has got 
over the face of a lofty seaward cliff and when he finds it impossible to return to her he helps her to get back and remains clinging to a face of rock where his hold must give way in a few minutes there is no time to run for help and there is none at hand except in her own wit on a sudden we are told she vanished over the bank from his sight she was gone for what seemed to him an eternity but when she reappeared he noticed as he looked up at her that in her arms she bore a bundle of white linen and that her form was singularly attenuated so preternaturally thin and flexible was elfrida at this moment that she appeared to bend under the light blows of the rain shafts as they struck into her sides and bosom and splintered into spray on her face she sat down and hurriedly began rending the linen into strips those she knotted end to end and afterwards twisted them like the strands of a cord in a short space of time she had formed a perfect rope by this means six or seven yards long can you wait while i bind it she said anxiously extending her gaze down to him yes if not very long hope has given me a wonderful instalment of strength elfrida wound the lengthy string she had thus formed round and round the linen rope which was now firm in every part when you have let it down said knight already resuming his position of ruling power go back from the edge of the slope and over the bank as far as the rope will allow you then lean down and hold the end with both hands i have tied it round my waist she cried and i will lean directly upon the bank holding with my hands as well it was the arrangement he had thought of but would not suggest i will raise and drop it three times when i am behind the bank she continued to signify that i am ready take care oh take the greatest care i beg of you she dropped the rope over him to learn how much of its length it would be necessary to expend on that side of the bank went back and disappeared as she had done before the rope was trailing by knight's shoulders in a few moments it moved three times he waited yet a second or two then laid hold half a dozen extensions of the arms alternating with half a dozen seizures of the rope with his feet brought him up to the level of the soil he was saved and sprang over the bank at sight of him she leaped to her feet with almost a shriek of joy knight's eyes met hers and with supreme eloquence the glance of each told a long concealed tale of emotion in that short half moment moved by an impulse neither could resist they ran together and into each other's arms an overwhelming rush of exultation at having delivered the man she revered from one of the most terrible forms of death shook the gentle girl to the centre of her soul it merged in a defiance of duty to stephen and a total recklessness as to plighted faith every nerve of her will was now in entire subjection to her feeling volition as a guiding power had forsaken her to remain passive as she remained now encircled by his arms was a sufficiently complete result a glorious crown to all the years of her life elfrida recovered herself and gently struggled to be free he reluctantly relinquished her and then surveyed her from crown to toe she seemed as small as an infant 
he perceived whence she had obtained the rope elfrida my elfrida he exclaimed in gratified amazement i must leave you now she said her face doubling its red with an expression between gladness and shame you follow me but at some distance behind the bank while night reclined upon the dizzy slope waiting for death she had taken off her whole clothing and replaced only her outer robe and skirt every thread of the remainder lay upon the ground in the form of a woollen and cotton rope she then ran off from him through the pelting rain like a hare or more like a pheasant when scampering away with a lowered tail it has a Section thirty three of Heroines of Fiction by William Dean Howells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Thomas Hardy's Bathsheba Everdeen and Paula Power. Each great novelist arrives at rather than with his own way of looking at life when he begins to make himself known to us he is not himself alone but the masters also who have gone before him and who gradually leave him to himself as he shows more and more his ultimate power all this which is true of all novelists is less true of mr hardy than almost any other he seemed to come from nowhere in literature to be without preoccupations or affinities the effect perhaps of his training in an art which is one of the most objective and the farthest in its immemorial simplicities from the manifold consciousnesses of the literary art before he was a novelist he was an architect and what clung to him from tradition or association was not some other man's literary method or manner but the habit of thinking as it were in plastic terms and of using words structurally to be sure when he first attracted criticism people thought him like george eliot but it seems to me that this was a mistaken impression from their both dealing so largely with rustic life the spirit of their respective dealing with it was not at all the same and i do not think that mr hardy's way of looking at life of any level is like the way of any novelist before him as nearly as i can put it to myself it is the vision of humanity as little as possibly affected by those influences from without religious and moral which we anxiously enough mistake for impulses it is the sense of dusting unsick which we so rarely have had that we might say we never had it before this is the first impression we have of life as mr hardy shows it but then we begin to perceive very gradually but at last fully how this primitive material is affected by experience when the experience is vital as most experience is not and how it loses its original simplicity through experience and becomes a living soul a vast number of the men and women in his novels never reach this development but remain a part of mere nature like the cattle and poultry the trees the soil they are delightful company just as these animate and inanimate things are they are souls and doubtless will live hereafter but they are not living souls here and now they are like sheep and goats that nourish a blind life within the brain sometimes mr hardy's people pass through tremendous experiences and seem very little the more alive for them a beautiful perhaps a supreme effort of his art is that his characters are in the last extreme of discovery impalpably veiled from your knowledge as people 
are whom you know best in the waking and working world something is still kept back possibly for the final intimacies of another state of being one do we ever come thoroughly to know bathsheba everdeen in far from the madding crowd no more i fancy than if we were of her most familiar acquaintance we understand the workings of her mind and feel their charm but that ultimate reason of her being for which imagination aches in vain is the secret which is kept from the author himself he is the greater power because of the reservation if he could and would tell all he would not be the master he is and perhaps if he could explain her as exhaustively as we wish she would not be a woman our mystification which continues to the end begins with the first glimpses of bathsheba which we share with her lover gabriel oak the sluggish day began to break he heard the steps of a horse at the foot of the hill and soon there appeared in view an auburn pony with a girl on its back ascending by the path leading past the cattle shed here he ensconced himself and peeped through the loophole in the direction of the rider's approach she came up and looked around then on the other side of the hedge the path after passing the cowshed bisected the plantation it was not a bridle path merely a pedestrian track and the boughs spread horizontally at a height not greater than seven feet above the ground which made it impossible to ride erect beneath them the girl who wore no riding habit looked around for a moment as if to assure herself that all humanity was out of view then dexterously dropped backwards flat upon the pony's back her head over its tail her feet against its shoulder and her eyes to the sky the rapidity of her glide into this position was that of a kingfisher its noiselessness that of a hawk gabriel's eyes had scarcely been able to follow her the tall lank pony seemed used to such phenomena and ambled along unconcerned thus she passed under the level boughs she had no side saddle and it was very apparent that a firm seat upon the smooth leather beneath her was unattainable sideways springing to her accustomed perpendicular like a bowed sapling she seated herself in the manner demanded by the saddle though hardly expected of the woman an hour passed the girl returned properly seated now with a bag of bran in front of her on nearing the cattle shed she was met by a boy bringing a milking pail who held the reins of the pony while she slid off the boy led away the horse leaving the pail with the young woman soon soft spurts alternating with loud spurts came in regular succession from within the shed they were the sounds of a person milking a cow gabriel took the lost hat in his hand and waited beside the path she would follow in leaving the hill she came the pail in one hand hanging against her knee the left arm was extended as a balance enough of it being shown bare to make oak wish that the event had happened in summer when the whole would have been revealed she seemed tall but the pail was a small one and the hedge diminutive hence making allowance for error by comparison with these she could have been not above the height to be chosen by women as best all features of consequence were severe and regular from the contours of her figure in its upper part she must have had a beautiful neck and shoulders but since her infancy nobody had ever seen them had she been put into a low dress she would have run and thrust her head into a bush yet she was not a shy girl by any means it was merely her instinct to draw the line dividing the seen from the unseen higher than they do in towns 
it is bathsheba whom we have seen here and whose story agrees with his i shall not tell bathsheba over again or do more than remind the reader that she does not marry the good gabriel oak till after she has married the unworthy sergeant troy whom her mad lover boldwood kills and so releases her to her right destiny with oak she is a girl of great good sense as well as beauty and of that practical turn of mind which goes with prettiness rather oftener than with plainness she has inherited a farm from her uncle and having been cheated by her manager she decides to manage it herself there is a delightful prospect of this side of bathsheba's character in the scene which passes between her and the farm servants to whom she makes her purpose known half an hour later bathsheba in finished dress and followed by liddy entered the upper end of the old hall to find that her men had all deposited themselves on a long form and a settle at the lower extremity she sat down at a table and opened the time-book pen in her hand with a canvas money-bag beside her from this she poured a small heap of coin liddy took up a position at her elbow and began to sew sometimes pausing and looking round or with the air of a privileged person taking up one of the half-sovereigns lying before her and admiringly surveying it as a work of art merely strictly preventing her countenance from expressing any wish to possess it as money now before i begin men said bathsheba i have two matters to speak of the first is that the bailiff is dismissed for thieving and that i have formed a resolution to have no bailiff at all but to manage everything with my own head and hands the men breathed an audible breath of amazement yes sir ma'am i mean said the person addressed i am the personal name of poor grass who is nothing in my own eye in the eye of other people well i don't say it though public thought will out what do you do on the farm i does carting things all the year and in seed time i shoots the rooks and sparrows and helps at pig killing sir how much to you please nine and nine pence and a good halfpenny where twas a bad one sir ma'am i mean quite correct now here are ten shillings in addition as a small present as i am a newcomer bathsheba blushed slightly at the sense of being generous in public and henry frey who had drawn up towards her chair lifted his eyebrows and fingers to express amazement on a small scale how much do i owe you that man in the corner what's your name continued bathsheba matthew moon ma'am said a singular framework of clothes with nothing of any consequence inside them which advanced with the toes in no definite direction forwards but turned in or out as they chanced to swing matthew mark did you say speak out i shall not hurt you inquired the young farmer kindly matthew moon ma'am said henry frey correctingly from behind her chair to which point he had edged himself matthew moon murmured bathsheba turning her bright eyes to the book ten and tuppence halfpenny is the sum put down to you i see yes missus said matthew as the rustle of wind among dead leaves here it is and ten shillings now the next andrew randall you are a new man i hear how came you to leave your last farm please ma'am please ma'am please em please em andrew randall here's yours finish thanking me in a day or two now the next laban tall you'll stay on working for me for you or anybody that pays me well ma'am replied the young married man true the man must live said a woman in the back quarter who had just entered with quicking pattens what woman is that bathsheba asked i be his lawful wife 
continued the voice with greater prominence of manner and tone oh you are said bathsheba well laban will you stay on yes he'll stay ma'am said again the shrill tongue of laban's lawful wife the names remaining were called in the same manner now i think i've done with you said bathsheba closing the book and shaking back a stray twine of hair no ma'am the new shepherd will want a man under him suggested henry frey trying to make himself official again by a sideway approach towards her chair oh he will who can he have young cain ball is a very good lad henry said and shepherd oak don't mind his youth he added turning with an apologetic smile to the shepherd who had just appeared on the scene and was now leaning against the door-post with his arms folded oh i don't mind that said gabriel how did cain come by such a name asked bathsheba oh you see mem his poor mother not being a scripture read woman made a mistake at his christening thinking twas abel kill cain and called him cain meaning abel all the time the parson put it right but twas too late for the name could never be got rid of in the parish tis very unfortunate for the boy very well then caney ball to be under shepherd and you quite understand your duties you i mean gabriel oak quite well i thank you miss everdeen said shepherd oak from the door-post if i don't i'll inquire gabriel was rather staggered by the remarkable coolness of her manner certainly nobody without previous information would have dreamt that oak and the handsome woman before whom he stood had ever been other than strangers she then rose but before retiring addressed a few words to them with a pretty dignity to which her morning dress added a soberness that was hardly to be found in the words themselves now mind you have a mistress instead of a master i don't yet know my powers or my talents in farming but i shall do my best and if you serve me well so shall i serve you don't any unfair ones among you if there are any such but i hope not suppose that because i'm a woman i don't understand the difference between bad goings-on and good and so good-night all good-night ma'am then this small thesmothete stepped from the table and surged out of the hall her black silk dress licking up a few straws and dragging them along with a scratching noise upon the floor liddy elevating her feelings to the occasion from a sense of grandeur floated off behind bathsheba with a milder dignity not entirely free from travesty and the door was closed this is bathsheba when her head is at work and her common sense another perspective of her when her heart is at work and her uncommon feeling is not edifying but it is doubtless as faithful it is that famous scene of sergeant troy showing bathsheba the broadsword exercise at eight o'clock this midsummer evening whilst the bristling ball of gold in the west still swept the tips of the ferns with its long luxuriant rays a soft brushing by of garments might have been heard among them and bathsheba appeared in their midst their soft feathery arms caressing her up to her shoulders now said troy producing the sword which as he raised it into the sunlight gleamed a sort of greeting like a living thing first we have four right and four left cuts four right and four left thrusts infantry cuts and guards are more interesting than ours to my mind but they are not so swashing they have seven cuts and three thrusts now i'll be more interesting and let you see some loose play giving all the cuts and points infantry and cavalry quicker than lightning and as promiscuously with just enough rule to regulate instinct and yet not to fetter it you are my antagonist with this difference from real warfare that i shall miss you every time by one hair's breadth or perhaps two mind you don't flinch whatever you do i'll be sure not to she said invincibly he pointed to about a yard in front of him 
bathsheba's adventurous spirit was beginning to find some grains of relish in these highly novel proceedings she took up her position as directed facing troy now just to learn whether you have pluck enough to let me do what i wish i'll give you a preliminary test he flourished the sword by way of introduction number two and the next thing of which she was conscious was that the point and blade of the sword were darting with a gleam towards her left side just above her hip then of their reappearance on her right side having apparently passed through her body the third item of consciousness was that of seeing the same sword perfectly clean and free from blood held vertically in troy's hand in the position technically called recover swords all was as quick as electricity oh she cried out in a fright pressing her hand to her side have you run me through no you have not whatever have you done i have not touched you said troy quietly it was mere sleight of hand the sword passed behind you now you are not afraid are you because if you are i can't perform i give my word that i will not only not hurt you but not once touch you i don't think i am afraid you are quite sure you will not hurt me oh no only stand as still as a statue now in an instant the atmosphere was transformed to bathsheba's eyes beams of light caught from the low sun's rays above around in front of her well nigh shut out earth and heaven all emitted in the marvellous evolutions of troy's reflecting blade which seemed everywhere at once and yet nowhere specially these circling gleams were accompanied by a keen rush that was almost a whistling also springing from all sides of her at once in short she was enclosed in a firmament of light and of sharp hisses resembling a skyfall of meteors close at hand it may safely be asserted with respect to the closeness of his cuts that had it been possible for the edge of the sword to leave in the air a permanent substance wherever it flew past the space left untouched would have been a complete mould of bathsheba's figure the hissing of the sword had ceased and he stopped entirely that outer loose lock of hair once tidying he said before she had moved or spoken wait i'll do it for you an arc of silver shone on her right side the sword had descended the lock dropped to the ground bravely borne said troy you didn't flinch a shade's thickness wonderful in a woman it was because i didn't expect it oh you have spoiled my hair only once more no no i am afraid of you indeed i am she cried but how could you chop off a curl of my hair with a sword that has no edge no edge this sword will shave like a razor look here he touched the palm of his hand with the blade and then lifting it showed her a thin shaving of scarf skin dangling therefrom two the first glimpse of paula power in the laodicean suggests a character as vividly as the first glimpse of bathsheba and gives us the sense of a heroine as thoroughly hardy esque though she is of such a different tradition and position it is not in the cool sequestered vale of life that paula power keeps the tenor of her way but in the midst of worldly interests and ambitions which beset her as the heiress of a self-made father who has made a great deal of money in the process of making himself he has left her in possession of de stancy castle where she lives with a daughter of the ancient house as her companion and friend and in charge of a baptist chapel which he built and bestowed on the congregation to which he belonged it is from filial piety rather than the other sort that paula has brought herself to the point of being baptized into this church for her ecclesiastical affiliations as a young lady of wealth culture and fashion or potential fashion would not otherwise have been with this unpicturesque and unworldly sect of dissenters she is presented to the reader in the moment of attempting to fulfil her pious duty and i think any reader will agree with me that her introduction is not less spectacular and impressive than that of bathsheba everdeen though the circumstances are altogether so different 
as in the case of bathsheba we share the vision of the heroine with her lover though now it is no such single nature as the shepherd oak but the complex personality not less sincere of the young architect somerset that is concerned somerset is down from london on a sketching excursion and has looked into the chapel at the close of a summer's day because he has happened to hear that there is to be a baptism in that strikingly ugly edifice he gazed into the lighted chapel made what had been an evening scene when he looked away from the landscape night itself on looking back but he could see enough to discover that a broom had driven up to the side door used by the young water-bearers and that a lady in white and black half mourning was in the act of alighting followed by what appeared to be a waiting woman carrying wraps they entered the vestry room of the chapel and the door was shut the service went on as before till at a certain moment the door between vestry and chapel was opened when a woman came out clothed in an ample robe of flowing white which descended to her feet she was rather tall than otherwise and the contour of her head and shoulders denoted a girl in the heyday of youth and activity his imagination stimulated by this beginning set about filling in the meagre outline with most attractive details she stood upon the brink of the pool and the minister descended the steps at its edge till the soles of his shoes were moistened with the water he turned to the young candidate but she did not follow him instead of doing so she remained rigid as a stone he stretched out his hand but she still showed reluctance till with some embarrassment he went back and spoke softly in her ear afterwards saying in a voice audible to all who were near you will descend she approached the edge looked into the water and gently turned away somerset could for the first time see her face the total dissimilarity between the expression of her lineaments and that of the countenances around her was not a little surprising and was productive of hypotheses without measure as to how she came there she was in fact emphatically a modern type of maidenhood and she looked ultra-modern by reason of her environment a presumably sophisticated being among the simple ones not wickedly so but one who knew life fairly well for her age and you refuse said the astonished minister as she still stood immovable on the brink of the pool he added to the force of his pleading by persuasively taking her sleeve between his finger and thumb as if to draw her but she resented this by a quick movement of displeasure and he released her seeing that he had gone too far but my dear lady he whispered you promised consider your profession and that you stand in the eyes of the whole church as an exemplar of your faith i cannot help it she said trying to get away you came here with the intention to fulfil the word but i was mistaken then why did you come she tacitly implied that to be a question she did not care to answer please say no more to me i can wait no longer she murmured and hastened to withdraw but the minister was not without insight and he had seen that it would be useless to say more the crestfallen old man had to turn round upon the congregation and declare officially that the baptism was postponed she passed through the door into the vestry his face had a severe and even denunciatory look as he gave out his text and somerset began to understand that this meant mischief to the person who had caused the hitch the sermon straightway began and went on and it was soon apparent that the commentary was to be no less forcible than the text it was also apparent that the words were virtually not directed forward in the line in which they were uttered but through the chink of the vestry door that had stood slightly ajar since the exit of the young lady at this moment there was not in the whole chapel a person whose imagination was not centred on what was invisibly taking place within the vestry door the thunder of the minister's eloquence echoed of course through the sisters cavern of retreat no less than round the public assembly 
what she was doing inside there whether listening contritely or heartily hastening to get away from the chapel and all it contained was obviously the thought of each member the sermon ended the minister wiped his streaming face and turned down his cuffs and nods and sagacious glances went round for somerset there was but one scene the imagined scene of the girl herself as she sat alone in the vestry the fervent congregation rose to sing again and then somerset heard a slight noise on his left hand which caused him to turn his head the broom which had retired into the field to wait was back again at the door the subject of his rumination came out from the chapel not in her mystic robe of white but dressed in ordinary fashionable costume followed as before by the attendant with other articles of clothing on her arm including the white gown somerset fancied that the younger woman was drying her eyes with her handkerchief but there was not much time to see they quickly entered the carriage and it moved on then a cat suddenly mewed and he saw a white persian standing forlorn where the carriage had been the door was opened the cat taken in and the carriage rolled away three i feel a kind of defeat in my efforts to impart a conception of mr hardy's heroines by the quotation of this or that passage they live so much more in what they think and feel and say than in what they do that no scene or incident can do them justice as a scene or incident might in the case of charles reed's heroines for instance many scenes many incidents in which the hardy heroines figure remain vivid in the mind but if taken from the context they do not tell the story as one would think this may happen because the psychological texture of the story is as close and strong as the sociological texture is loose and slight i have already intimated my sense of the unimportance of this in mr hardy's fiction as compared with the recognition of the deeper relations of human beings we scarcely think of his people as of this calling or that station at all after the first moment and even in making their acquaintance we do not concern ourselves with the part attributed to them in society we often wholly forget it though we never lose the sense of their intense reality if any one will contrast the sense of life imparted by a novel of trollope say with that given by a novel of mr hardy i believe he will get my meaning these masters are of the same sincerity and veracity but trollope reaches man through society and mr hardy finds him in nature there is a great deal of society in the laodicean people do things in the forms and customs that constitute the history of everyday life but through the stream of these little ordinary events pulses the current of poetry and passion and bears the lovers along in a splendid isolation from the events pressing upon them from all sides for instance but like all the other instances this will be imperfect paula has been giving a sort of garden party at de stancy castle which somerset as her architect is restoring in parts and they have been dancing in the marquee with paula's guests just before a shower breaks upon it the dance was over and he had retired with paula to the back of the tent when another faint flash of lightning was visible through an opening she lifted the canvas and looked out somerset looking out behind her another dance was begun and being on this account left out of notice somerset did not hasten to leave paula's side i think they begin to feel the heat she said a little ventilation would do no harm he flung back the tent door where he stood and the light shone out upon the grass i must go to the drawing-room soon she added they will begin to leave shortly it is not late the thunder-cloud has made it seem dark see there a line of pale yellow stretches along the horizon from west to north that's evening not gone yet shall we go into the fresh air for a minute she seemed to signify assent and he stepped off the tent floor upon the ground she stepped off also the air out of doors had not cooled and without definitely choosing a direction they found themselves approaching a little wooden tea-house that stood on the lawn a few yards off arrived here they turned and regarded the tent they had just left and listened to the strains that came from within it i feel more at ease now said paula so do i said somerset 
i mean she added in an undeceiving tone because i saw mrs goodman enter the tent again just as we came out here so i have no further responsibility i meant something quite different try to guess what she teasingly demurred finally breaking the silence by saying the rain is come at last as great drops began to fall upon the ground with a smack like pellets of clay in a moment the storm poured down with sudden violence and they drew further back into the summer-house the side of the tent from which they had emerged still remained open the rain streaming down between their eyes and the lighted interior of the marquee like a tissue of glass threads the brilliant forms of the dancers passing and repassing behind the watery screen as if they were people in an enchanted submarine palace how happy they are said paula they don't even know that it is raining i am so glad that my aunt had the tent lined otherwise such a downpour would have gone clean through it the thunderstorm showed no symptoms of abatement and the music and dancing went on more merrily than ever we cannot go in said somerset and we cannot shout for umbrellas we will stay here till it is over will we not yes she said if you care to ah what is it only a big drop came upon my head let us stand further in her hand was hanging by her side and somerset's was close by he took it and she did not draw it away thus they stood a long while the rain hissing down upon the grass plot and not a soul being visible outside the dancing tent save themselves may i call you paula asked he yes occasionally she murmured dear paula may i call you that oh no not yet but you know i love you he insisted i can give a shrewd guess she said slyly and shall i love you always if you wish to and will you love me paula did not reply will you paula he repeated you may love me but don't you love me in return i love you to love me won't you say anything more explicit not a single word somerset emitted half a sigh he wished he had been more demonstrative yet felt that this passive way of assenting was as much as he could hope for had there been anything cold in her passivity he might have felt repressed but her stillness suggested a stillness of motion imperceptible from its intensity we must go in said she the rain is almost over and there is no longer any excuse for this somerset bent his lips towards hers no said the fair puritan decisively why not he asked nobody ever has but expostulated somerset to everything there is a season and the season for this is not just now she answered walking away four yes this instance like all the others is imperfect and inadequate to the message it is meant to bear in my criticism and i have to blame myself for letting a subordinate book so largely represent the very great and singular artist i have attempted to deal with he has reached the height of his power i think in his tremendous novel jude the obscure where fate so humorous and at the worst ironical in so many of his stories turns luridly tragical no greater and truer book has been written in our time or any and yet jude if it were to be quoted from significantly is not to be quoted from in this company at all without risk to the critic of sharing the misunderstanding which befell the author it may be safely said however or at any rate it shall be ventured that in jude and in the morbid half-crazed endeavour of the heroine to atone by her own sacrifice for the cursed spite of conditions the novelist makes an offering at the shrine of the womanly which ought to appease that deity if ever it has been offended by a sense of slight or mocking in his adoration it is not a book which could harm innocence evil itself cannot harm innocence but certainly it is not a book for inexperience for experience however it is full of wisdom and for the heart and mind open to the fearful implications of such a history and temperament as sue broadheads it has problems of tremendous appeal it would be worthy the study of experience if for nothing else than as the work of a talent there 
eventuating in its ultimate section thirty four of heroines of fiction by william dean howells this librivox recording is in the public domain william black's gertrude white in my sense of at least partial defeat by the heroines of mr hardy who have suffered me to represent them mainly in some of their lighter moments i am sufficiently humiliated to make a confession that i would rather not have made i confess that i never read a novel of blackmore's or a novel of stevenson's or more than one novel of mr george meredith's and though i might qualify myself to speak of their heroines by taking a course of their fiction i am afraid that my appreciation would have a perfunctory look out of keeping with the prevailing complexion of these studies i might learn what those ladies were like but i should have no associations with them from the past no remembered passion and if it is not now too late with me to form a passion for a new heroine it would not be perhaps becoming One in the case of stevenson i am hardly a great loser i fancy unless i am wrong in supposing his romances are mostly stories of adventure such as the heroine does not best develop in as i have before intimated she cannot make her peculiar powers felt in the highest degree by the hero who is saving her life or defending her honour she requires the safety and quiet of normal conditions for the last effect of her charm which is the translation of everyday life into a supernal ecstasy i dare say i could not make so good my defence in the case of blackmore for lorna doone is a heroine whose adorers simply troop at her heels i can only regret that i have not her acquaintance and sigh that it seems too late to make it as for mr george meredith's heroines my experience is confined to such of them as may be met in beauchamp's career and from that i have no recollection of them by name i was barely fifty when i read the book but one begins to forget names so early i do however have the impression that they talked a great deal as mr meredith writes though they shared this foible with all the other characters and i could not greatly blame them since his writing gave me the sense of a singularly powerful mind and generous spirit i thought beauchamp's career a magnificent piece of intellectuation fused through and through by electrical emotion but i could not get farther with the author though i tried one novel of his after another as one votary of his after another solemnly promised me conversion in the interest of my soul's salvation i remained and i still remain unable to reconcile my aesthetics with his though i uncover to his ethics as i know them in beauchamp's career he appears to me a powerful wilful talent who could have flourished into critical acceptance as a novelist only in an atmosphere of such aesthetic anarchy as wraps the british isles but he may some day appear differently to me through my greater knowledge of him this has happened to me with mr george moore whom i long shied off from because i fancied him doing over again from the realistic formula the work of m zola m zola seemed doing it so fully that i thought myself in no need of mr george moore but as esther water showed me how mistaken i was that is a great book and if it had not appeared in an age which has been spoiled by great fictions it would have been prized as one of the greatest i know that it won celebrity of even the popular sort and that it received critical recognition 
but it has not achieved the lasting credit which is its due its very merits forbid me to study it here for the sad plain naked truth about life is apt to shock or to make people think they are shocked and in its facts it is sometimes outside of those decorums of anglo-saxon fiction which i have been treating as the decencies so is the very powerful group of studies which the author calls the celibates and which the mere name of brings back my strong emotion in reading them the three differing types of the womanly presented there are of that novelty and reality in which life abounds but which we suppose exhausted because fiction like history so commonly repeats itself mr moore's fiction is not like history in this and it is probably more like memoir pour servir than like history in its way of dealing with the unupholstered human soul but i am aware that the upholstered soul is more presentable to mixed companies especially when there are young people present and so i leave this author's heroines out of my series though i cannot leave them out of my mind and i wish to make my manners to what i think their prodigious veracity two there is no such embarrassment as i have here hastened to escape in dealing with the heroines of william black who are quite of the anglo-saxon tradition they are nice girls even when they are naughty as some of them are or at least they do not misbehave beyond the bounds of convention they flirt but unless flirtation is a sin they do not sin and they are not sinned against very direly they began rather simply and naturally in the course of a journey in a phaeton whose strange adventures once pleased so greatly and they almost ended and rather insipidly in the voyage of a houseboat the two novels indicated will occur to most readers whose novel reading extended from eighteen seventy to eighteen ninety but in the interval there were other novels of blacks which signalized his deeper knowledge of human and of woman nature and his growing dramatic power this power was apt at times to disperse itself in the sobs and tears of hysterical emotion but there is no doubt that short of such climaxes it was a power it relaxed rather too often in the description of natural scenery and killed too many salmon and quoted too much gaelic but still it was power in such a story as madcap violet it triumphed in character then new to fiction and of interesting actuality in life and in macleod of dare it went deeper and came up with stronger contrasts to truly tragical purpose macleod of dare seems to have been the highest as well as deepest reach of the author's art for after it he continued to repeat himself with varying effect and returned ultimately to that earlier method and manner which won him his public it was never the best public never the most critical and yet his work had friends of the most critical instincts and the most fastidious tastes who accepted him with reservation but without patronage a sense of his innate manliness forbade that and upon the whole he enjoyed while he lived a dignified popularity which since his death has not quite become fame yet his work is so very much better than that of novelists who in a time of inferior fiction did achieve remembrance that one resents for him the sort of unjust neglect which it has fallen into it was his fate or his accident to begin writing naturalistic fiction of the old-fashioned english kind and to establish himself as a lover of real life just before the violent campaign for naturalism began on the continent where almost nothing that was nice and almost everything that was nasty was accounted natural he continued writing in his own way amidst the impassioned struggle against romanticism in france spain and italy and remained no more affected by the polemics of m zola than by the perfection of flaubert or maupassant the great the matchless fiction of russia did not move him from his course and his constant english public stood by him while the more fitful favour of his american friends did not always fail him 
he saw the fall of the dickens worship and the rise of the thackeray doubt trollope outlived himself and george eliot died after the distinct decline of her too deeply ethicized art and there was a moment when william black might have been recognized as the leading writer of english fiction unless we are to count some novelists of finer skill and greater force in the american condition of english fiction but unhappily for his supremacy the vaster and deeper and fresher naturalism of mr thomas hardy began to make itself known and william black's chance was gone there was no later chance and he was left to end his career to the strains of the muted second violin which formed the saddest music in the world to the performer's ear three no writers could be more opposite in their realism than the novelist whom i have just named and black both are poets and both are apt to seek in nature the charm they make us feel but the final sense of the mystery and loveliness imparted by mr hardy is of something which his heroine confers upon her circumstance and in black's fiction it seems something which she derives from it i am now thinking chiefly of such a girl as gertrude white in macleod of dare who is as dependent upon society for means of self-expression as any heroine i know and yet is as genuine a personality as may be met in fiction she was recognized with an art which was perhaps at its best in her portrayal and she had a freshness which is now gone from her type she belongs to that social moment since satirized beyond recall when aesthetics began to be so generally received into society that society seemed to have become aesthetical in that instant of fine confusion the stage especially went into society so much that it might well appear that society had gone upon the stage and a brilliant and beautiful young actress like gertrude white meeting sir keith macleod at a fashionable house would never have suggested the theatre to the young highlander dropped down in london from his native isles but you have seen our elm our own elm said mrs ross who was arranging some azaleas that had just been sent her we are very proud of our elm gertrude will you take sir keith to see our noble elm he had almost forgotten who gertrude was but the next second he recognized the low and almost timid voice that said will you come this way then sir keith he turned and found that it was miss white who spoke how was it that this girl who was only a girl seemed to do things so easily and gently and naturally without any trace of embarrassment or self-consciousness he followed her and knew not which to admire the more the careless simplicity of her manner or the singular symmetry of her tall and slender figure he had never seen any statue or any picture in any book to be compared with this woman who was so fine and rare and delicate that she seemed only a beautiful tall flower in this garden of flowers there was a strange simplicity too about her dress a plain tight-fitting tight-sleeved dress of unrelieved black her only adornment being some bands of big blue beads worn loosely round the neck the black figure in this shimmer of rose pink and gold and flowers was effective enough but even the finest of pictures or the finest of statues has not the subtle attraction of a graceful carriage but cloud had never seen any woman walk as this woman walked in so stately and yet so simple a way from mrs ross's chief drawing-room they passed into an ante drawing room which was partly a passage and partly a conservatory on the window side were some rows of cape heaths look at this beautiful heath mrs ross is very proud of her heaths the small white fingers scarcely touched the beautiful blossoms of the plant but which were the more palely roseate and waxen if one were to grasp that hand in some sudden moment of entreaty in the sharp joy of reconciliation in the agony of farewell would it not be crushed like a frail flower 
this is our elm said she lightly mrs ross and i regard it as our own we have sketched it so often they had emerged from the conservatory into a small square room which was practically a continuation of the drawing-room but which was decorated in pale blue and silver and filled with a lot of knick-knacks that showed it was doubtless mrs ross's boudoir and out there in the clear june sunshine lay the broad green sward behind prince's gate with the one splendid elm spreading its broad branches into the blue sky and throwing a soft shadow on the corner of the gardens next to the house how sweet and still it was as still as the calm clear light in this girl's eyes there was no passion there and no trouble only the light of a june day and of blue skies and a peaceful soul she rested the tips of her fingers on a small rosewood table that stood by the window surely if a spirit ever lived in any table the wood of this table must have thrilled to its core the cloud in his dreaming did not dream her an actress but because her very life was an art she was not less acting now than she was the night of the same day when he saw her on the stage in a comedy which had been a very stupid conventional play till she appeared suddenly his heart seemed to stand still altogether it was a light glad laugh the sound of a voice he knew that seemed to have pierced him as with a rifle ball and at the same moment from the green shimmer of foliage in the balcony there stepped into the glare of the hall a young girl with life and laughter and a merry carelessness in her face and eyes she threw her arm around her mother's neck and kissed her she bowed to the legal person she flung her garden hat on to a couch and got up on a chair to get fresh seed put in for her canary it was all done so simply and naturally and gracefully that in an instant a fire of life and reality sprang into the whole of this sham thing the woman was no longer a marionette but the anguish-stricken mother of this gay and heedless girl and when the daughter jumped down from the chair again her canary on her finger and when she came forward to pet and caress and remonstrate with her mother and when the glare of the lights flashed on the merry eyes and on the white teeth and laughing lips there was no longer any doubt possible the cloud's face was quite pale he took the programme from Algavie's hand and for a minute or two stared mechanically at the name of miss gertrude white printed on the pink tinted paper again she is acting but neither more nor less consciously when macleod comes to luncheon and she makes the maid give her the salad to dress while the keen eyes of her young sister divine her and deride her there is no use making any pretence said she sharply you know quite well why you are making that salad dressing did you never see me make salad dressing before said the other quite as sharply you know it is simply because sir keith macleod is coming to lunch i forgot all about it oh and that's why you had the clean curtains put up yesterday what else had this precocious brain ferreted out yes and that's why you bought papa a new necktie continued the tormentor and then she added triumphantly but he hasn't put it on this morning ha huh, gertie a calm and dignified silence is the best answer to the fiendishness of thirteen miss white went on with the making of the salad dressing she was considered very clever at it a smart young maid-servant very trimly dressed made her appearance sir keith macleod miss said she oh gertie you're caught muttered the fiend but miss white was equal to the occasion the small white fingers plied the fork without a tremor ask him to step this way please she said and then the subtle imagination of this demon of thirteen jumped to another conclusion oh gertie you want to show him that you are a good housekeeper that you can make salad for 
it will be remembered that macleod is instantly in love with gertrude and has no thought but of marrying her and making her leave the stage he has found her in society intellectually inferior to her of course but rich and refined and delicately appreciative of such bric-a-brac as she and though he is a splendid young fellow with generous possibilities of lifelong adoration for the woman he loves he has no conception of the sacrifice she must make in giving up her career to be the wife of a highland chieftain on the wild scottish shore she has no conception of it either when she promises her selfish old father the collector of other bric-a-brac than she does not like the match and consents unwillingly that she shall leave the life for which he has had her so carefully trained and in which her success has so far been so brilliant i will beg you to remember gertie he remarked with some dignity that i did not make you an actress if that is what you imply if it had not been entirely your own wish i should never have encouraged you and i think it shows great ingratitude not only to me but to the public also that when you have succeeded in obtaining a position such as any woman in the country might envy you treat your good fortune with indifference and show nothing but discontent i cannot tell what has come over you of late you ought certainly to be the last to say anything against a profession that has gained for you such a large share of public favour public favour she said with a bitter laugh who is the favourite of the public in this very town why the girl that plays in that farce who smokes a cigarette and walks round the stage like a man and dances a breakdown why wasn't i taught to dance breakdowns here once more doubtless the girl is unconsciously acting and it is not till she has seen macleod on his native heath and among the clansmen to whom he is a demigod in a semi-feudal almost semi-barbarous environment that she is fully awakened to the reality she sees no beauty or grandeur in the life to which his love destines her as remorselessly as if it were hate and she finds that she cannot give up all that she has made herself in the world that seems to her great and worth winning she begins to pull at the leash which binds her and when she gets back to london she breaks with macleod then he ventures upon that wild that mad scheme of luring her aboard his yacht and carrying her off to the highlands to make her his wife against her will but not as he believes against her love you cannot go ashore gertrude he repeated we have already left Aerith. gertie gertie he continued for she was struck dumb with a sudden terror don't you understand now i have stolen you away from yourself there was but the one thing left the one way of saving you and you will forgive me gertie when you understand it all she was gradually recovering from her terror she did understand it now and he was not ill at all oh you coward you coward you coward she exclaimed with a blaze of fury in her eyes and i was to confer a kindness on you alas kindness but you dare not do this thing i tell you you dare not do it i demand to be put on shore at once do you hear me she turned wildly round as if to seek for some way to escape the door of the ladies cabin stood open the daylight was streaming down into that cheerful little place there were some flowers on the dressing-table but the way by which she had descended was barred over and dark she faced him again and her eyes were full of fierce indignation and anger she drew herself up to her full height she overwhelmed him with taunts and reproaches and scorn that was a splendid piece of acting seeing that it had never been rehearsed he stood unmoved before all this theatrical rage oh yes you were proud of your name she was saying with bitter emphasis and i thought you belonged to a race of gentlemen to whom lying was unknown and you were no longer murderous and revengeful but you can take your revenge on a woman for all that and you asked me to come and see you because you are ill and you have laid a trap like a coward and if i am what you say gertie said he quite gently it is the love of you that has made me that oh you do not know she saw nothing of the lines that pain had written on this man's face she recognized nothing of the very majesty of grief in the hopeless eyes he was only her jailer her enemy of course of course said she it is the woman it is always the woman who is in fault that is a manly thing to put the blame on the woman 
and it is a manly thing to take your revenge on a woman i thought when a man had a rival that it was his rival whom he sought out but you you kept out of the way he strode forward and caught her by the wrist there was a look in his face that for a second terrified her into silence gerty said he i warn you do not mention that man to me now or at any time or it will be bad for him and you she twisted her hand from his grasp how dare you come near me she cried as is well known the yacht is wrecked and they are drowned together and there is an implication that somehow macleod is a fine fellow and that gertrude white is not a good girl and has met a merited fate but i do not know why she is not a good girl the charge against her so far as it is made out is brought by her sister carrie who accuses her of flirting with macleod she certainly did nothing to prevent his loving her no doubt because she was in love with him but when she found that his love demanded more of her than she could give she did nothing worse than try to break her engagement under the circumstances that was the best thing to do and if she wished to break it gently and not roughly that was not proof of a bad heart in her but a good one she had the histrionic nature but that is not necessarily an insincere nature though it means the dangerous power of self-deception imaginably the subjective process of gertrude white's tragedy was the capacity of being charmed by what was new and picturesque in macleod and of not being sufficiently repelled by his latent race savagery which she latently feared she could figure the world and the mimic world well lost for love with him on the barren crag to which he invited her at the cost of all she had hitherto held dear but when she saw the barren crag she would over-realize the immense sacrifice demanded of her and her recoil would be the imperative mandate of what was the law of her being she could not change that law which was not an evil law though it set the artist instinct against the woman instinct and the lesson of her experience is not that you must not be an artist if you are a woman but that if you are a man in love with that kind of woman you must count upon her duplex instinct which is by no means duplicity if you offer her the fulfilment of one instinct you must leave her to fulfil the other and to demand its extirpation is stupid as well as cruel the cloud of dare was both stupid and cruel though he was so fine and generous and brave if we consider the story of his love tragedy as something that simply happened through the war of his temperament with that of the woman he loved then it is a great tragedy of the quality of the greek destiny play but if we regard it as a morality it is weak and foolish unless it teaches that macleod was wrong and gertrude was right it is enough for a man to ask that a woman shall merge her woman life in his and more than most men can fully justify in marriage but that she shall lose her artist life too is asking something monstrous whenever they talk of this sacrifice which macleod requires the girl tries tenderly to make him understand how vital the sacrifice is but she cannot he remains the true simple masterful soul who thinks he is asking something wholly fit and proper for a husband to ask we have no hint of the author's feeling except so far as it may appear in his obvious fondness for macleod and his willingness to depreciate gertrude white he does not weaken so far as to use thackeray's ironical method with her though he applies it now and then to her sarcastic little sister but he loses the greater opportunity in the less when he rejects the subjective for the objective tragedy it wrings the reader's heart to have the heroine die with her lover but it would be better than heartbreak for him if he could realize her living with a husband for whom she had given up too much that would set him thinking and though a reader does not like to think it is often the best thing he can do to feel is comparatively section thirty five of heroines of fiction by william dean howells this librivox recording is in the public domain mr bret hart's miggles 
and mr t b aldrich's marjorie daw so far in these explorations of anglo-saxon fiction we have come upon only three american novelists apparently whose heroines may match with those of the english novelists such a fact may be accounted for upon a theory wounding to our patriotism if we like the pain or it may be more gratifyingly explained upon the ground that during the past century the english novelists have probably outnumbered ours quite in the proportion of their representation here besides the heroine is a flower of slow growth which thrives best in a temperate air and a soil mellowed by long cultivation our heroines compared with the english are wilding offshoots of a sylvan sweetness and grace and a fresh loveliness at their best and at their second best such as actual women are much too good for men no doubt but not such as are easily gathered in this sort of florist's window they are scattered widely in a thousand short stories all over the north east south and west and the research that would give a just notion of their quantitative fascination would form a complete study of that branch of our fiction one the difficulty of presenting the short story heroine will be realized by the faithful reader of miss sarah o jewett's exquisite tales and sketches to name a single and supreme example in the case of the more objective heroines of such a writer as bret harte one recalls out of the whole number of his more conventionalized types his miggles who belongs rather with the edifying magdalens of the mining communities than with the sinuous and ophidian group of his politer ladies too recognizably descended from the heroines of charles reeve neither sort forms the fort of a writer who stamped his peculiar literary personality upon the fancy of his generation so vigorously and who still keeps so large a public faithful to him he is at his strongest with his men and of his two kinds of women his miggle seems at least in this retrospect his prime invention it will be remembered by my elder readers at least how the storm-bound passengers of yuba bill's mountain stage take refuge in her wayside cabin during her absence and before her return have a dull quarter of an hour there in the company of the speechless paralytic to whom miggles is dedicating the afternoon of her life because he has helped her pass the forenoon more gaily if not so exemplarily and has as she says in her brief explanation spent a heap of money on her bill had scarcely ceased growling before we heard a quick step upon the porch the trailing of a wet skirt the door was flung open and with a flash of white teeth a sparkle of dark eyes and an utter absence of ceremony or diffidence a young woman entered shut the door and panting leaned back against it oh if you please i'm miggles and this was miggles this bright-eyed full-throated young woman whose wet gown of coarse blue stuff could not hide the beauty of the feminine curves to which it clung from the chestnut crown of whose head topped by a man's oil skin sou'wester to the little feet and ankles hidden somewhere in the recesses of her boy's brogans all was grace this was miggles laughing at us too in the most airy frank off-hand manner imaginable 
you see boys said she quite out of breath and holding one little hand against her side quite unheeding the speechless discomfiture of our party or the complete demoralization of yuba bill whose features had relaxed into an expression of gratuitous and imbecile cheerfulness you see boys i was more'n two miles away when you passed down the road i thought you might pull up here and so i ran the whole way knowing nobody was home but jim and and i'm out of breath and that lets me out and here miggles caught her dripping oilskin hat from her head with a mischievous swirl that scattered a shower of raindrops over us attempted to put back her hair dropped two hairpins in the attempt laughed and sat down beside yuba bill with her hands crossed lightly on her lap the judge recovered himself first and essayed an extravagant compliment i'll trouble you for that hairpin said miggles gravely half a dozen hands were eagerly stretched forward the missing hairpin was restored to its fair owner and miggles crossing the room looked keenly in the face of the invalid the solemn eyes looked back at hers with an expression we had never seen before life and intelligence seemed to struggle back into the rugged face miggles laughed again it was a singularly eloquent laugh and turned her black eyes and white teeth once more towards us this inflicted person is hesitated the judge jim said miggles your father no brother no husband miggles darted a quick half defiant glance at the two lady passengers who i had noticed did not participate in the general masculine admiration of miggles and said gravely no it's jim there was an awkward pause the lady passengers moved closer to each other the washoe husband looked abstractedly at the fire and the tall man apparently turned his eyes inward for self-support at this emergency but miggles's laugh which was very infectious broke the silence come she said briskly you must be hungry who'll bear a hand to help me get tea the literary epoch of miggles is early traceable in certain little touches she is of that romanticistic generation which mr hart himself has never outlived and which we would hardly have him outlive in her time good criminals abounded and ladies with pasts were of a present behaviour so self-devoted that they could often put their unerring sisters to the blush they are rarer now and even on the stage their histories seem rather more to characterize them but one likes to believe that there are miggleses in the world and life is often so illogical that it is not impossible it is a case which we have to suppose but we cannot complain of the terms in which mr hart asks us to suppose it they are amusing and they are touching and according to the simple ethics of the period they are even improving when it comes time for miggles's involuntary and unexpected guests to seek such rest as they may find under her roof she shows the ladies into the one other room which imaginably their propriety makes too hot for their hostess at any rate she soon reappears in the midst of an animated debate concerning her history among the men but not apparently the same miggles who a few hours before had flashed upon us her eyes were downcast and as she hesitated for a moment on the threshold with a blanket on her arm she seemed to have left behind her the frank fearlessness which had charmed us a moment before coming into the room she drew a low stool beside the paralytic's chair sat down drew the blanket over her shoulders and saying if it's all the same to you boys as we're rather crowded i'll stop here to-night took the invalid's withered hand in her own and turned her eyes upon the dying fire 
an instinctive feeling that this was only premonitory to more confidential relations and perhaps some shame at our previous curiosity kept us silent the rain still beat upon the roof wandering gusts of wind stirred the embers into momentary brightness until in a lull of the elements miggles suddenly lifted up her head and throwing her hair over her shoulder turned her face upon the group and asked is there any of you that knows me there was no reply think again i lived at marysville in fifty three everybody knew me there and everybody had the right to know me i kept the polka saloon until i came to live with jim that's six years ago perhaps i've changed some the absence of recognition may have disconcerted her she turned her head to the fire again and it was some seconds before she again spoke and then more rapidly well you see i thought some of you must have known me there's no great harm done anyway what i was going to say was this jim here she took his hand in both of hers as she spoke used to know me if you didn't and spent a heap of money upon me i reckon he spent all he had and one day it's six years ago this winter jim came into my back room sat down on my sofa like as you see him in that chair and never moved again without help he was struck all of a heap and never seemed to know what ailed him the doctors came and said as how it was caused all along of his way of life for jim was mighty free and wild-like and that he would never get better and couldn't last long anyway they advised me to send him to frisco to the hospital for he was no good to any one and would be a baby all his life perhaps it was something in jim's eye perhaps it was that i never had a baby but i said no i was rich then for i was popular with everybody gentlemen like yourself sir came to see me and i sold out my business and bought this year place because it was sort of out of the way of travel you see and i brought my baby here with a woman's intuitive tact and poetry she had as she spoke slowly shifted her position so as to bring the mute figure of the ruined man between her and her audience hiding in the shadow behind it as if she offered it as a tacit apology for her actions hidden in the darkness but still holding his hand she went on the folks about here are very kind said miggles after a pause coming a little into the light again the men from the fork used to hang around here until they found they wasn't wanted and the women are kind and don't call and jim here said miggles with her old laugh again and coming quite out into the firelight jim why boys you would admire to see how much he knows for a man like him sometimes i bring him flowers and he looks at em just as natural as if he knew em and times when we're sitting alone i read him those things on the wall why lord said miggles with her frank laugh i've read him that whole side of the house this winter there never was such a man for reading as jim why asked the judge do you not marry this man to whom you have devoted your youthful life well you see said miggles it would be playing it rather low down on jim to take advantage of his being so helpless and then too if we were man and wife now we'd both know that i was bound to do what i do now of my own accord but you are young yet and attractive it's getting late said miggles gravely and you'd better all turn in good-night boys and throwing the blanket over her head miggles laid herself down beside jim's chair her head pillowed on the low stool that held his feet and spoke no more the fire slowly faded from the hearth we each sought our blankets in silence and presently there was no sound in the long room but the pattering of the rain upon the roof and the heavy breathing of the sleepers two of course in a certain way no heroine has ever been the whole entrancing race exists only by an agreement between author and reader and if the personality imagined is pleasing the author may make his own terms with the reader 
but he had better not push the reader too far the reader's credulity is great but it is possible to exhaust it and for that reason many heroines of the past who were impossibly or exorbitantly conditioned have ceased to be they were of a fashion or of a mood of feeling and the fashion or the mood has changed once we accepted such heroines as miggles because they were the fashion but now we can accept them no longer because they are not the fashion the great matter for the author who will have his heroine last in the reader's fancy is to condition her so that to any mood she shall be easily imaginable and one has not to recur to some outworn humour in order to imagine her then he may tell us what he will of her he may say not only that she no longer lives but that she never lived still we rehabilitate her and she lives on mr t b aldrich went to this length in the case of his marjorie daw she so far as i know is the only heroine in the whole range of fiction who perishes under the hand of her creator yet she does not pass but continues vividly present in the reader's consciousness the first effect of the brilliant sketch in which she has her being is that of irreparable loss but this is not the last effect one has a personal grief in learning that marjorie daw never existed save in the fancy of the fancied narrator she does not survive in that tacit make-believe of author and reader which is the convention of fiction she is destroyed yet she persists and haunts the memory with an immortal loveliness sometimes in the morning and oftener in the afternoon when the sun has withdrawn from that part of the mansion a young woman appears on the piazza with some penelope web of embroidery in her hand or a book there is a hammock over there of pineapple fibre it looks from here a hammock is very becoming when one is eighteen and has golden hair and dark eyes and an emerald-coloured illusion dress looped up after the fashion of a dresden china shepherdess and is chasse like a belle of the time of louis quatorze all this splendour goes into that hammock and sways there like a pond lily in the golden afternoon the girl is invented it will be remembered out of the air to amuse the intolerable leisure of a young fellow laid up with a broken leg and the friend who invents her becomes gradually so interested in her characterization and the sick man's infatuation with her that he constructs a personality quite as appreciable to the reader she swings in the hammock and reads she plays croquet she listens sympathetically to her friend's accounts of the invalid she surprises herself in a dawning passion for the sufferer and then she is locked up by her irascible old father it is at this point that john fleming having impatiently reduced the correspondence with edward delany from letters to telegrams bursts all restraints and flies to the supposed habitat of the heroine to find that there is no such heroine no such house and no such hammock as edward delany's two creative powers have invented it is a bewitching little romance almost of the miniature dimensions of a conceit but it is as filling to the reader as most long novels and is of an abiding flavour piquant beyond that of any but a very few in fact marjorie daw who by the remorseful confession of her supposed inventor has never lived has outlived myriads of heroines whose reality has never Section 36 of Heroines of Fiction by William Dean Howells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
mr g w cable's aurora and clotilde nancanoo the heroines of mr cable's admirable novel the grandissimes could be proved at least to the satisfaction of their present elderly adorer easily first among the imaginary ladies with whose sweetness novelists have enriched and enlarged our acquaintance but i should feel that i had neglected a prior claim if before speaking of them i did not pay my duty to the type of heroine who illumines with her pale wild rose beauty the sylvan scenes of miss murfree's mountain stories and who is fully developed while the pseudonym of charles egbert craddock still veiled the identity of the author it is a type varied according to circumstance into this character and that but primarily a type and not a character and so no doubt more responsive to the social and personal facts from which it was evolved a sad shy almost elusive presence in the savage rudeness of the environment sometimes a daughter sometimes a young wife sometimes a sweetheart this heroine is always the same temperamentally with a sort of martyr grace and angelic innocence that touch the heart to pity rather than passion and keep the memory constant to an ideal of womanhood as true and beautiful as any conceived in fiction whatever the fortune of the author's work shall be no critic can hereafter recur to the art of her time and not feel the importance of her contribution to it in this type if in nothing else after the condition shall have long passed away it will remain to testify of the conditions for it could have been possible only in them and could have evolved its wistful loveliness only among their contrasts one i am not going to urge the right of mr cable to lead the southern writers who have done such notable work in fiction since the civil war there may very well be two opinions as to that and it is quite sufficient for my purpose here that the reader should agree with me concerning the positive excellence of the grandissimes that seems to me one of the few american fictions which one can think of without feeling the need of forbearance or without wishing in the interest of common honesty strongly to qualify one's praises of it ample yet shapely picturesque in time and place but essentially faithful to the facts of both romantic in character but realistic in characterization it abounds in varieties and contrasts of life mellowed but not blurred in the past to which they are attributed without accusing the author of slighting any of the rich possibilities of such an historic moment as that of the cession of louisiana to the united states by france and the union of the old province with the new nation against the prejudices of nearly all the native population one may note that the political situation is subordinated to the social and personal interests and the dark presence of slavery itself is perceptible not in any studied attitude but in the casual effects of character among the creole masters and the creole slaves it is well known that the author's presentation of this character dissatisfied to use a word of negative import for the expression of a positive resentment the descendants of the creole masters at least who fancied their race caricatured in the picture but the fact only testified to the outside spectator of the extreme difficulty the impossibility indeed of satisfying any people with any portraiture by an alien hand to such a spectator mr cable's studies of creole character in his new orleans of the early nineteenth century seem affectionately almost fondly appreciative and they convince of their justice by that internal evidence which it is as hard to corroborate as to overthrow 
no dearer or delightfuller figures have been presented by the observer of an alien race and religion than mr cable has offered in aurora and clotilde nancunu and in none does the artist seem to have penetrated more sympathetically the civilization so unlike his own which animated them with a witchery so diverse yet so equal without blaming his creole critics one wonders what would have satisfied them if they are not content with the vivid and lawless caprice of aurora the demure conscientious protesting fascination of clotilde in this mother and daughter the parental and filial relations are inverted with courageous fidelity to life where we as often see a judicious daughter holding an impulsive mother in check as the reverse clotilde is always shocked and troubled by her mother's wilful rashness and aurora who is not so very much her senior is always breaking bounds with a girlish impetuosity which is only aggravated by the attempt to restrain it these lovely ladies who are in their way ladies to their finger-tips and are as gentle in breeding as they are simple in circumstance shine to each other's advantage in the situations which contrast them and it is in such situations that they are mostly seen one such situation fixed itself in my mind at a first reading and has remained there unfaded during the twenty years that have since elapsed though i will not deny that i have several times refreshed my original sense of it the reader who knows the book will not have forgotten the passage descriptive of sieur frauenfeld's call upon the ladies in their little house when clotilde and he tried to ignore their unspoken love for each other in a sober discussion of the creole's peculiarities and aurora from whom their passion is of course less hidden than from themselves dashes irrelevantly into the conversation from time to time and turns the train of frauenfeld's ideas topsy-turvy it is all done with a delicacy a gracious tenderness enhanced by the author's sensitive rendering of the creole lady's accents in the english which they employ with the english-speaking young german pharmacist but one despairs in quoting it knowing that the quaint beauty of the characterization can be only suggested in such a fragment the ladies were at home aurora herself opened the door and clotilde came forward from the bright fireplace with a cordiality never before so unqualified there was something about these ladies in their simple but noble grace in their half gallic half classic beauty in a jocund buoyancy mated to an amiable dignity that made them appear to the scholar as though they had just bounded into life from the garlanded procession of some old fresco the resemblance was not a little helped on by the costume of the late revolution most acceptably chastened and belated by the distance from paris their black hair somewhat heavier on clotilde's head where it rippled once or twice was not at en grec and adorned only with the spoils of a nosegay given to clotilde by a chivalric small boy in the home of her music scholar we was expectin you since several days said clotilde as the three sat down before the fire frauenfeld in a cushioned chair whose moth-holes had been carefully darned and a few moments later the apothecary and both ladies the one as fond of the abstract as the other two were ignorant of the concrete were engaged in an animated running discussion on art society climate education frauenfeld had never before spent such an hour at its expiration he had so well held his own against both the others that the three had settled down to this sort of entertainment aurora would make an assertion or clotilde would ask a question and frauenfeld would present his opinions without the thought of a reservation either in himself or his hearers on their part they would sit in deep attention shielding their faces from the fire and responding to enunciations directly contrary to their convictions with an occasional yes or suddenly 
or of coes or prettier affirmation still a solemn drooping of the eyelids a slight compression of the lips and the low slow declination of the head the bane of all creole art effort we take up the apothecary's words at a point where clotilde was leaning forward and slightly frowning in an honest attempt to comprehend his condensed english the bane of all creole art effort so far as i have seen it is amateurism amateur murmured clotilde a little beclouded on the main word and distracted by a french difference of meaning but planting an elbow on one knee in the genuineness of her attention and responding with a bow that is to say said froenfeld apologizing for the homeliness of his further explanation by a smile a kind of ambitious indolence that lays very large eggs but can neither see the necessity for building a nest beforehand nor command the patience to hatch the eggs afterwards of coes said aurora it is a great pity said the sermonizer looking at the face of clotilde elongated in the brass and iron and after a pause nothing on earth can take the place of hard and patient labour but that in this community is not esteemed most sorts of it are contemned the humbler sorts are despised and the higher are regarded with mingled patronage and commiseration those creole is lazy said aurora that is a hard word to apply to those who do not consciously deserve it said froenfeld but if they could only wake up to the fact find it out themselves suddenly said clotilde sir froenfeld said aurora leaning her hand on her side some pipple thing it is those climade how you lag those climade i do not suppose replied the visitor there is a more delightful climate in the world ah both ladies at once in a low gracious tone of acknowledgment i think louisiana is a paradise me said aurora were you going thin such a hair she respired a sample of it were you going thin such a so ridge ground the weed in my bag yard is twenty-five feet high ah maman twenty-six said aurora correcting herself yes he said breaking a contemplative pause the climate is too comfortable and the soil too rich though i do not think it is entirely on their account that the people who enjoy them are so sadly in arrears to the civilized world he blushed with the fear that his talk was bookish and felt grateful to clotilde for seeming to understand his speech why do you find the reason is sieur froenfeld she asked i do not wish to philosophize he answered may go home may go ahead said both ladies settling themselves it is largely owing exclaimed froenfeld with sudden fervour to a defective organisation of society which keeps this community and will continue to keep it for an indefinite time to come entirely unprepared and disinclined to follow the course of modern thought of coes murmured aurora who had lost her bearings almost at the first word two it may very justly be urged that this is not drama and very often in the illustrative passages i have given in this series of studies i have felt that they did not represent the heroines in those lime-lighted moments in which a heroine is supposed most to live one has to choose between such moments and some quieter episode in which character softly unfolds itself and its fascination penetrates like a perfume to the reader's sympathy while his more tumultuous sensations are left unstirred then one has one's conscience as to the quality of the whole work in which the character is rooted and of which it is the consummate flower one must somehow do justice to that and in reading mr cable's novel one is afraid that nothing short of entreating the reader to go to it and do it justice himself will suffice not to make this beggarly default however one may remind him of the opalescent shimmer in which the story is wrapped and from which keenly sparkle its facts and traits of comedy and tragedy for a certain blend of romance and reality which does no wrong to either component property 
i do not know its like in american fiction and i feel that this is saying far too little i might say in all fiction and not accuse myself of extravagance short of this i may safely declare the author's masterpiece on which he has lavished his happiest if not his most conscious art and aurora nancanu is its supreme grace what she is otherwise will not be readily put into words even her own words she is always the wild wilful heart of girlhood which the experiences of wifehood motherhood and widowhood have left unchanged she is a woman with a grown-up daughter but essentially she is her daughter's junior and adorable as clotilde is in her way she pales and dulls into commonplace when aurora is by that last chapter which is so apt to be an anticlimax in a novel is so good in the grandest scenes and is so subtly interpretive of aurora's personality the sort of personality which coquettes with itself to the very end that i should like to give it entire though i know that i should have still a haunting fear that without everything that had gone before the portrait of this bewitching creature would want its full effect honore grandissime who has loved her through all the involutions of her caprice has offered himself and been refused and a scene follows which among love scenes has to my knowledge scarcely been surpassed in its delicious naturalness if m grandissime had believed that he was prepared for the supreme bitterness of that moment he had sadly erred he could not speak he extended his hand in a dumb farewell when all unsanctioned by his will the voice of despair escaped him in a low groan at the same moment a tinkling sound drew near and the room which had grown dark with the fall of night began to brighten with the softly widening light of an evening lamp as a servant approached to place it in the front drawing-room aurora gave her hand and withdrew it in the act the two somewhat changed position and the rays of the lamp as the maid passed the door falling upon aurora's face betrayed the again upturned eyes sieur grandissime they fell the lover paused you think i'm cruel she was the statue of meekness hope has been cruel to me replied m grandissime not you that i cannot say adieu he was turning sieur grandissime she seemed to tremble he stood still sieur grandissime her voice was very tender would you hurry there was a great silence sieur grandissime you know take a chair he hesitated a moment and then both sat down the servant repassed the door yet when aurora broke the silence she spoke in english having such hazardous things to say it would conceal possible stammerings sieur grandissime you know does vis an eye she slightly opened her fan looking down upon it and was still i have no right to ask the reason said mr grandissime it is yours not mine her head went lower well you know she drooped it meditatively to one side with her eyes on the floor tis bickhouse tis bickhouse i think in a few days i'm going to die monsieur grandissime said never a word he was not alarmed she looked up suddenly and took a quick breath as if to resume but her eyes fell before his and she said in a tone of half soliloquy i have so much trouble with dat heart she lifted one little hand feebly to the cardiac region and sighed softly with a dying languor m grandissime gave no response a vehicle rumbled by in the street below and passed away at the bottom of the room where a gilded mars was driving into battle a soft note told the half hour the lady spoke again i'd madge she sighed once more so strange sometime i think i'm gettin crazy still he to whom these fearful disclosures were being made remained as silent and motionless as an indian captive and after another pause with its painful accompaniment of small sounds the fair speaker resumed with more energy as befitting the approach to an incredible climax some day sieur grandissime i'd madge me forgid my age i think i'm young she lifted her eyes 
with the evident determination to meet his own squarely but it was too much they fell as before yet she went on speaking and when somebody gettin tired livin wid imself um, and biggin to fill o and wan somebody to take de care of him and wan me to get married wid him i think he's in love to me her fingers kept up a little shuffling with the fan i think i'm crazy i think i must be going to die directly she looked up to the ceiling with large eyes and then again at the fan in her lap which continued its spreading and shutting and as the reason sir grandison she waited until it was certain he was about to answer and then interrupted him nervously you know sir grandison it wouldn't be right it wouldn't be justice to you and you de best man i ever know in my life sir grandison her hands shook a man what never won to get married with nobody in his life and now trying to get married just only to repose the soul of his uncle monsieur grandissime uttered an exclamation of protest and she ceased i ask you continued he with low-toned emphasis for the single and only reason that i want you for my wife yes she quickly replied das all das what i think and i think das de right way to say sieur grandissim because you know you and me is too hold to tell about dat lovin you know and you got dat great wispug for me and me i got dat is wispug for you but she clutched the fan and her face sank lower still but she swallowed shook her head but she bit her lip she could not go on aurora said her lover bending forward and taking one of her hands i do love you with all my soul she made a poor attempt to withdraw her hand abandoned the effort and looked up savagely through a pair of overflowing eyes demanding May for why you didn't want to say so monsieur grandissim smiled argumentatively i have said so a hundred times in every way but in words she lifted her head proudly and bowed like a queen may you see sir grandissim you've been made one mistake but tis corrected in time exclaimed he with suppressed but eager joyousness sieur grandissime she said with a tremendous solemnity i'm very sorry may you spoke too late no no he cried the correction comes in time say that lady say that his ardent gaze beat hers once more down but she shook her head he ignored the motion and you will correct your answer ah say that too he insisted covering the captive hand with both his own and leaning forward from his seat may sir grandissime you know dad is so very unexpected oh unexpected may i was think all dat time it was for till would you she turned her face away and buried her mouth in her handkerchief ah he cried mock me no more aurora nanconu he rose erect and held the hand firmly which she strove to draw away say the word sweet lady say the word she turned upon him suddenly rose to her feet was speechless an instant while her eyes flashed into his and crying out no burst into tears laughed Section thirty seven of Heroines of Fiction by William Dean Howells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. H. B. Fuller's Jane Marshall and Miss M. E. Wilkins's Jane Field. In the fiction of that group of Western novelists whom I think the most representative, I feel the heroines generally so much less important than the heroes that i find myself in a difficulty which i will confess to the reader strictly upon the condition that it shall go no farther 
i do this not only because i ought but also because i must for if i did not the reader would himself perceive that either i have been wrong in claiming the supremacy of the heroine in a novel as proof of the author's mastery or else that these western novelists whom i like are really not masterly what is certain is that their heroines are subordinate figures and there is no way out for me but possibly through the fact that the feminization of our american life so apparent in and out of literature in the east has not yet reached the new centres of population between the alleghanies and the mississippi and that the western subordination of the heroine is the instinctive response of fiction to the quantitative if not the qualitative fact to the casual glance the west would seem even more than the east given up socially and intellectually to women but so far women do not hold the first place in western fiction the type of western womanhood studied in selma the heroine of mr robert grant's unleavened bread is the creation or invention of a boston novelist who in obedience to the eastern tradition gives her supremacy in his story to be sure mr robert herrick in the gospel of freedom made a western woman the foremost figure in his story but mr herrick is of bostonian birth like mr grant and though recently of chicagoan adoption is still imaginably of the earlier allegiance in his deference to the nearly and ever womanly eastern fiction in the work of a native westerner like mr will payne the womanly though so truly portrayed in such a story as the money captain is subordinated in interest to the manly and mr george ade whose brilliant divinations of feminine foible form the delightfulness of his stories and fables gives his highest energies or inspirations to the study of persons of his own sex and doc horn and arty and pink marsh are his masterpieces in characterization mr hamlin garland also is more memorable for his men than his women and the critical trailer i am writing with the phraseology of his latest story insistently in mind will find the float of masculine character more abundant in his gold-bearing mountains than the surface indications of heroism in his earlier and shorter stories and still in his shorter and later stories you are aware of the manly sympathy which divines this precious metal and the rose who is the rose of dutcher's coolie is a genuine piece of womanhood with both the material and the spiritual awry which form its allure she is imagined with a courage uncommon in our fiction and portrayed with a conscience unable to spare the suggestions of undraped nature which our tradition blinks it is no longer as it is not yet the time for such courage and conscience and we still await a due heroine from a novelist whose work otherwise avouches his power in dealing with character One among western novelists we must go to the page of mr henry b fuller apparently more sensitive to eastern influences or the western advance of feminization for a heroine of the fit proportions and i think we find her in one of the chief figures of the story which is upon the whole the most representative of his native city with the procession has not the epical motive of the cliff dwellers but the epical motive always incurs the danger of turning mechanical and with the procession escapes this while it studies delicately but penetratingly the evolution of chicago from a large town to a great city in the inner and outer life of a typical family which voluntarily and involuntarily prospers with it the daughter of this family who determines to make it share her own social consciousness is a heroine of rare and even new kind she begins properly to win the heart of the reader from the moment when in view of her evident want of beauty and style she humorously decides to be quaint and to work life upon the lines of that decision her quaintness is not an affectation but is the frank recognition of her material limitations and she is powerfully abetted in her resolution by another person of the drama who was a belle of an earlier period but has become quaint 
inwardly while appearing outwardly a figure of great social power and splendour the management of these two delightful women is of the artistic sort which puts you in full possession of their quality without much advertising you of the process this makes it difficult to give distinctive passages concerning them but not impossible and it is not without the hope of making my reader wish to know them better that i introduce them in the scene where they become fast friends jane marshall the younger of the friends has gone from her father's old-fashioned house to the new-fashioned palace of mrs granger bates to ask the social leader for a subscription in behalf of the working girls club she is fostering and after being snubbed and put down on general principles by the great lady suddenly finds herself caught to her heart when mrs bates learns that she is the daughter of david marshall for david marshall far back in the fifties was a favourite beau of mrs bates's and she still has an honest tenderness for him she takes the odd girl to her heart in every way and leading her through the marble halls where she receives the world she welcomes her to the little room where she lives the door closed with a light click and jane looked about her with a great and sudden surprise poor stupid stumbling child she understood at last in what spirit she had been received and on what footing she had been placed she found herself in a small cramped low ceiled room which was filled with worn and antiquated furniture there was a ponderous old mahogany bureau with the veneering cracked and peeled in a bed to correspond there was a shabby little writing-desk whose let-down lid was lined with faded and blotted green baize on the floor there was an old brussels carpet antique as to pattern and wholly threadbare as to surface the walls were covered with an old-time paper whose plaintive primitiveness ran in slender pink stripes alternating with narrow green vines in one corner stood a small upright piano whose top was littered with loose sheets of old music and on one wall hung a set of thin black walnut shelves strung together with cords and loaded with a variety of well-worn volumes in the grate was a coal fire mrs bates sat down on the foot of the bed and motioned jane to a small rocker that had been reseated with a bit of old rugging mrs bates had stepped to her single little window isn't it a gem she asked i had it made to order one of the old-fashioned sort you see two sash with six little panes in each no weights and cords but simply catches at the side it opens to just two wits if i want anything different i have to contrive it for myself sometimes i use a hairbrush and sometimes a paper cutter do you like my posies she nodded towards the window where thanks to the hairbrush a row of flowers in a long narrow box flew about in the draught asters no 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 but i hoped you'd guess asters they're chrysanthemums you see fashion will penetrate even here but they're the smallest and simplest i could find what do i care for orchids and american beauties and all those other expensive things under glass how much does it please me to have two great big formal beds of gladiolas and foliage plants in the front yard one on each side of the steps still with our position i suppose it can't be helped no what i want is a bed of portulaca and some cypress vines running up strings to the top of a pole as soon as i get poor enough to afford it i'm going to have a lot of flocks and london pride and bachelor's buttons out there in the back yard and the girls can run their clothes lines somewhere else it's hard to keep flowers in a city said jane i know it is at our old house we had such a nice little rose bush in the front yard i hated so to leave it behind one of those little yellow briar roses no it wasn't yellow it was just yaller and it always scratched my nose when i tried to smell it but oh child wistfully if i could only smell it now couldn't you have transplanted it asked jane sympathetically i went back the very next day after we moved out with a peach basket and a fire shovel 
but my poor bush was buried under seven feet of yellow sand to-day there's seven stories of brick and mortar so all i've got from the old place is just this furniture of moss and the wallpaper the wallpaper not the identical same of course it's like what i had in my bedroom when i was a girl i remembered the pattern and tried everywhere to match it and finally well what finally finally i sent down east and had eight or ten rolls made to order i chased harder than anybody ever chased for a raphael and i spent more than if i had hung the room with gobelins but she stroked the narrow strips of pink and green with a fond hand and cast on jane a look which pleaded indulgence isn't it just too quaintly ugly for anything it isn't any such thing cried jane it's just as sweet as it can be i only wish mine was like it mrs bates began to rummage among the drawers of her old desk there she said presently i knew i could put my hands on it she set a dog ear type before jane its oval was bordered with a narrow line of gilded metal and its small square back was covered with embossed brown leather there now do you know who that is jane looked back and forth doubtfully between the picture and its owner is it is it pa mrs bates nodded jane regarded the dog ear type with a puzzled fascination did my father ever wear his hair all wavy across his forehead that way and have such a thing tied around his throat and wear a vest all covered with those little gold sprigs precisely that's just the way he looked the last time we danced together and what do you suppose the dance was guess and guess and guess again it was this mrs bates whisked herself on to the piano stool and began to play and to sing her touch was heavy and spirited but her voice was easily audible above the instrument old dan tucker he got drunk he jumped in the fire and he kicked up a chunk of red-hot charcoal with his shoes lordy how the ashes flew who jane dropped the dog ear type in time to take up the refrain clear the road for old dan tucker you're too late to get your supper clear the road for old dan aha you know it cried mrs bates gaily of course responded jane my education may be modern on the whole but it hasn't neglected the classics completely gentlemen forward she said with a sudden cry which sent mrs bates's fingers back to the keyboard gentlemen forward to mr tucker mrs bates pounded loudly and jane pirouetted up to her from behind ladies forward to mr tucker cried jane and mrs bates left the stool and began dancing towards her then she danced back and took her seat again but with the first chord all forward to miss tucker called jane again and they met face to face in the middle of the room and burst out laughing sit down i'm going to play the java march for you she struck out several ponderous and vengeful chords why called jane is that the java march she spread out her elbows and stalked up and down singing oh the dutch company is the best company right again cried mrs bates you are one of us just as i said well if that's the java march said jane it's in an old book we used to have about the house years and years ago only if you bring it up as an example of pa's taste he liked it because i played it perhaps said mrs bates quietly besides why should you put it to those shocking words it is in that book she continued and i've got one here just like it is it the one with roll on silver moon and wild rove the indian maid bright what's her name bright alfarada same one exactly bring up another chair and we'll go through a whole program of classics program i mean let's see though said jane looking at her watch mercy me where has the morning gone it's after eleven o'clock mrs bates opened the front door herself you can take the choo-choo cars at sixteenth you know and get off at van buren oh dear excuse my baby talk our little reginald two months old you know she accompanied jane halfway down the steps bareheaded as she was and in her morning gown a society reporter who happened to be passing originated the rumour that she had gone insane if after all these passages are illustrative of mrs bates rather than of jane marshall it is perhaps because jane marshall is less susceptible of illustration by select passages 
she is a singularly undramatic heroine and lives in a sort of subjectivity more perceptible than demonstrable to the sympathetic reader's knowledge of her faithful and lovable character in fact the scene given displays only that surface of her character which is the least significant of her quality it is her hard fate through her zeal for her father's standing and her pride in him to rend him and her mother from the ugly old-fashioned keeping in which they were peacefully rusting out their lives and get them into the procession and when her father falls out of it dying she feels as if she had killed him but she really is not she has been the truest and kindest of all his children to him and she has her reward when the faithful theodore brower long mute with love for her takes heart at the funeral to say that he will go as one of the family and in the same carriage as her or not go at all the grotesqueness is not blinked but the pathos is delicately intimated in it and throughout the story the blunt angular outright nature of the girl is studied with constant recognition of her sweetness and unselfish goodness and her humorous self-depreciation she is but one of many women in the story whose personalities are all rendered with an unerring touch two to pass from the atmosphere of mr fuller's with the procession to miss mary e wilkins's jane field is to make proof at once of the variety and the solidarity of american life nothing as to conditions could be farther apart than chicago and green river and yet the vast loud lavish metropolis of the west and the prim meagre niggard new england village are animated by the same ideal of conduct the same puritanized conscience the same desire of justice and righteousness the chicago family in dealing with the problem of the iniquitous son and brother whose sin has followed him home from europe is of as simple and direct an impulse as jane field in her self-denunciation to those she has deceived in her to ingenious endeavour for justice and when it appears that money will serve quite as well as marriage or better they feel a noble shame in compounding the wrong of a like quality with lois field's sense of dishonour in silently witnessing her mother's trespass it is in the europeanised and modernised black sheep of the chicago fold that the differentiation of ideal takes place but his aberration from the home standard is as wide in his chicago domestic circle as it would be in green river the delight of the higher probability must remain with the western novelist who is realistic through and through whereas the new england novelist is at heart romantic and realistic mainly in expression she narrowly escapes the impossible in her plot and saves herself from point to point in the story by clever devices and agile turns which tax the credulity of the reader rather than raise his admiration they ask him to grant premises but the true plot the situation that reproduces life compels him to grant them nevertheless it is fairly possible if not that it is unfairly possible that jane fields seeing her frail young daughter dying before her eyes in a pitiless decline as she believes for want of rest from work and change of air should bethink herself of the inheritance left her dead sister and cloudily keeping in mind her extraordinary resemblance to her sister should suffer herself to be mistaken for her and should try to enter into the enjoyment of her own rights through her sister's property the reader of the story so powerful in spite of its inherent weaknesses will remember that her sister's husband has lost all her own little fortune in speculation and that jane field has no purpose but to recover the value of her fifteen hundred dollars it is with this purpose that she goes to elliot a hundred miles away from green river to seek her just dues from the estate which must upon her sister's death being known revert to the family of her sister's husband the lawyer who has the property in charge greets mrs field as mrs maxwell and in a sudden crazy hope of turning his error to her account without infringing the just rights of the loyal heiress she does not correct him it is her dim unformulated notion that she may collect her dues to the amount of the fifteen hundred dollars lost from the income of the property and then relinquish possession 
but when her daughter follows her to elliot and sets her pitiless young conscience in condemnation over the mother who has taken this desperate chance for her sake jane field finds it impossible to touch a cent of her dues they put everything by for the legal owners and cower in the old maxwell house keeping themselves from starvation by the little that lois can earn in sewing till a visit from some old green river neighbours deepens the stress of her sin upon jane field and drives her to anticipate detection by denouncing herself to the whole village of elliot you can drive a coach through several places in this loose structure but if you have no wish for such an excursion you can enjoy the psychology of the tremendous situation as it is worked out in the characters of the mother and daughter lois first unexpectedly appears at elliot the morning after her mother's arrival they meet at the lawyer's office where jane field is talking of the property with him and she is obliged to introduce lois as her niece or rather to let the lawyer deceive himself as to their relation she keeps as far as she can from positive deception and then the mother and daughter go home to the maxwell house together mrs field stalked ahead with her resolute stiffness lois followed after her keeping always several paces behind no matter how often mrs field sternly conscious of it slackened her own pace lois never gained upon her when they reached the gate at the entrance of the maxwell grounds and mrs field stopped lois spoke up what place is this said she in a defiantly timorous voice the maxwell house replied her mother shortly turning up the walk are you going in here of course i am well i ain't going in one step mrs field turned and faced her lois said she if you want to go away and desert the mother that's show in herself willin to die for you you can lois said not another word she turned in at the gate with her eyes fixed upon her mother's face i'll tell you about it when we get up to the house said her mother with appealing conciliation lois slunk mutely behind her again her eyes were full of the impulse of flight when she watched her mother unlock the house door but she followed her in now lois said mrs field i'm going to tell you about this you know i suppose that mr tuxbury took me for your aunt esther lois nodded her dilated eyes never wavered from her mother's face i suppose you heard what he was saying to me when you come in lois i didn't tell him i was your aunt esther the minute i come in he took me for her and miss henry maxwell come into his office and she did and so did mr tuxbury's sister i want going to tell them i want her and i'll tell you why i'm going to have that fifteen hundred dollars of your poor father's earning that i lent your uncle out of this property and this is all the way to do it and i'm going to do it couldn't you have asked the lawyer about the fifteen hundred dollars wouldn't he have given you some oh mother i was going to if he hadn't took me for her but it wouldn't have done any good they wouldn't have been obliged to pay it and folks ain't fond of paying over money when they ain't obliged to i've been a fool to have asked him after he took me for her then you got this all planned her mother took her up sharply no i hadn't got it all planned said she i don't deny it come into my head i knew how much folks said i looked like esther but i didn't go so far as to plan it there needn't anybody say i did you ain't going to take the money i'm going to take that fifteen hundred dollars out of it mother you ain't going to stay here and make folks think you're aunt esther yes i am then all lois's horror and terror manifested themselves in one cry oh mother when the fierce sense of wrong subsides and the iron purpose of righting herself breaks in jane field her relentless will asserts itself again in the impulse to punish herself for the deceit she has practised and to take the consequences of her transgression before all the world and she begins with the three old green river neighbours who are visiting her when lois left home that afternoon her mother had been in her bedroom changing her dress when she came out she had on her best black dress her black shawl and gloves and her best bonnet the three women stared at her she stood before them a second without speaking the strange look for which lois had watched her face had appeared why what is the matter miss field cried mrs babcock where be you goin i'm goin out a little ways replied mrs field then she raised her voice suddenly i've got something to say to all of you before i go said she i've been deceiving you and everybody here in elliot when i came down here they all took me for my sister esther maxwell and i let them think so they've all called me esther maxwell here that's how i got the money 
old mr maxwell left it to flora maxwell if my sister didn't outlive him i shouldn't have had a cent i stole it i thought my daughter would die if she didn't have it and get away from green river but that wa'n't any excuse edward maxwell had that fifteen hundred dollars of my husband's and i never had a cent of it but that wa'n't any excuse i thought i'd just stay here and carry it out till i got the money back but that wa'n't any excuse i ain't spent a cent of the money it's all put away just as it was paid him in a sugar bowl in the china closet but that ain't any excuse i took it on myself to do justice instead of the lord and that ain't for any human being to do i ain't esther maxwell i'm brought up short i ain't esther maxwell her voice rose to a stern shriek the three women stared at her then at each other their faces were white amanda was catching her breath and faint gasp jane field rushed out of the room the door closed heavily after her three wild pale faces huddled together in a window watched her out of the yard mrs babcock called weakly after her to come back but she kept on she went out of the yard and down the street at the first house she stopped went up to the door and rang the bell when a woman answered her ring she looked at her and said i ain't esther maxwell then she turned and went down the walk between the rows of marigolds and asters and the woman stood staring after her for a minute then ran in and the windows filled with wondering faces jane field stopped at the next house with the same message after she left a woman pelted across the yard in a panic to compare notes with her neighbors she kept on down the street and she stopped at every door and said i ain't master maxwell now and then somebody tried to delay her to question her and obtain an explanation but she broke away there was about her a terrible mental impetus which intimidated people stood instinctively out of her way as before some rushing force which might overwhelm them she went on and on all the summer afternoon and canvassed the little village with her remorse and confession of crime finally the four words which she said at the door seemed almost involuntary they became her one natural note the expression of her whole life it was as if she had never said any others when she went up the path to the maxwell house she said them where the shadow of a pine tree fell darkly in front of her like the shadow of a man she said them when she stood before the door of the house whose hospitality she had usurped there was a little crowd at her heels but she did not notice them until she was entering the door then she said the words over to them i ain't esther maxwell she entered the sitting-room the people following there were her three old friends and neighbors the minister and his wife daniel tuxbury his sister and her daughter mrs jane maxwell and her daughter and her own lois she faced them all and said it again i ain't esther maxwell lois pressed forward and clung to her mother she moaned mother then for once her mother varied her set speech lois want to blame she said i want you to know it all of you lois want to blame she didn't know until after i'd done it she wanted to tell but i told her they'd put me in prison lois want to blame i ain't esther maxwell oh mother don't don't lois sobbed she hung about her mother's neck and pressed her lips to that pale wrinkled face whose wrinkles seemed now to be laid in stone not a muscle of jane field's face jane she kept repeating at intervals in precisely the same tone her terrible under Section 38 of Heroines of Fiction by William Dean Howells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Humphrey Ward's Heroines. In reading Mrs. Humphrey Ward's last story, Eleanor, I felt again as I had felt before in her work its general difference from the best American fiction in a particular which may perhaps have caught the notice of others if it has not i may be mistaken in my feeling and shall be unable to persuade others to make it their conviction but the point is interesting and if i can make it evident something will have been done toward explaining american novelists to themselves and reconciling them to their performances as the necessary outcome of their conditions possibly something more will have been done and they will be satisfied in recognizing that english breadth must always be denied them and to make the most of the depth which seems to be their characteristic when they are at their best one 
the deceitfulness of appearances is notorious and even when they are the effect of reality they are seldom of such a unanimity that the inference from them cannot reasonably be questioned you have first to get your appearances and this alone is a thing of no small difficulty many appearances are so purely subjective that when you come to draw the attention of others to them they turn out to be disappearances and in the case in hand there will probably be some people to deny that english fiction is noticeably broad or american fiction noticeably deep they will say that thomas hardy and george eliot have both written things that suggest depth as well as breadth and that mrs ward who is alone among english writers worthy to be mentioned with these novelists is so much of the american spirit in her art that if her work is broad it is a proof that breadth is as characteristic of american fiction as depth the effect is to dissatisfy you with the words themselves as saying too much and if after trying dramatic and epical you return to them you wish to explain that you employ neither invidiously but only with the single desire to trace certain questionable appearances to certain unquestionable facts and so render them less questionable i confess that the effect of the breadth i have felt or seemed to feel in mrs ward's work was such as to make me discontented with the depth that i remembered in the best american work as if this were comparatively a defect since it was necessarily narrower it was only by reflecting that our depth was the inevitable implication of our civic and social conditions that i was consoled and restored to something like a national self-respect to put it paradoxically our life is too large for our art to be broad in despair at the immense scope and variety of the material offered it by american civilization american fiction must specialize and turning distracted from the superabundance of character it must burrow far down in a soul or two men may invent almost anything but themselves and it was not because hawthorne made himself psychological but because he was so that in the american environment he bent his vision inward his theory was that our life was too level and too open and too sunnily prosperous for his art but it was an instinct far subtler than this belief that he obeyed in seeking the subliminal drama hawthorne was romantic but our realists who have followed him have been of the same instinct and have dealt mainly with the subliminal drama too in their books so faithful to the effect of our everyday life the practical concerns of it are subordinated to the psychical not consciously but so constantly that their subordination has not been a matter of any question the usual incidents of fiction have not in the best american novelists been the prime concern but the subliminal effect of those incidents love itself which is the meat and drink of fiction is treated less as a passional than as a psychological phenomenon long ago the more artistic of our novelists perceived that the important matter was not what the lovers suffered or enjoyed in getting married or whether they got married at all or not but what sort of man and maid their love found them out to be and how under its influence the mutual chemistry of their natures interacted all the problems in any case are incomparably simplified for the english novelist by the definite english conditions one can no longer call them fixed but they are still definite and in a certain way character proceeds from them the character of a gentleman a businessman an artisan 
a servant a labourer each of these has his being in a way so different from the others that he is a definitely different creature and when through some chance some perverse mixture of the elements the conditions are traversed and the character bred of one shows itself in another it has a stronger relief from the alien background but ordinarily the englishman feels thinks and acts from his class and when you name his class you measurably state him after that you have rather to do with what he does than what he is the result in fiction is a multiplicity of incident and a multitude of persons and you have breadth rather than depth even in so psychological a story as mrs ward's marcella the definite conditions account for so much that it is after all a study of incident more than a study of motive the conventions of english realism the county society and the life of the great houses and interests and opinions of the gentry and their dependents the hovels and the physical and moral squalor of the poor the parliamentary election and the agitations of the demagogues and the real reformers the intervention of the church in the chapel the poaching and the murder and the hanging all these things are of the familiar acquaintance of the novel reader who knows them from the time of bulwer down through the innumerable novelists who have treated of them since mrs ward treats of them with a fresh mind but they are in themselves so far from fresh that they seem to stale her thought of them and the figure that she projects against them the very novel and very original figure of marcella seems to acquire convention from them and to be as hackneyed as all the rest the result is a fiction of high order of a higher order in certain aspects than any since george eliot's fictions and yet having breadth rather than depth this may be an appearance and not a fact marcella is so essentially modern so perfectly of the day before yesterday that the inquiry into the soul of the socialistic aesthete the girl of good birth and good tradition emerging from her shady father's past to find herself engaged to the most conscientious and noble-minded of aristocrats but at war with all his convictions through the impassioned preferences of her earlier associations necessarily involves psychological research which goes far if it does not go deep she is indeed so interesting that one wishes the author might have had her in the sparsely settled region of an american fiction so that we could have sat down with her in the long leisure of our social existence and divined her to the ultimate mystery of her being it may be answered that there is really no more of her than her author shows but it seems as if in a different environment there might have been more possibly we touch here a fundamental variance of the english and american life in former times we americans were accused of being curious over curious of being insatiable and impertinent questioners of strangers it may be however that we are not so but that the most penetrating difference between us and the english is that they are social and we are personal their denser life we will say satisfies them with superficial contrasts while in our thinner and more homogeneous society the contrasts that satisfy are subliminal this theory would account for their breadth and our depth without mortifying the self-love of either which i should like to spare in our case if not in theirs to float and to dive may be equally creditable our personality is the consequence of our historic sparsity and it survives beyond its time because the nature of our contiguity is still such as to fix a man's mind strongly upon himself and to render him restless till he has ascertained how far all other men are like him we are prodigiously homogeneous though in the absence of classification we seem so chaotic we shall change probably and then the character of our fiction our art of representing life will change too 
very likely it will become more superficial and less subliminal it will lose in depth as it gains in breadth as yet its attempts to be broad to be society fiction have resulted in a shallowness which is not suggestive of breadth two the english are less apt than we have been to carry a story abroad and to find in an alien setting terms more favourable than those of home for the subliminal interests this may be because they inevitably carry their civilization with them in all possible details down to the emblematic bathtub while we find that we can get on abroad fairly well without steam heat and exposed plumbing and the american order which they stand for we are in fact far more easily detachable from our native background and blend far more readily with the alien atmosphere than the english so that i think if an american family as nearly as possible corresponding to the manistes had been set down in the air of rome they would have lost their native outline more the thing is hard to say and perhaps i shall come as near to suggesting it as may be in noting the impression that the cosmopolitan englishman gives of being more english than if he had never left home whereas the cosmopolitan american really ceases to be american if he does not become anything else of course my position can be assailed by saying that there could not be any such american family as the manistes who are distinctively and inalienably english and are of that world which whether it is really great or not makes ours look a small world manisti has had to do all his life with questions which affect politically socially and spiritually the civilization of many races systems languages and religions as no american public man can have to do with them and eleanor burgoyne through the english traditions which admit women to the discussion of such questions is of a range of thinking and feeling possible to no american woman except some one who has given up society and gone in for a public life through the advocacy of a great interest like temperance or the suffrage for women i allow that all this is true without allowing all its implications and in the meantime i fall back to my original position and invite the reader again to consider whether the fact does not make for that breadth in english fiction which i began by imagining we will suppose that the author for the sake of getting her main group of people face to face with each other and keeping them to their psychological problem wishes to isolate them from the alliances and relations of their past and therefore takes them into an alien environment almost immediately it proves that she has not isolated the english manisti and eleanor but only the american girl lucy foster with the others questions of european policy at once come in and distract their attention from the psychological problem to lucy alone these questions are without vital interest if not without reality priests diplomats peasants artists citizens society figures come and go in her consciousness with the effect of deepening it inward and concentrating it in the great question whether she is doing wrong in letting manisti love her or letting herself love him when she feels or knows that eleanor loves him if the situation had been invented by an american novelist i think he would have studied it mainly through the consciousness of lucy and the prime interest of the story would have been personal psychological subliminal the effect would have been depth and i do not mean this in any bragging way now the main effect is breadth which certainly i could not mean derogatorily it is indifferent to me for the present inquiry whether the american or the english effect is better and i wish to note without disparagement of mrs ward's work that mr hardy gets depth by dealing with persons who are unconventionally circumstanced or wholly out of society 
for much the same reason the author of the remarkable mark rutherford books is able to get it but these alone among english novelists get it in anything like the american measure is it true then that the americans get it because their characters are unconventionally circumstanced or are not in society something very like this might be true and american fiction is faithfuller to the average american conditions than if it dealt with people conventionally circumstanced and in society for most of us are certainly not so as most equally educated englishmen certainly are so we have the forms the society structures the same with us but having built our house and furnished it we find it a bother and would rather lodge at a hotel and dine at a restaurant still better we like to travel to journey and sojourn in far countries and amidst the outer strangeness to get more intimately at our inner selves if we are novelists we like to take our characters abroad as if the home sparsity were not enough and in the resulting isolation to penetrate the last recesses of their mystery or at least learn that it is not penetrable more than one piece of our subtlety in this sort could be alleged but perhaps it is sufficient to allege two of which what i am saying seems eminently true namely the marble fawn and daisy miller if an english novelist does the same thing the result is not the same the english environment is inalienable the characters are continually frittering themselves away in superficial encounter on the native terms at dinners and luncheons and teas and what not till there is nothing subliminal left in them three one great objection to words is that they are always over saying things and i could easily take up the foregoing postulate and show it untenably excessive nevertheless i think it has some truth in it and i feel concerning eleanor burgoyne that she is not enough alone for the evolution of her innermost self she is always in a clutter of society which is right enough since she is of that english world so cluttered to our elbow roomy american sense as we view it afar or anear even in her withdrawals from it in pain or in passion the atmosphere of drawing-rooms seems to envelop her it is her native air and one cannot complain though one feels that a final knowledge of what she might otherwise have been to the reader must be postponed to a future life what she could be in this hampered by the perpetual coming and going and meeting and parting is a most generously imagined personality in fact mrs ward is so good at imagining heroines of noble nature that she ought to be the favourite novelist of her sex which loves to have its magnanimity recognised i will not say flattered the wife of david grieve in the novel of his name is one of these great creatures and worthily the heroine of what i am not going rashly to call the author's best book though i should not dispute such a verdict from another i think it was contrived that the reader should meet her on a more subliminal level than most other english heroines and this was perhaps so because she was of a social world almost as uncrowded as our own and perhaps also because there is something much more analogous to the american in the scotch nature than in the english i am writing without the book but after the five years which have passed since i read that powerful story she is still present in a sort of tender sublimity as the fit impersonation of the sacred love whose flame purifies david grieve's soul of all but the record of his profaner passion so much may be expected and exacted of the type of heroine which mrs ward imagines that the noble goodness of marcella maxwell when she reappears in the story of sir george tressidy can have force not only to regenerate the feeling of sir george toward herself and transform it to an exalted friendship but also to turn the jealousy of lady tressidy to some such complexion 
can such things be one asks oneself and then is ashamed of one's self for asking for doubting yet lady tressidy in her prettiness and pettiness her vanity and vulgarity has the superior probability and is i am tempted to say it more profoundly divined than marcella in fact marcella loses probability in her second avatar as socialistic wife to a socializing prime minister in the scheme of sir george tressidy the ideal beauty of soul so courageously imagined for her scarcely recompenses the reader for this loss though he must honour the courage her apparition to tressidy crushed and dying in the coal-mine is not of the convincing supernaturalism to which turgenev and tolstoy have sometimes carried their naturalism and her personal beauty which is so constantly insisted upon seems at each insistence less impressive at the risk of being insufferably paradoxical i should say that marcella was left less appreciable by being left too little a mystery and that in being altogether removed from the vague she is rendered impalpable to those perceptions which realize personalities to put it still more perversely we meet her too often to know her thoroughly we know little light hard leady tressidy far better we have a sense of her she is the more convincing because to the very last we are no more convinced than she is that she is not still jealous of her husband with respect to marcella though she is no longer jealous of marcella with respect to her husband she has forgiven but she has not forgotten and she remains with the reader in the luminous question whether she will like being commended to the care of marcella and lord maxwell by her dying husband in suggesting such a question the author evinces psychological depth and in questions equally incapable of final answer in the case of both the wife and the mistress in david grieve i find proof of a depth in that novel beyond that of any other of mrs ward's books the wife's relation to david's past armour remains full of satisfying mystery and in the feeling of the french girl who forsakes him for her art and escapes in terror from her love of him there is something that seems to penetrate the very sources of her nature for of course i am aware of proving too much but if i am getting at the truth i do not much mind being inconsistent or even finding myself wrong if my thesis is that mrs ward when her fiction deals with the more crowded scenes of english life loses depth and when it deals with a sparser environment gains depth perhaps i shall not find myself so very wrong after all i should still have to ask myself how far she had sought such an environment in laying the scene of her last novel in italy and in giving her english heroine the relief of an alien setting how far such a motive was subconscious with her and how far she had failed to give it effect i have already intimated my sense of her comparative failure and as for the subconscious motive that is something that i know of no critical subtlety competent to render evident the question which remains is in what degree the inevitable spread of the story has superficialized the heroine's character or perhaps the impression of her character what one has to do in any case is to recognize the courageous originality with which eleanor burgoyne is imagined she has been married to a sufficiently unlovable and unloving husband whose delirious suicide has involved the death of their little son she struggles up from her crushing sorrow and in making herself useful to her cousin menesty as his secretary and counsellor in his work she finds not respite from her grief so much as the chance of new happiness and the hope of his love but she loves him too well and unwisely to be his unsparing critic and when the unformed american girl lucy foster comes into their family circle and from the fearlessness of her absolute sincerity censures where eleanor has not the heart to censure eleanor has the anguish of seeing the man's fancy veer toward the girl 
as one of greater authority lucy is beautiful and eleanor in the first days has devoted her taste and knowledge to making her more evidently beautiful the feeling that she has toward her is not jealousy or else it is a jealousy so sublimed by her noble nature that it is rather a recognition of the facts than a resentment of them she weakens indeed so far as to put the case to lucy and ask her to give manisty up to the love which has earned him but not won him and the girl consents but both their wills are crushed in manistes when he makes it plain that his love has nothing to do with justice and that he wants what he wants not because it is best or impersonally right but because he wants it this is the way of true love which we are always exalting as the finest thing in the world though there are obviously many things finer it is at least honest and sincere and that is what eleanor burgoyne owns in her acquiescence with fate when she renders lucy up to her inevitable happiness if it is happiness to marry manisty that the woman should ask the girl to forego her happiness is a daring supposition in which we must acknowledge the author's high aesthetic courage and perhaps the frankness which is almost brutal in eleanor's despair is truer than any fineness would have been the contrast of the two lives in that scene the woman's experience and the girl's innocence is more valuable than the contrast even of their natures but possibly in this also the author's work lends itself to my theory of greater breadth and less depth in the english novel as compared with the american nothing of subconscious of subliminal is left to the reader's conjecture but i do not at all mean that character is rendered superficial by bringing everything in it to the surface i am far too fond of the plain light of day for that but still it may be so contrived that the plain light of day may strike to the nethermost abysses and that what is most intricate and most recondite in the soul may be rendered luminously apparent at its proper depth five the personality and the dramatic office of eleanor are greatly imagined and they remain essentially unaffected by the handling you get the meaning of her tragedy and the innermost meaning which is perhaps less poignant than it might be if it were relieved by comedy mrs ward is serious and no doubt in this she has her strongest hold upon her vast public for the average woman if not the average man likes her prophets or prophetesses always to seem as much in earnest as they are through the absence of humour mrs ward is a little lower if one chooses to think so than that great woman novelist whose level she more nearly reaches than any of her successors you cannot quite name her in the same breath with george eliot but you can name her in the next breath and it is to be questioned if even george eliot had a wider and stronger grasp of the important actualities of english life in eleanor whether the book tells for or against my theory of greater depth in american fiction and greater breadth in the english one must acknowledge that increasing mastery of which each of her successive books has given proofs she has risen to her present eminence so wholly since american fiction began to shape itself from the art of continental fiction that one might almost claim an american influence in her work but that might well be claiming too much her manner is still marked by the ejaculatory and suspiratory self-indulgence of the minor english novelists to which george eliot herself was not superior she draws her breath in open pathos and she caresses a situation or a character with a pitying epithet or adjective as george eliot does in the case of some heroine she likes very much notably maggie tulliver or janet dempster and less notably dorothea brooks the foible is characteristic of all but the finest artists in english fiction and in her greater moments mrs ward does not indulge it there is nothing of this weak pity of her own creations in such a scene as that where eleanor reverses her prayer to lucy foster and bearing her wasted neck to show herself a dying woman makes the girl promise to be true to the love between her and manisty the most touching moment of the whole story that when she asks manisty to carry her up the stairs is of an intense pathos and feeble by no suggestion of feeling in the author eleanor with her hand on marie's arm tottered across the courtyard 
at the convent door her strength failed her she turned to manistee i can't walk up those stairs do you think you could carry me i am very light struck with sudden emotion he threw his arms round her she yielded like a tired child he who had instinctively prepared himself for a certain weight was aghast at the ease with which he lifted her her head in its pretty black hat fell against his breast her eyes closed he wondered if she had fainted he carried her to her own room and laid her on the sofa there as he left the room eleanor settled down happily on her pillow the first and only time she thought my heart on his my arms round his neck there must be impressions that outlast all others i shall manage to put them all away at the end but that such a passage and it is by no means the only passage of its kind in the book is of a fineness so penetrating so far-reaching that a critic more enamoured of his thesis than i might own it a proof against him if he had been arguing that english fiction had breadth but wanted depth he might urge that it was one of the exceptions which proved the rule but i prefer to save myself by a little different means and referring to a suggestion already made somewhat faint-heartedly i would leave it to the candid reader to say whether in such instances mrs ward was not rather like the american than the english novelists End 